Rita, ma'am, we are going live. Recording in progress. Yeah. The key to overall wellness lies in maintaining a healthy gut, said Dr. Amy Mayer. A very good morning and a warm welcome to the second international gut conference on prebiotics, probiotics, gut microbiome, and clinical application organized by gastrogut experts and supported by Alpha Naturals. The gastrogut expert team, which believes in integrating ancient wisdom with modern science, and led by Dr. Praveen through this continued effort in knowledge sharing through 
CMEs and courses has been organizing various educate, uh, medical education uh, programs. Today, we are honored, privileged to have experts from the field of gut microbiome and its clinical application to deliver a series of lecture that is in relation with disease and health. We all know that there is a delicate symbiotic relation between human host and the microbiome. Environmental factors such as diet, medication, stress, adversely affect this composition and cause dysbiosis. Today, we are here to listen to the experts on clinical applications of prebiotics, uh, gain more insights into the world of probiotics, and also acquire knowledge on autoimmune and gut connection. As the speakers enlighten us with the latest breakthrough in the gut bacteria research, I, Dr. Rita Vaz, the host for the day, wish all the participants an enriching journey and experience and a happy learning through the entire day. On behalf of the organizers, Dr. Praveen and his team, that is a gastro gut experts, I once again extend a warm welcome to the distinguished panelists, to uh, the gut experts that are present with us, and all the participants who have enrolled for this webinar. I once again welcome, uh, extend a hearty welcome. And for this inaugural session, we are honored to have with us an eminent clinician uh, with her vast experience has joined us all the way from Malaysia. On behalf of the organizing team, I extend a special welcome to Dr. Paramjit Kaur. She is a functional and inter interdisciplinary medical practitioner with the vast 30 years of clinical practice, has special interests in the field of dermatology, aesthetic medicine, and uh, in wellness. She is a founding member of Malaysian Association of She is yeah. yeah, she's a president of Malaysian Association of AFIAM. I now request Dr. Paramjit Kaur to kindly deliver the inaugural address. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the light organized here. I'm not in my normal station. Uh, maybe, can you all see me? Well. Uh, I can see Sabin over there thinking deeply. How are you? Good, I can see you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, um, a very good morning to all my colleagues and friends on this platform. It gives me great honor to be invited as chief guest to inaugurate the second international conference on gut microbiome and its applications. Uh, on this platform today, various experts will discuss the role of probiotics, prebiotics, and unravel the mysteries of the gut microbiome and the role of microbiome in disease manifestation. As we all know, the human body is a complex ecosystem teeming with trillions of microorganisms that make up the microbiome. The vast community of bacteria, fungi, viruses play a crucial role in our health and well-being. In the recent years, scientists have begun to, begun to unlock the mysteries of the microbiome, shedding light on its composition, function, and impact on human disease. So we know that understanding the microbiome has the potential to revolutionize healthcare and pave the way for new treatments and therapies. With better understanding of the gut microbiome, it will certainly pave the way to clinical applications to the management of myriad of diseases like, for example, obesity, chronic illnesses like diabetes, cancer, mental disorders like autism and schizophrenia, and many, many other more illnesses. Research 
ongoing research and previous research has already showed a strong link between the microbiome and various illnesses. Understanding these connections can offer new insights into disease prevention and diagnosis and treatment. So today on this platform, various experts will share their knowledge and experience on the microbiome and clinical manifestations, uh, clinical applications to our daily life in prevention of disease and management of diseases. So I like to wish all the speakers and participants to have a great sharing experience. And certainly this knowledge will help us, healthcare providers and doctors and all have a better understanding of the role of microbiota and of a better management to the healthcare of our patients. So without much ado, I declare this Congress open. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Paramit, uh, for your good wishes and uh, especially joining us all the way from Malaysia. Uh, we wish your work through the association that is the Malaysian Association for Advancement of Functional and uh, Interdisciplinary Medicine uh, all the best and your vision of delivering patient safety through interdisciplinary action may find its way through your service. Uh, so now for the inaugural session, we have with us a well-wisher, or also a client of uh, Alpha Naturals, a renowned Indian film director, screenwriter, and uh, dialogue writer, known for his contribution in Hindi cinemas and television, that is none other than uh, Mr. Vijay Krishna Acharya, uh, has sent a video delivering his well-wishes uh, for our Congress. So he is well-known for his uh, directorial portfolios that include movies like Tashan, Doom, Thugs of Hindustan, and The Great Indian Family. May I request the team to kindly uh, play the video. Hello, I'm Vijay Hello, I am Vijay Krishnacharya, and I am delighted to see this initiative by Alpha Naturals to host a conference on gut matters. Awareness about gut issues is low, and a significant number of people are troubled by gut issues. So, my best wishes go to all the young minds who have come together for this conference, and I'm sure that this conference will go a long way in raising awareness and for paving the way for treatments about gut issues. Once again, all the best. And I'd like to introduce the gastro gut experts and all the best to them. Thank you. We are grateful to Mr. Vijay for his short and sweet uh, presentation and wishes for the uh, Congress. Well, dear participants, uh, after the successful first international conference on fasting, here the gastro gut experts team led by Dr. Praveen is all set to begin the second international gut conference on prebiotics, probiotics, gut microbiome, and its clinical applications. Participants, please note that uh, as the sessions go on, if you may have any queries, kindly post your questions in the chat box. At the end of each session, we have 10 minutes uh, allotted for question answers. So all your queries, we will try and cover as many questions and give answers within the time allotted. So kindly post your questions in the chat box during the session or at the end of the session. So moving on uh, with our first uh, session for the day, we have Dr. Sabine Hazan. Dr. Sabine is a distinguished clinician, a researcher with over 20 years of clinical experience uh, and with her fellowship, a clinical gastroenterology fellow from the University of Florida. Dr. Sabine Hazan uh, is an expert in the gastrointestinal expertise uh, such as microbiome sequencing, fecal transplant, esophageal and anal motility, diagnostics, and other tools. 
uh, ma'am, it's an honor to have you with us. And uh, through your initiative, we are going to get enlightened on the topic that is gut microbiome and disease. That is nothing but the power of uh, bacteria in our gut. May I kindly request you to proceed with the session. Great, thank you. And thank you for having me. I'm going to share my presentation. So um, thank you. A couple of disclaimers. I am the CEO of a company that does clinical trials, um, Venture Clinical Trials. I am a CEO of a genetic sequencing lab, Progena Biome. We're understanding and looking at the microbiome. And I founded the Microbiome Research Foundation because that's how we get funds to pay for the research. And the Malibu Microbiome Meeting, which is essentially a, a meeting for physicians to come and speak that are doing fecal transplant, um, et cetera. I always start my lecture with, if we knew what we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? Albert Einstein, mainly because the microbiome, uh, there's so much we don't know. Um, and there's so much we don't even know we don't know. So, you know, we have to stay humble. Um, Hippocrates 2,500 years ago said all disease begins in the gut. And now we're proving it actually 2,500 years later. Maimonides 1135 to 1204 said no disease that can be treated by diet should be treated by any other way. William Osler, one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses not to take medicine. And William Mayo, the aim of medicine is to prevent disease, prolong life. The ideal medicine is to eliminate the need for a physician. So where have we gone wrong? Four billion prescriptions in 2011, and now we're up to um, close to 20 billion prescriptions every year. Um, it's not only the prescriptions, unfortunately, it's also the nutraceuticals, the vitamins, the enzymes. What is all that doing to our microbiome? And then you add on top of that, the supersize it. And I'm sure there's Costco that's hit your neck of the woods as well, because unfortunately there's globalization, there's too much marketing, and we are falling for that marketing where we believe that the food um, that is fast food is good for us and we want it in other countries. And of course it arrives to other countries and affects our microbiome. There's also a big push of marketing, auto, uh, autism probiotic. If a probiotic was the answer to autism, we would not be having one in 30 cases of autism. So unfortunately, globalization, which is really the advances in transportation and com communications, uh, global interactions, trade agreements between countries, allow for this globalization and foods to be passed from one country to another, leading to what I like to call globesity. So unfortunately, with globalization and changing our nutrition, think about the diet of India 30 years or 100 years ago and the diet of today, which is more Americanized. Think about the diet of Mexico 100 years ago and the diet of today, which is again, more globalized. These changes affect our microbiome. And this is why we're seeing across the country in America, more than 35% of non-Hispanic black adults morbidly obese. So this is not only a problem in America, but also around the world. When you look at Kiribati, little islands in the Pacific that are morbidly obese and where the kids are starting to become diabetics, um, this is a problem. So we have um, increased the, the disease uh, problem around the world and chronic from chronic autoimmune problems to um, you know COVID. And I think we've seen with COVID an increased uh, rate of COVID around the world. Could it be that there's a dysbiosis? Obviously the highest level of COVID was in America. Is America leading the way in what we should not be doing as far as diet, uh, especially with other countries? But it's not only, you know, unfortunately, um, uh, obesity, it is also uh, MS. Um, it is also going, you know, super high. Parkinson's is also gone super high in the last couple of years, at least. Alzheimer's has gone uh, high around the world. Autism, Lyme disease, Lyme disease has uh, climbed up uh, not only in America, but also around the world. 
Uh, and this is the uh, graphic of Lyme disease, which is affecting pretty much everywhere. So what is going on? And interestingly enough, you'll see that Africa has not really certain areas of Central Africa have not been touched by Lyme disease. Could it be that they have some microbes in there that allows them to survive Lyme disease? So what is the cause of all this? You know, we we talk about, you know, um, you know, microbiome dysbiosis, and we talk about, you know, um, you know, pesticides. Are pesticides the problem? Why we have a dysbiosis? Is it the fast food? Is it the polypharmacy? Is it the contaminated food? Is it the contaminated medications? Is it the exposure to radiation? Is it the vaccination, the antibiotics we give in our cows possibly? So all that plays a huge role. Um, you know, everything we do to our food, everything we um, eat in our food, unfortunately comes to hurt us in the future. So I always say the microbiome tells the story. What is the microbiome? A collection of all genomes of microbes in an ecosystem. In other words, the sequence of every microbe that's around us in our skin, in our nose, in our mouths, in our lungs. Um, I like to compare the microbiome to a transmission of a car. I think when you look at that log in your toilet, which is your poop sample, you kind of think of it as just stools, and but when you actually break it down, it's trillions of microbes, just like a transmission. When you break down this solid piece of a transmission, there's actually 880 pieces in there, and each piece, if broken, can damage the transmission, and you're going to need to exchange that transmission. So this is kind of what it is with the microbiome. Um, the first thing that we noticed when we started looking at the microbiome is how different we all are. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the genetic sequencing so people can understand what we do. This is deep genetic sequencing of the microbiome. Each column is an individual's microbiome. Each color is a group of microbes. This is very expensive technology. This is not something that you can do like a hemoglobin in a lab and certainly very expensive to bring to, you know, to the whole world to do it right, to do it at the right level and at the depth that we need to look at. So when you look at the microbiome of 26 healthy individuals, you will notice that they all have a different microbiome. It makes sense because we all have different fingerprints that we would have different microbiomes, but also we come from different regions in the world. You know, I come from North Africa. My microbiome is different than somebody that comes from Mexico. I've also traveled to Japan, to Malaysia, to Singapore. My microbiome has changed having been exposed to all these things. So definitely my microbiome is different than another person. One thing we did notice is that the microbiome of families is very similar. So when you want to look at a disease, you really have to kind of look at the family first to see what is going on in that family member versus the people that do not have um, that problem in the family. So this is my family portrait. The first uh, gra the first column is my husband. The second one is me. Third one is my oldest child. And the fourth one is my little one. And you could see that the, the old, my husband and my little one are very similar in their microbiome. And me and my oldest daughter are very similar in our microbiome, but yet different from everybody else. Are those similarities in our microbiome, are, is that the reason that me and my oldest child are very similar? It, and my husband and my little one are very similar. So there is something in the microbiome. Now, on the whole, we are a pretty neurotypical family. Uh, what was amazing to see is that that natural, that, you know, abundance of microbes that is pretty equal, pretty abundant, and nothing is really popping up as far as microbes, and there is no real dysbiosis. When you start looking at a family with autism, the first column, so the first picture is at the phylum level. So you can already start seeing that the first column is the mom. The second column is a child that's neurotypical. That's a triplet. Third column is a child that's a triplet. That's neurotypical. And the fourth column is a child that is autistic. You can already see the red mark at the phylum level that there's a problem with the autistic child in his microbiome. As you look into the genus, 
you start noticing, well, the mom's got some bifidobacteria. The first and second child have bifidobacteria. But the little one with autism has no bifidobacteria, which is one of the microbes that we see in your probiotics. When you zone in on the species of this family, and really it's forensic medicine to kind of go in super deep and try to explore the microbiome, you will notice that the mom has an overgrowth of a certain microbe, which is in the bacteroides level. The two kids in the middle have a lot of diversity, but the last kid, the third triplet, has an overgrowth of that bacteroides that the mom had. Is it possible that the mom gave too much of that bacteroides during pregnancy to the third child? And therefore, maybe the two kids in the middle are good donors, possibly, for the third, um, for the for the triplet. Um, so this was the beginning. This was the beginning of looking at triplets, looking at twins, seeing what is going on in the microbiome of autism. Is autism a microbiome problem or is it a neurological problem or is it a brain gut access? Certainly this kind of picture almost says, well, this might be a microbiome. You know, this is a kid that basically um, underwent at home therapy of a fecal transplant and 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 the kid is coming out. So there is something to be said about, you know, the transplanting the right microbes into a kid with autism. Uh, but also making sure that there's no that the the when you're about to use a donor, you're not going to give the same microbes that the kid already has, because that would be, you know, um a moot point. In this case, this is a classic case. It was a classic case of two kids in the middle having a perfect microbiome and therefore uh, being a possible donors for being possible donors for the triplet. So C. diff we really was the basic model of human dysbiosis. And, and from C. diff, you know, that microbe that, uh, you know, has given us a lot of problems from giving patients antibiotics. From C. diff, fecal transplant really opened our eyes to the power of the microbiome. When we saw C. diff no longer being a problem, um, you know, with fecal transplant, that's when we started realizing that maybe there is something in the microbiome. Fecal transplant, for those of you who do not know, it's the process of taking stools from a healthy donor and implanting it into an unhealthy. For the condition of C. diff, which is approved in America, um, under the guidance of the FDA. So this is before and after fecal transplant C. diff, eradication of C. diff after fecal transplant. Um, one thing we learned when we started looking at patients and is that, uh, and looking at the microbiome early on in the uh, pre-pandemic, we noticed that a lot of people had C. diff in their gut, but didn't have any diarrhea or toxigenic C. diff. When we looked at over 120 patients, we noticed that everybody had an overabundance of C. diff. It was present in their gut, but it wasn't really causing problems, which brought the idea of perhaps C. diff is just a fingerprint, uh, you know, present in the microbiome. And the two that you see that didn't have C. diff were on chronic antibiotics. So are antibiotics really the answer for C. diff or not? We decided to look at the microbiome of patient, a patient that I did fecal transplant on. So the first column is a patient with um, a Shannon index of 3.8, which is loss of diversity, essentially. We gave him an implant of a good donor, 6.2, and you could see that the process of engraftment occurred and that C. diff was improved and the patient showed his diversity to continue at 6.3, 6.6, 6.0, matching the donor to a certain point. In fact, this patient craved orange juice like the donor. So when you look at C. diff and you start saying, well, you know, my patients, are, I have C. diff, but is C. diff toxigenic, non-toxigenic? You do toxin of C. diff and you find out that, no, the patient doesn't have C. diff, but you still wonder because the patient may have some a little bit of those symptoms of abdominal pain, but you're not sure if C. diff is a problem. So what we do is we do what's called an RNA pipeline, which is basically taking the DNA, transcribing it to an RNA, and we start seeing the, the 
reproduction of C. diff. So in patients where we find C. diff toxin negative, patients are having problems and we wonder if C. diff might be the problem or if there's a dysbiosis, that's when we really start looking at an RNA pipeline. Uh, we published engraftment by next generation sequencing to basically show that donor matching the, the recipient to kind of show that, you know, when you do fecal transplant, when you do put a donor stool in there, that donor really matches the, the recipient matches the donor and therefore that is success. So this is for the first time um, the way to show that fecal transplant not only improves the condition, but now we have a way to analyze, um, to see what is going on in the microbiome. I always say, you know, with C. diff, it was easy because C. diff, we were basically, we knew there was a microbe. We knew how to kill C. diff. You gave it vancomycin or flagell. And then we knew that if you restore the microbiome, that's the way to do it, right? For every other condition, it's not that simple because unfortunately you have to find the bug. You have to find the bug that creates the problem. You have to eradicate the bug and then you have to restore the microbiome. It's not that straightforward. So I always say the microbiome tells the story through pictures. You know, certainly for me, uh, the microbiome told the story of a patient with that improved with Alzheimer's when I did fecal transplant. You know, obviously we need to do more studies. We need to look at the, the, the donors to see, you know, this was this an N of one and therefore, you know, I was just lucky that this patient improved or did the microbiome improve? And there was a microbe that was the culprit of the Alzheimer's to begin with. So this is the beginning of research, uh, but it is fascinating to see. Another thing that we discovered is that diversity equals health, loss of diversity equals disease. So when you see a kid with autism, with loss of diversity, maybe that autism is caused by loss of diversity. Uh, we, I had a pleasure of doing a case with the FDA that uh, took about three years in between COVID to get approved. And this was a patient with um, autism where we discovered that he had uh, lactobacillus, lactobacillus animalis. We found the microbe. Um, we gave him a donor who was his sister, very diverse microbiome. And then essentially post-fecal transplant, the patient matched, the sister retained. Uh, but on a deeper picture, this is what we're seeing. Uh, proteobacteria was super high in the kid. After fecal transplant, it disappeared. He matched his donor, the sister, who was basically had zero proteobacteria. Lactobacillus animalis, which we didn't even know was could be a culprit to autism disappeared after fecal transplant. And then the process of refluoralization, which is essentially regrowth of new microbes, new good bacteria, the actinobacteria. Um, C. diff, the microbiome told us the story. Um, this is the first column is a patient with a Shannon diversity of 1.3 who had C. diff. The second column is the patient with vancomycin still has C. diff, but what did vancomycin do? it actually killed the diversity even more. The C. diff persisted. We gave this patient fidaxomycin, which is another antibiotic, and then sure enough, dropped his diversity from 0.8 to 0.7. And then of course, as we did fecal transplant, the microbiome was restored and restored the diversity, which is an important case to show how C. diff um, you know, um, was improved by fecal transplant. So it was all about finding the bug, killing the bug, and then restoring the microbiome. The microbiome tells the story of Crohn's disease. This is a mom on the first column. The middle picture is a Crohn's patient who we did not give, we did not do fecal transplant. We gave him something else and the kid improved. In fact, this was bovine immunoglobulins and the kid's diversity went from 2.9 to 4.9. So you know, the microbiome told me the story. It was not only the fact that his fecal caprotectin improved and his CDAI improved, but really the, the microbiome changed. Coronavirus, we were the first lab to isolate whole genome sequence of COVID in the stools, which actually pushed our government to look into the septic tank. From there, we had, um, we noticed that there were different types of viruses. Um, when we isolated or when we found the sequence of COVID in the stools, 
we decided to look at um, kids during the pandemic. Uh, one kid in particular had COVID, had uh, Tourette's and was exposed to her parents with COVID. It turned out that she had zero bifidobacteria, had COVID in her stools for up to six months. When we eradicated COVID, um, we eradicated the Tourette's in this case. So if COVID is in the stools, what is it doing to microbiome and what does the microbiome look like in patients with COVID? Um, this brought us to a pa paper, which is basically the pre-existing. It's a signature that we're seeing um, uh, in the microbiome. This was a family of four. Three of them didn't have COVID, lived in the same household, shared food, and one a patient had COVID. The single most important feature that we discovered was the loss of bifidobacteria in the kid with COVID, which then brought us to look at more families. And this is a, a picture of um, um, seven people in the family. The kid did not have COVID, had a couple of sneezes, and his bifidobacteria was super high as opposed to the rest of the family. Because of these family pictures, I started looking at bigger numbers and comparing people that were severe COVID to moderate, mild, to high risk exposed. And what we discovered was the loss of bifidobacteria in severe patients with COVID. This is a landmark paper in COVID, in my opinion, because it really demonstrates that bifidobacteria has a role in COVID. And therefore, possibly, we all know that bacteria is much bigger than viruses. So possibly the bacteria itself uh, kills or gets rid of the virus. So this was a paper that was published in BMJ, The Missing Microbes. And it wasn't only bifidobacteria that we noticed that was important, but also facilobacteria and pratsnitsi. And diversity was, again, important. Why bifidobacteria? Bifidobacteria is present in baby. The first column is a mom. The second column is a newborn. And you could see the newborn has a lot of bifidobacteria. The process of aging is actually loss of bifidobacteria. Um, interesting little finding on probiotics and bifidobacteria, it actually decomposes plastic. So when you're swallowing a bottle of, when you're swallowing water from a bottle that sat outside forever and you wonder if you've got some little plastic in your gut. Well, if you have enough bifidobacteria, you should be fine and decompose that plastic. So what is bifidobacteria other than a trillion dollar industry? Um, you know, this is really the market right now <clears throat> that's predicted and it keeps going up. It's in the billions and trillions. It's not only a probiotic for humans. It's for animals, it's in our food supply, it's in everything. Um, what we noticed when we looked at, you know, Lyme disease, we noticed that patients with Lyme also had loss of bifidobacteria. So is Lyme disease caused because of the bug that entered, the microbe that entered and therefore killed the microbiome? Or is it because we gave so much antibiotics that we killed the microbiome? That um, remains to be told. <clears throat> so this is looking at control group versus Lyme patients, 36 patients. And we noticed that there was a decreased relative abundance in actinobacteria, the phylum that com comprises bifidobacteria. When you looked at bifidobacteria, the p-value was 0 0.0001. There was a marked decrease in relative abundance of bifidobacteria compared to the control. Uh, Bacteroides, interestingly enough, was on the climb of going up, therefore possible increase. Um, and uh, Shannon diversity, the diversity in Lyme patient was also lower. Uh, bifidobacteria uh, in Crohn's disease, we looked at patients that were naive to treatment. Um, symptomatic Crohn's patients had early um, Crohn's disease, and we noticed that they had zero bifidobacteria. Um, as we started treating them, as there was treatment, their bifidobacteria started improving. And that's what we're seeing with the treat treated asymptomatic, higher bifidobacteria compared to untreated symptomatic. Um, loss of bifidobacteria was also noticed in invasive cancer. This is a new finding that we presented in May 
this year at DDW. Um, so when you're seeing a lot of aggressive cancer, you have to wonder, is that patient losing his bifidobacteria? There's going to become a time where we're going to start thinking that microbes are the culprit of all cancers. And really, it's a battle, again, between microbes in our guts. Um, and since this conference is about probiotics, I'm going to spend um, a little bit of time on the probiotics. Uh, the question that you should be asking the probiotics is really, is the probiotic real? Is the bacteria alive or dead? You know, remember, you're trying to mimic the microbiome, which is anaerobic and doesn't breathe oxygen. So if you're giving it a bacteria that's dead, what is that doing to a live microbe? microbiome, right? And then the other most important thing that I've come to realize is if we give probiotics, are we stopping the body's ability not to make its own bifidobacteria, but to sort of like allow for the production on its own, um, you know, kind of like with digestive enzymes, you know, when we suppress the ability of the pancreas to work because we're giving it digestive enzymes. And then there's the whole interest of, you know, what if we give a low quality probiotic to a patient versus a high quality? So we looked at patients with low quality and noticed that they actually had zero bifidobacteria. Is that low quality or that dead microbe causing harm to the patients? And therefore that's why they have zero bifidobacteria. Um, or is it that the probiotic itself doesn't really implant because it's just such poor quality, or maybe there's a reason the capsule was made, doesn't really get to the cecum. And then we looked at high quality that were tested and noticed that there was an increase in the in the bifidobacteria. The problem is that doesn't really implant too often. So that's the biggest challenge with the probiotics. And then when you look at exposed at uh, people that don't take probiotics that are control group, they have a lot of bifidobacteria. We also looked at probiotics over the counter um, in my neck of the woods. So I'm not going to say which products, but we looked in Malibu, you know, um, at Whole Foods and Ralph, uh, Ralph's, which is our shopping centers. And basically noticed that out of 26 products that say bifidobacteria on there, only five of them had bifidobacteria, but really only three had really good amounts of bifidobacteria in the probiotic. Uh, recently, and what made the news recently is this probiotic. So there was a newborn that was treated with probiotics in the hospital with B. Infentis. This was a product that was sponsored by Bill Gates. And um, the newborn ended up dying from this probiotic uh, from sepsis. So here's the question that I have on this case is, was the probiotic real or was it dead bacteria and therefore killed the newborn? What Did the newborn really need probiotics or should we have let him get fed, breast, breastfed and therefore increase his own ability to make probiotics? Um, was the probiotic contaminated with another microbe or was the was the baby having no microbes period and therefore was susceptible to the environment in the hospital of more microbes and therefore the probiotic was just not enough to help this kid along. So there's a lot of questions from this case, which has the FDA stopping this. So what does increase the bifidobacteria? Well, we noticed vitamin C. When you look at the in vitro studies, vitamin C increases bifidobacteria, but we took humans and notice that if you gave vitamin C before and after, the bifidobacteria would increase. Bovine immunoglobulins, the blood spun of a cow. This was a product that was uh, actually, uh, the cows are not vaccinated, no hormones and no antibiotics. Uh, we took the blood, spun it around, uh, created a formula of uh, uh, cryo-freezed this, this blood and gave it to patients. And we noticed that it actually increased the, the bifidobacteria Drop the bacteroides, which too often there's an imbalance between the bacteroides and the bifidobacteria, increase the firmicutes and decrease the proteobacteria, but also increase the diversity, which is what I saw in healing a patient with, um, with Crohn's disease. Um, honey, and I'm a big pusher of honey, uh, especially your local honey in wherever you are, is very important. The bees are essentially utilizing the sugar from the fruits 
and their intestines are full of uh, microbes. Interestingly enough, the rectum, uh, so when you get that honey, and most people don't realize that the honey is actually the microbiome of the bee, uh, that's full of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. So honey is actually a great product provided that they don't kill the bees uh, because that is really what we need in the planet. So we really need to save the bif and save the bees. Uh, prebiotics, prebiotics um, are essential to the growth of uh, bifidobacteria. Uh, they help in lodging these microbes. They help in the nutrition of these microbes. Uh, so prebiotics are very important and you, I prefer the natural prebiotic, your bananas, your fibers, your sweet potatoes, your pineapples. Um, those are all great. Uh, there are a couple of great prebiotics out there, but just make sure that you don't have contamination. Um, of course, you know, uh, prebiotic, probiotic, and and really your nutraceuticals is the key. The other important thing to remember is to stop to not kill, um, you know, your my, your bifidobacteria. Um, another drug which got a lot of attention in the news and in the media is the whole ivermectin. Well, ivermectin is actually a fermented product of a bacteria called streptomyces, which is in the phylum of, of bifidobacteria, of actinobacteria. Um, this paper was written and actually was retracted, tells you about the corruption that's going on in medicine right now, uh, when a hypothesis is retracted, but basically showed that ivermectin, uh, talked about ivermectin possibly feeding the bifidobacteria and therefore increasing the microbiome. This was very helpful in COVID because I noticed that patients that underwent cytokine storm, the bifidobacteria bound to the TNF alpha most likely increased um, in the colon and released um, the cytokines, which was important during the cytokine storm. Uh, the data is coming in October uh, at ACG, where we actually demonstrated that ivermectin does increase the bifidobacteria within 24 hours. What we didn't show is that whether it continued to increase the bifidobacteria. Um, I doubt it because of the fact that ivermectin only lasts 24 hours. So it's really to be used when you really need it during a cytokine storm and nothing else, in my opinion, unless you're doing clinical trials and you're you know, looking at that. I think one of the most important thing to remember is that as you're building your microbiome, it's important not to kill it. So a couple of things that I avoid is... Um, you know, I tell my patient not to overdo it with alcohol, not to do, overdo it with caffeine. Um, we did notice that vaccines for COVID, the messenger RNA, did decrease and affect the, the microbiome. Uh, this was a paper that won a lot of attention. You know, if you're seeing patients or cases of vaccine injured or increased cancer, one wonders if killing the, the bifidobacteria affected uh, the microbiome of the patient and therefore predisposed them to a cancer down the road. We did notice persistent damage in four, case, four patients, but we're actually up to a couple dozen patients um, and we are noticing persisting damage in the vaccines to the point that actually when I do analyze the stools of patients now, you know, of course, these patients are coming to me for diseases, but I am noticing loss of bifidobacteria is the number one problem. So it's, you know, the microbiome is like that forest is the Amazon jungle. You kill a bunch of trees. Eventually you have no life and it's impossible to have a human be healthy without microbes. Microbes is really what helps us function. It is what helps us with absorption of sugar, absorption of dairy. Um, I'm all about preserving the microbiome of humanity, preserving the diversity of the microbiome, preserving the different regions of the microbiome going back to the diet of our ancestors in those regions is very important. Preserving the cultures, the foods of every region, because really in order for the whole planet to kind of stay one planet, we really need to have a diverse microbiome. You know, it's basically like humans, you know, every human has a function and every human is beautiful regardless of color, or, or, or body or anything. It's that diversity in the, in humanity that allows us to be beautiful. I wrote this little book called let's talk blank. 
uh, for those who want to read it, and another book called Regenesis. Uh, I think I proved that all disease begins at the gut, but first do no harm. It's important when we start manipulating microbes to be very cautious and very careful. Um, I can be reached as Dr. Sabine Hazen at drhazen.progenobiome.com. And my Twitter feed is Sabine Hazen MD. I'm a little bit uh, feisty on there because uh, I'm fighting the trolls constantly. But now I finished on time and I have plenty of time for questions. So happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Sabine, for the insights into microbiome uh, sequencing and, of course, enlightening us on prebiotics, probiotics, and how to conserve and flourish the gut flora. Uh, we do have a lot of questions, so I'll quickly take a few questions. Uh, to begin with, uh, we have uh, Mr. Arnab Goa asking us, uh, kindly give us information on gut microbiome and cerebral palsy, the association between gut microbiome and cerebral palsy, in brief. There's a, I don't have to, any data on cerebral palsy yet, so I cannot comment. Okay. So coming down to more specific questions, uh, can children be donors for fecal transplant? If the child is healthy and if the child is um, has a good microbiome, um, there are certain parameters that we look at to make a donor donor. So if the kid meets those parameters, yes. Yes. Okay. So the next question is from Shruti. She asks, uh, should the gut health of a mother be taken into consideration before giving birth to reduce autism? Yeah, I think uh, more importantly, decreasing the stress to the mother, decreasing antibiotics to the mother, decreasing, you know, I think decreasing vaccination to the mom, if possible, you know, there's, we've, with COVID, we noticed, um, we haven't, we don't have a huge amount of data, but we've noticed definitely a loss of bifidobacteria in kids whose moms were vaccinated. And, you know, the spike protein does pass the breast milk. So, you know, anything you can do to decrease the stress and to decrease, to have the mom have a great pregnancy would be best. The next question is from um, Sofian Rambe. Uh, she said, it's a very interesting presentation, Sabine. I think you know her. So the question is, uh, what's your suggestion for us to boost our microbiota's social network in this modern indoor, indoor generation type of living? Uh, yeah, so I encourage, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gardening. There's a lot of, you know, um, towers of gardening that you can do in your house. I encourage people to get into the dirt, to garden, even if they're living, you know, in an apartment, just get yourself some dirt and start gardening a little bit or grow, you know, strawberries in your house or whatever. So I think that's the first thing. Decreased stress is very important. I, you know, we, the number one thing that I find uh, that affects the microbiome is stress. Um, and I think we all see that, right? Patients that have disease, disease just doesn't occur by itself. It's really stress-induced disease. You know, the husband and wife got divorced or the and the children starts having Crohn's disease or husband and wife or husband dies and wife starts decompensating because of the fact that her husband died. So I think stress is number one, decrease stress as much as possible. Look, turn off the media as much as possible. There's nothing good on the media these days. It's all drama and soap opera. Um, because I think we internalize all that, right? So I think if we internalize all that, it affects our microbiome. You know, go outside as much as possible, yoga, meditation, um, you know, hikes, that's so important. Um, good diet, um, Not try to avoid fast food, try to get into foods that are naturally prepared, Make sure you know your farmer, make sure you know your products, what you're eating in your gut, because we are what we eat. Um, that's pretty much all I would recommend right now. And a good vitamin, good vitamin D. And if you're not in the sun, then probably get yourself some vitamin D. All right. All right. The next question is from Mr. Matthew Jacob. It says, is autism caused by gut dysbiosis that occurs during birth or is it linked to misuse of antibiotics in the later years? Well, we, I, 
I don't think I'm going to put myself out there yet onto saying what it is, uh, mainly because autism is not a one, one answer. It is not. Uh, I think we make a mistake when we think that it's one cause. Nothing in medicine is one cause, right? So you could have autism that's primary neurological. You know, you think of the kid that had a brain injury um, during birth, and now all of a sudden his brain waves are out of whack. That kid, that's a primary neurological. Or the kid that had a connection between the, the brain and the gut, where the nerve is just not is damaged somehow, um, then that kid, that's the problem there. Or the kid that has a dysbiosis in the gut, microbiome dysbiosis, yeah, that, that could be the cause. And then, then you have to look at what is the cause of that microbiome dysbiosis? Is it from the antibiotics? Is it from, you know, um, you know, the stress in the mom? Is it the mom took something during pregnancy that she didn't even know that she was taking, right? Or contaminated drugs, or there's so many reasons as to, and did it happen while the baby was in utero? Or did it happen after the baby was born? Or did it happen two years into the birth of the child. There's so many questions. Every kid that has autism that comes to me, we have a um, series of questions that we ask them. And we have over 300 patients on that so far. And I can tell you the, the, the questions are similar on certain things, but are very different on other things. So as we start looking at that data carefully, we'll get to know more. But we're at the beginning. Again, we have uh, Mr. Sanjay asking us, what are the two books written by you, Dr. Sabin? So we let's can talk read more about S-H- it. Yeah, let's talk SH question mark T dot, and that's on the progenabiome.com. And then the other one is Regenesis. And that's also on Amazon. And I think it's on the audio as well. They bo- they're both on audio if you cannot get them as a book. Uh, so the next question is about ivermectin. What is the right dose uh, to build immunity? How much of ivermectin is to be dosed to build immunity? You cannot build immunity with ivermectin right now. There is no data. So all we saw was that it increased bifidobacteria within 24 hours, which is would be useful for COVID. However, There's no data on what does it do long-term, right? What does ivermectin do to the microbiome long-term? Is it increasing the bifido within 24 hours and dropping it even lower 24 hours later? And therefore, is it good to go through this yo-yo of up, down, up, down? Is that maybe turbulent to the microbiome? So I think it's a mistake to start thinking from this data of seeing that increase in the bifidobacteria and saying, oh, well, it could increase immunity. No, we're very early into this. It's a great, it's a great safe drug, but it's also not a drug that I would give long-term. And I'll be honest with that. I I'm not a, we were not made as human beings to, to be born and to take probiotics or to take ivermectin to stay alive that we are supposed to use the environment and the foods around us that's natural, that's given to us to increase our immunity. You want to build your immunity? You go out there, you expose yourself to all sorts of microbes and you toughen up when you get sick to build that immunity. That's how you build your immunity. My immunity was built during COVID. And I can tell you, I didn't take ivermectin. I just went in front of all the patients. I exposed myself to everything. I traveled to Malaysia for 33 hours. I didn't get a cough or a sneeze. Immunity is something you build by exposing yourself and eating the right foods and doing the right things with the nutraceuticals and the right vitamins and making sure that if you're overdoing it, you're overstressed, you haven't seen the sun in 10 days because you're working indoors, that you supplement your vitamin D. And you supplement your vitamin C when you're weaker, you know, that's important and your zinc and your B. So, you know, all these vitamins, you know, I think we're, we're depleted in, in life because we're such, you know, fast food that we forget to eat the good foods that give us these good vitamins. 
let's take the last question. So when your mother has suffered stomach cancer with no history of, uh, you know, familiar history of cancer, will the kid contract cancer uh, because of a low bifidobacteria? Can a kid of a cancer mother suffer from cancer? I, I mean, listen, you know, it's not, it's right now, these are observations that we saw loss of bifidobacteria in invasive cancer. We don't know whether certain microbes are transmitted, right? And therefore cause cancer, right? I think we'd have to look at H. pylori to begin with and all the gastric cancer. Did the kids have stomach cancer, you know, themselves? I think personally, I don't think so. I, but again, is, is cancer a genetic problem or is it a microbiome problem, right? So I don't think we should be looking at just the one data of the loss of bifidobacteria. I think we should look at the whole you know, picture when you look at the microbiome and also looking at the genetics when we look at cancer. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sabine, uh, for assertive and very informative uh, answers to all the queries that our participants have. And of course, an enlightening session uh, on the topic. And uh, of course, all of you can contact her on the details that she has shared. And on behalf of the organizing team, I thank you uh, for this session. Thank you so much. So the participants now uh, kindly note that if you have any more queries, uh, you may contact the organizing team that is the GastroGut Expert on the following website that is www.gastrogutexperts.com. We also have a special announcement for the participants. Uh, the team GastroGut Experts led by Dr. Praveen is announcing the launch of more programs, CMEs. Please note that all the uh, gut health enthusiasts, the medical professionals who would like to acquire more knowledge after this conference may contact the organizing team on their website or uh, contact Dr. Praveen directly via WhatsApp. Uh, I believe that all of you have the contact number on the WhatsApp group that has been already created. So for your information that the team is going to continue with the uh, CME uh, programs on uh, 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 microbiomes and uh, autoimmune diseases. And very soon, they are going to launch a franchisee program. So all the doctors who are interested to establish gut clinic may contact the organizing team. Now, this they are going to launch this program where the organizing team is going to help you with all the information required, medical support, establishment support, collaborations, as well as uh, a continuous coordination assistance with the treatment protocols. So all the doctors who are following uh, the gut gast gastro gut experts and alpha natural closely, you may directly contact the team for assistance to establish a gut clinic in your premises. Also, uh, there will be a short course, a fellowship program launched by the gut, gastro gut experts on uh, gut health and autoimmune diseases. So all those who are interested may kindly contact the team on uh, for mentioned uh, details. We now next move on to the second session that is by the Alpha Natural Research and Development Team. The team of uh, uh, Alpha Naturals is empowered by a strong team of uh, molecular scientists. And now we have with us the chief scientist of Alpha Naturals uh, Research and Development Team, who's going to uh, present a topic on gut metabolic stagnation, toxemia, and disease development. May I request the team to kindly take over? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Yeah, I'll try to share the screen. Is it visible? Yes, the screen is visible. Uh, you may start the project uh, from the first slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, good morning. And uh, 
today i will discuss about how metabolic stagnation is related to uh, disease development and uh, this is also one of the uh, most controversial theories uh, in uh, is something interrupting the slide or it's fine Used. The slides are visible. Just visible, right? Okay. Yeah. So it's been for a very quite long time that natural medicine practitioners were telling that fruit fasting or shifting to raw salads can cure chronic diseases. But this is also one of the most debated, controversial, and considered unscientific theories. And uh, the whole idea that uh, constipation or stagnation of food in the gut can cause disease also brings back to our uh, previous theories and well uh, circulated theories in Ayurveda that Amahi Sarva Roganam Hetu, uh, which means the undigested stagnation is the fundamental cause of all diseases. Uh, and uh, Ayurveda also says that Roga Sarvepi Mandakni. So if the digestion is weak, uh, this causes all the symptoms of the disease. And um, so it's not that the digestion become weak all the time. We consume uh, food, processed food in such a way that we are not evolutionarily prepared. Our enzymes are not evolutionarily prepared to act on them. And the digestion is delayed and they are fermented. So I, I will address three um, important questions here. A stagnation and fermentation of processed food in the gut for several days by gut bacteria. What are the toxins they produce? And does these toxic metabolites have a potential to cause disease? And can probiotics reduce this toxemia? So compared to the natural foods, uh, which also ferments, but it, it moves out, but the processed food stays longer for several days. And it depends on the patient, not for everyone. So out of 207 gut metabolites studied for their uh, relationship with disease, I will pick just one of them and explain a story in a simplified may, way. And maybe this has relation to other uh, metabolites as well. So let's take uh, the fried meat. This is red meat. This is rich in uh, carnitine. And uh, 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 this meat, uh, when you fry it at uh, in oil, like 180 degrees centigrade or above 180 degrees centigrade for more than 7.5 minutes. So you don't get amino acids there, but what you have is pol uh, acrylamide. Uh, and this, this data uh, shows that, uh, oh, this, uh, that heating at 7.5 minutes, uh, what we have is uh, a uh, huge amount of acrylamide and they are not amino acids. Doctor, could you please check your audio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it fine? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah. So what uh, carnitine 
when it ferments, it finally makes TMAO. And what TMAO does, so TMAO is that really pungent smelling uh, molecule when uh, seafood decompose, okay? So what TMAO does is uh, uh, this can cause uh, macrophages, the immune cells to become form cells. So whenever uh, macrophages are exposed to high amount of TMAO, which is metabolized from carnitine from the red meat, so they increase scavenger receptors. And these scavenger receptors uptake a lot of LDL into the immune cells. So this forms form cells and they started accumulating in the blood vessels. Yeah, not only that, uh, in the liver, there is a, a reduction in bile secretion and reverse cholesterol transport, which is adding up to form cell formation. Again, in the endothelium, uh, and blood vessel, there's an increase in inflammation and increase in oxidative stress. And also the platelets become sticky and uh, the more plated reactivity causes a lot of thrombus. So altogether, just one metabolite can cause so much of uh, uh, pathological changes causing thrombosis. So this is a brief about how form cells are uh, formed. Uh, the uh, when PMIO is high, uh, the macrophages uh, in the blood vessel, so they can uh, uptake more modified LDL just because scavenger receptors are increased on the macrophages due to PMIO. And that causes form cell accumulation here along with platelets. And this is co causing thrombus. So uh, toxic microbiota metabolites. Another uh, one, peak resol, has been demonstrated to correlate with liquid accumulation uh, in macrophages uh, by increasing cardiovascular diseases. And another metabolite, indoxyl sulfate. Uh, this also gut derived metabolite, increasing coronary artery disease. Uh, so this uh, another independent way of action of TMAO is by oxidative stress and inflammasome uh, activation. So what is oxidative stress? All these things, processed food, uh, metals, virus, uh, abnormal metabolism, pollutants, all these cause uh, reactive oxygen species, uh, which can damage lipid protein and DNA. And once it is damaged, either the cell under apoptosis or they can become, they can get mutated and enter into a cancerous stage. So what is this unstable atoms I'm talking about? If the electron in the final uh, uh, shell is not uh, uh, paired or it's not stable, uh, these uh, at, uh, atoms are, they can hit anything to get this electron back. So it can hit the DNA or it can hit the protein and it can change, uh, it can cause DNA mutations or change the protein or lipid function. So our body has a huge uh, reservoir of antioxidants which can donate electron and make it stable. And when the antioxidants goes down, uh, we have a oxidative stress and this is what happens and uh, some of the metabolites can cause oxidative stress and cause several diseases. As again, this paper says TMAO uh, can cause endothelial dysfunction by inflammation and oxidative stress. So what are we focusing on? We, we have a, a lot of treatment focusing on reducing oxidative stress, suppressing inflammation, imagining that we are going to cure uh, the disease. Uh, but uh, oxidative stress and inflammation are, for me, it is like fire. Uh, the fire which spreads, which is causing destruction. But the fundamental cause of fire is uh, the uh, dry matter or the toxic metabolites. Uh, so if we unless we remove the toxemia or toxic metabolites, this oxidative stress, this inflammation comes back again. Uh, then uh, the disease doesn't heal forever. So removing of the fundamental cause of the disease 
is important and we need to identify what is fundamental cause of disease. And in many cases, there are these uh, metabolic stagnation. As Ayurveda says, the stagnation is the fundamental cause of all disease development. So here it's the uh, uh, same uh, published in uh, nature. So nature is one of the top uh, research uh, publications, so we can really trust it. Uh, so gut flora metabolism of phosphatidylcholine uh, promotes cardiovascular diseases. And why, why uh, the toxins or the intermediate metabolites keep accumulating in fat? Why the macrophage keep accumulating fat? Uh, I don't know, but what I hypothesize is there's no evidence for it, but fat, uh, if you put something inside the fat, um, it is not soluble in water. So you can hide any toxin in the fat and uh, your body will not be exposed to it. The, it won't dissolve in the blood and come out easily. So maybe human body want to protect you. So when there is a lot of toxic metabolite, uh, it's trying to hide it inside uh, hydrophobic areas uh, so that your uh, major vital organs will be protected. Just my hypothesis, but I'm not sure. So this paper mentions that food rich in uh, choline, uh, which is predominantly egg, milk, liver, red meat, poultry, shellfish, uh, can produce TMAO. It doesn't mean that you eat non-veg and you're going to get sick. I don't believe that uh, because if you look into the Japanese population or the Scandinavian population who are or Italian population who live above 100 years, 110, 120 years, they are all uh, non-vegetarians as well. But the type of meat they eat is different. They are not cooking like the way we are at uh, frying it in oil. Uh, so this is a cross section of the aortic root, uh, which shows uh, accumulation of uh, fat in the blood vessel, which is more compared to controls. So this is a, a, a model for cardiovascular disease, this mice. So compared to control, when you are giving a, a choline rich diet, or which produces more TMAO, you can see that the blood vessel have more accumulation of uh, fat. Um, so this is all the overall story about, um, you have the uh, phosphatidylcholine, which in the gut uh, makes TMAO, and then that enters the blood and it causes uh, heart attacks, stroke, death. And not only that, it can cause many other diseases, uh, uh, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cancer. So even though meat is fermented in the gut by bacteria, carnitine itself is a very beneficial metabolite. It's, it's, required, it's uh, required for the healthy living. It transports fatty acid uh, for beta oxidation in the mitochondria and a lot of important works. So it's the way you cook the food and uh, how, how much level it is processed. Uh, you can find that many people eat meat, even at the age of 120, they don't have a problem because these are cooked in a different way. But uh, another type of meat, which is cooked in a de uh, fried way, they have a different effect altogether. So I conclude part one. Uh, stagnation and fermentation of processed food in the gut uh, for several days do make several toxic molecules or metabolite or uh, uh, ama in Ayurvedic terms. Or And does this toxic metabolite has a potential to cause disease? So several publications are coming up to prove this. And now the dots are getting connected that uh, stagnation of food in the gut can indeed cause chronic diseases. Now, we have a lot of students in the uh, meeting, so I'll briefly go through metabolism. Uh, my voice is clear. 
Yes, you are audible. Yeah, okay. Uh, so in uh, metabolism, we have anabolism and catabolism. So anabolism is we are building up something like lipogenesis, uh, glyconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis, etc. And catabolism, we are breaking down a molecule. Uh, so glucose is uh, broken down to make ATP. In the bacteria, they use it for fermentation and uh, uh, glycogenolysis. So all these are catabolic processes. All of you are comfortable with the idea that uh, metabolism is a sum total of anabolism and catabolism balance. And uh, so let's take carbohydrate. Uh, carbohydrate is a complex uh, uh, chain of glucose which is broken down uh, and from the gut, uh, it enters the bloodstream and you have glucose entering the cell. So this glucose is converted to pyruvate and uh, this pyruvate uh, converted to acetylcholine entering the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, after the Krebs cycle, they enter TCA uh, electron transport chain and that gives uh, ATP, the energy molecule. Uh, and if you are taking fats, so we have uh, glycerol and fatty acids, which make this kind of structures. And this uh, fat can be uh, degraded to enter pyruvate, and it can also enter TCA cycle and make energy, or it can be used for making uh, several other molecules. And if we take amino acids, uh, which are derived from proteins. So these amino acids can also uh, enter the same TCA cycle in mitochondria. So before they enter, these amino acids remove something called amino group and which is passed out in urine. Uh, and these are also, several of these pathways are reversible, which means from glucose, you can make amino acids from fat, you can make amino acids. From fat, you can make glucose. Or So many things can be rewired according to the body's needs. Uh, so maybe I will uh, quickly move. So this is a cell. And here we have adipose tissue, which gives fat, which enter beta oxidation and enter TCA cycle uh, or Krebs cycle. And we have uh, glucose and amino acids. And even though what we get is this much proteins, starch, and fat, which enters the mitochondria, bacteria doesn't have a mitochondria, so they ferment. And from pyruvic acid, so glucose cut into two pieces, which we have pyruvic acid. So this is fermented by the bacteria and you have a lot of metabolites. So what is the... AMA, what does AMA in Ayurveda look like? The stagnated uh, toxemia, which uh, ancient uh, physicians are talking about. Um, so these are some of the uh, smelly metabolites uh, like putrescine or cadaverin, which you get in the decaying, the punch, uh, really bad smell of the uh, decaying meat. Uh, so all these uh, metabolites uh, could uh, be uh, causing some diseases. And uh, so when the bacteria ferment uh, food in the gut, they make several metabolites and they act through different pathways. Uh, one, they can interfere with the metabolic pathways because finally they are all carbon chains and they have structural similarities or molecular mimicry. So they can uh, form pseudo uh, metabolites, which can bind to the same enzymes, uh, which uh, will be binding to a metabolite for making energy. So these metabolites can actually interfere with the healthy metabolic pathway and rewire metabolism and it can uh, make changes in the gene expression. Uh, so overall, it's the sum total of our moods. If we are in bad mood or stressed, again, it affects. 
if we have if you are on antibiotics and if you are sick you might have noticed that you have a gut stagnation and that may be also contributing sedentary lifestyles and the diet which you are taking and all these uh, come together uh, to affect your brain lungs cardiovascular diseases and liver so this is another uh, important publication showing that uh, urea cycle uh, can uh, contribute to uh, colorectal cancer tumorogenesis so this is a brief about urea cycle so as i said before that uh, amino acids before entering the krebs cycle they remove amino group and this need to be removed because this is toxic and this amino group enter the urea cycle and it will be removed uh, through urine and uh, when uh, there is um, less uh, amount of some bacterium like bifidobacterium there is a urea burden and this burden of urea causes uh transcriptional changes in the immune cells uh, beneath the gut and this causes synthesis of polyamines and what are these polyamines these are uh, just now we were talking about putrescine and cadaverin which are the really smelly uh, metabolites so these uh, polyamines can cause uh, diseases and uh, supplementation with uh, several uh, probiotic bacteria can reduce this urea burden and can reduce tumorogenesis uh, so what is the significance of this study this study demonstrates that uh, genomic sequencing uh, of gut microbiome can be used as a diagnostic test to predict cancer probabilities so based on this uh, probiotic combination uh maybe a consortium of probiotic uh, combinations might help to reduce tumor progression so this paper found a uh, difference in urea cycle uh, and uh, um, yeah here you can see that uh, urea cycle scores are high in uh, uh, colorectal cancer patients and uh, when we take probiotics uh, this urea cycle score has reduced so what does this putrescine and uh, polyamines those smelly metabolites do in intracellular level one data shows that these polyamines can stick to enzymes that are regulating cancer cell multiplication so they can stick to these enzymes and activate them or make it more irregular that cancer cells keep dividing and it can make many other changes like prevention of ribosome stalling or increased nonsense mediated rna decay all of them kind of contributing so uh, we have a lot of toxic metabolites if we try to throw it out uh by uh, a loose motion or a fever with uh, some uh, cold or with some vomiting we will try to suppress it with uh, <clears throat> antibiotics or anti vomit and if human body try to throw it out through kidney it might cause kidney damage or liver damage so where to store it uh, you cannot keep uh, a holding a huge amount of toxic metabolites in your body because this is going to damage vital organs like heart and brain so where to store it uh, one possibility is to store it inside fat which is hydrophobic and uh, so if you take the surface area of blood vessel it is around 150 cents which i don't believe i need to recalculate so blood vessel area could be one of the spots to store toxins because it has so much of surface area and uh, if there is a rule that you cannot throw out the toxins then you need to store it inside your body then what you will do is imagine that 
you cannot store uh, the waste you cannot just throw the waste from your house and you are asked to store it inside your house then you have only one way to do that you need to put all the toxins in a plastic cover and make new rooms and dump it there and when that room is full make make another new room and again dump it there and daily you are getting more toxic waste you cannot inhale them because you are going to get sick you cannot put it in your main living room you need to make extra rooms and keep holding there so does it sound similar to cancer what cancer does is it keeps on making new cells and keeps on making new cells and uh, we already know that cancer the fundamental cause is mutation uh, but is it the actual cause the fundamental cause of mutation is something which cause a mutation the mutagen or a uh, uh, increase in some metabolite which destabilizes the um, enzymes regulating the dntp pool by n gluc and uh, o gluc n acylation so we have a catastrophic situation where lot of toxins are accumulating in our body and we are in a situation that we cannot throw it out through uh, kidney or through skin by any diseases because we are going to suppress it then uh, we need to uh, come to a compromise that we need to store it so there are two possibilities now either it will end up in a degenerative disease where the cells will die or it will keep on dividing when the cells will grow and grow which will look like cancer and there are no scientific evidence for that just hypothesis and uh, dots which are slowly getting connected so anyway let's go to this uh, paper uh, this paper shows that urea um, uh, so this is a control mice pollen uh, which is a, a tumor model mice and here you can see uh, pollen cancer and if you are giving urea extra this cancer is further increased these tumors are further increased and if you are giving probiotics along with it uh even in the presence of urea you can see that this tumor is not seen so uh the tumor number and the tumor uh, size has reduced significantly with probiotics concluding that probiotic have a very important role uh in controlling toxic metabolites and uh, reducing tumor so as uh, previously this paper uh, said that the urea burden uh, or the metabolite toxin burden in the gut uh, which can leak into the blood stream or le leak into finally enter the immune cells which cause excessive uh, preparation of polyamines like putrescine or cadaverin and these are going to cause diseases and this is another important paper from nature medicine uh, which says that gaba the inhibitory neurotransmitter uh, can cause memory loss so alzheimer's disease and uh, this is a type of journal uh, which will take so you might require 5 years of research with a group of so many people to finally submit into this journal and this journal might take another 1 year of revision to finally get it accepted so it is so much of work done uh, to prove one theory and once it is published in nature medicine we can really trust this work and they would have done so many repetitive experiments to make it statistically significant so let's see as i explained urea cycle before the ammonia is taken up in the urea cycle to remove it through urine uh, detoxify the ammonia and this urea cycle also make putrescin the smelly molecule i was talking about and this putrescin uh, can make gaba okay the inhibitory neurotransmitter and this gaba can be responsible for is this is also a beneficial molecule but in uh, several cases when this is more it can cause alzheimer's disease and uh, that's what this paper is all about and another paper which says that uh, l casey sang uh can 
reduce, not cure, but reduce chronic kidney diseases by uh, uh, gut, reducing gut microbiota dysbiosis and reducing inflammation and uh, reducing the tight junction disruption in the uh, kidney. And here you see the medullary congestion and the ischemic uh, zones are reduced uh, with the supplementation of uh, probiotic uh, lactobacillus case A. And uh, this is a, a renal disease model. And compared to this, you can see that after uh, in the renal disease model, when you supplement with uh, probiotics, the uh, renal, uh, uh, it is recovering. Yeah, and uh, same, creatine has come to half normal compared to the uh, uh, chronic case of the disease model. And here also you can see that uh, the renal tubular damage. So this is the control healthy mice. This is the uh, renal uh, damage mice. And here you can see that after probiotic treatment, there is a recovery. Uh, of uh, tubular dilation and the tubular renal tubular damage score and necrosis is reducing. So tubular damage scores are uh, reducing with uh, probiotic treatment. Again, uh, another data shows uh, improvement in uh, the uh, cells and it's coming near to the uh, healthy controls. Uh, the fibrotic uh, changes which you are observing has reduced. And they uh, did a human clinical trial of this and they could find that in uh, probiotic treated renal patients, this is, they are improving. Uh, they are not curing completely, but they are improving. So uh, another publication is this, gut microbiota linked to autism. Uh, initially, they found that when you give antibiotics, the autistic kids show some improvement. So this led to the um, idea that bacteria in the gut might be responsible for autism. So this paper says that human gut microbiota from autism spectrum disorders promote behavioral symptoms in mice. So if you take uh, autism patients uh, bacteria and put it in the mice, they may show autism-like behaviors. Uh, so uh, they propose that the gut microbiota regulates behavior in mice via production of uh, neuroactive metabolites, suggesting that gut-brain connections contribute to pathophysiology. Uh, so can we use bacterial profiles of diagnostic markers for autism? So many studies are coming up for those and the supplements uh, used as a consortia uh, are working out in the clinical trials and here they have found out the signature uh, metabolites and bacteria specific to uh, autism compared to healthy individuals you can see several of the bacterial uh, communities are more in the autistic case um, and um, yeah, so this is what it uh, shows that lacnospire bacterioids and parabacterioids are differentially abundant in autism cases and uh, several metabolites are uh, now being detected to be changing. Uh, so several metabolism is different and there's a total metabolic rewiring happening in these autistic kids. Uh, for example, taurin uh, shows a difference uh, in uh, typical control versus autistic uh, disease uh, conditions. Uh, and uh, when you supplement them, uh, they show the improvement. So rationally designed group of bacteria uh, is now getting popular that they can decrease. Uh, uh, so here they use uh, seven to eight uh, consortia of bacteria uh, for treating one particular disease. Uh, and you can see that the inflammatory cytokines. So what are these inflammatory cytokines? 
they are peptides uh, secreted by the immune cells which can uh, destroy tissues but it's beneficial to uh, cure a disease uh, in covid you would see that the fluid accumulation in the lungs this was caused by hyperactivation of the immune system due to inflammatory cytokines so these inflammatory cytokines can be reduced uh, by probiotics so this combination of uh, bacterial uh, uh, groups like gut 108 which they call they can reduce the inflammatory markers and you can see that the gut which is inflamed the test uh, the villi has come back to a uh, normal uh, structure and there are a lot of other uh, works coming up telling that bile acid microbiota crostox so all these things i want you to uh, search in pubmed and google scholar and understand more of the updated informations i think uh, we could give some outline of what is the updated research going on and now you need to collect uh, these informations and uh, come into a research point of view to understand more in depth uh, of how uh, chronic diseases are formed so in this case uh, they have two pathways where bile acids and the gut microbiome uh, cause immunosuppression and that promotes tumors and uh, here they explain how a bacteria derived indol 3 lactic acid ameliorates colorectal tumorogenesis by uh, modulating immune system like this is a control uh, intestine which is not inflamed but uh, after inflammation in the disease case if you provide the probiotic this inflammation is reduced and this structure of the colon is getting back to normal and here you can see that the tumor numbers are reducing just by supplementation of some probiotics and the conformation is getting back to normal and the tumor size in the control is large but in the uh, probiotic treated case the tumor volume is less even though it cannot completely cure the progression is intactly reduced and this is what the bacteria does um, this bacteria plantarum uh, can uh, uh, secrete ila and this can modulate immune system to suppress tumor growth through uh, ifn gamma so lot more of that it can uh, reduce liver uh, hepato liver diseases and now i'll demonstrate a software where you can uh, check what could be the toxins or chemicals involved in each patient diseases okay so this is a database it's called ctdbase.org so you can go to this link and uh, you can click disease and then it will lead you to all the diseases like i will click cardiovascular disease here so this is the database uh, ctdbase.org and if i click cardiovascular diseases it will take you to different cardiovascular abnormalities and then you can click one of them like i took hypertension in here and what are the association of hypertension with the Uh, toxins and what are the genes involved all these details you can get so here bleomycin is associated with respiratory tract diseases and uh, hypertension so pulmonary fibrosis uh, and hypertension so asbestosis lipopolysaccharide from bacteria is involved in it and you have a collection of uh, genes which could be Uh, correlated with this disease or this toxins and now we have a, a revolution of uh, metabolomics so you can uh, detect all these uh, with uh, if this is enriched in these patients uh, for example lead uh, lead is uh, found if i click uh, thyroid uh, disease here 
I might see lead instead of bleomycin, and lead is associated with a uh, lot of thyroid diseases. And uh, it's not necessary that all thyroid patients have uh, lead intoxication, but some of them could have. And uh, these could be used for diagnostics to identify the fundamental cause of diseases. Otherwise, we don't have a method till date to remove the fundamental cause. We just need to wait for the human body to remove the toxins, which takes a huge lot of time. But if we identify what is the exact toxemia or the molecule responsible for the disease, we can have antidotes, we can have herbal combinations. And this database itself suggests a lot of herbs which can inhibit the uh, active uh, stages or confirmation area of these toxins. So we can even design drugs which can bind the active sites of these toxins and reduce the toxin, toxemia. I think I would stop here. Thank you so much. Hello? Yeah. Thank you, doctor, for concluding with the note yes. that if we identify the right toxin, we can easily target and uh, eliminate the toxemia which is causing, uh, which is developing the uh, disease. And the, uh, we have some more time, right? So maybe I'll just revise it so people can just refresh. Should I do that? Uh, a bit early. If, if the next speaker is ready, I can wind up now. Well, uh, our next presentation is at 11.50. We do have 20 minutes in case... So I, can, I can just uh, uh, revise the slides. So, yes. you know, it, it can... Uh, it's better to... And it will fill up some time. You could take right? maximum 10 minutes, then we have oh, yeah. three questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, which might need an in-detail uh, explanation. Okay, so should I take the questions now? Yes, maybe you could revise yeah. the presentation afterwards. Okay, fine, so, yeah. Yeah, Let's so we ahead. have three questions. The first yeah. question is, if we do a ketogenic diet, Yeah. Okay, to only have a glucose from gluconeogenesis and uh, solely depend on fuel from beta oxidation, that is mm. through oxidative phosphorylation. Mm. Uh, will that reduce the oxidative stress or the toxic metabolites in comparison to toxemia that is created by a normal metabolism? I, I don't it believe that. Uh, so yeah. uh, first of all, I need to search for the papers related to this. I haven't read now at present. I need to re I can read and check. But in my personal opinion, a long ketogenic diet uh, might cause more oxidative stress. I don't know. I need to check more. But uh, I don't think that's the uh, actual way human body want to live. It, it might, uh, human body would uh, prefer more uh, evolutionarily satisfying conditions like the natural diet, the original food, the fruits, uh, the vegetables, and the meat in the most natural unprocessed form and uh, no, in a very low calorie diet. And that would heal the uh, disease or reduce oxidative stress. And any, uh, uh, so yeah, I, I have seen papers that fruit fasting and can reduce oxidative stress, uh, but I don't know ketogenic diet can. In lo how, how long can we go on ketogenic diet? It, it might backfire sometime. And uh, there are reports that it can cause some problem for the brain, like mood swings and all, even though it can reduce the excitotoxicity. Yeah. But I will read and get back. You, uh, yeah, you collect the mail ID, I can respond later. So uh, the next question is, do probiotics promote wound healing? Ah, yeah, there are reports of that. Probiotics can promote wound healing. It can, uh, so wound healing has two steps. First, the inflammation, like especially in diabetic wounds, there is a paper in Theronostics, I guess, Journal Theronostics. So diabetic wounds, uh, so you have high glucose there and then high inflammation. Uh, healing is very difficult because healing takes place in two 
sections. One is the inflammation should go in its full stretch to remove the dead tissue. And once the dead tissue is removed, the inflammation should subside. Only when the inflammation subsides, the healing process starts. And as long as the inflammation doesn't subside, it cannot start. And there are a lot of data that uh, probiotics can reduce inflammation. Uh, and uh, yeah, I remember seeing two papers at least in a good journal that wound healing can be promoted by probiotics. Yeah. The next question is, uh, which probiotic reduces creatinine level? Yeah, uh, so uh, I showed one uh, probiotic here, lactobacillus caseosang, that uh, it can reduce creatinine. If I go to this, it, it was published in Cell Metabolism. Let me take that paper. So uh, now you can ask that GPT also, it also brings data. And uh, you can check in Google Scholar or just in Google, if you type this, you can get answer for that, like uh, wound healing and probiotic. You will get several papers on that. I want all the uh, students uh, joining this group. Uh, I, I want you to start using uh, PubMed and Google Scholar. And uh, uh, because you got the basics of this, what, what uh, research is all about how to understand the data. I want you to search and find out by yourself. So this is the paper published in Cell Metabolism, quite reputed journal. Uh, it's impact factor is nearly 40 and uh, uh, lactobacillus caseosang has reduced creatine as you can. Yeah, yeah, creatine. Creatine is reducing compared to the renal uh, damage uh, patient, not patients, mice you can see creatine is reduced. And they have also done a human trial of this and it is reducing, yeah. Right. The next question is on uh, poor digestion or uh, low motility. What yeah. is your advice to manage uh, low motility and does it have any relationship uh, you know, with the lymphatic congestion? Uh, okay, uh, again, I need to read to bring experimental evidence for that. I don't uh, prefer to talk hypothesis much, uh, but still uh, uh, there are uh, at least three papers. I wanted to show it today. Uh, maybe I will email you those papers. So these papers say how processed food are fermented by gut bacteria, produce some metabolites that reduce gut motility. Okay, and how a probiotic bacteria can secrete or replace this, secrete some beneficial metabolites that can promote gut motility. Uh, so this is there. And many of us don't understand why when we eat at home, we have good gut motility. And once we go out for one week, uh, and we are eating out every day from restaurants, especially in India. I don't face problems when we eat food in uh, Italy or Tokyo or, you know, uh, Thailand. The gut motility looks quite okay. I don't know. Whenever I eat uh, food in uh, Indian restaurants, there is a problem. And this is real. And uh, this is coming from the processed food itself. And if you take uh, as I said before, the food as natural as possible, it, uh, the, it's unprocessed form, this is not going to uh, stagnate. For example, okay, and a combination of, a small combination I can say, the banana pith, uh, banana pith, banana stem, if it is cut into really small piece and you make, uh, you can mix it in buttermilk, and if you consume it, and again, uh, uh, this uh, pumpkin and papaya, these three things itself is going to improve your gut motility significantly in just two days and provided you eat zero junk food. 
you don't eat anything fried no biscuits no bread uh, but of course bread is a good thing if you can prepare at home but the purchase things i am calling uh and if you can completely avoid eating out from restaurants however good restaurants it is then you may have a good gut motility and plus uh, if you give a traditional natural medicine uh, techniques like uh, wrapping a wet cloth in your tummy that can uh, promote gut motility and it also promotes uh, beneficial bacteria uh, during diseases yeah so the the next question is about the natural uh, manipulative therapies so does a uh, recurrent enema and colon hydrotherapy uh, cause loss of good microbiome or does it have any ill effects i i don't believe that the typical uh, the traditional enema done by natural medicine practices okay what they do is they have a pure water from a can going into your uh intestine and uh, there are two types they do they either they take like 200 ml or something or they take very little bit uh like uh, less than 25 ml and let it remain all night so it doesn't go out immediately so the next day it goes out so all these things do not remove your gut bacteria you hardly need uh few bacteria to um, uh, bring it back all what you lost and uh, uh, antibiotics can uh, change gut bacteria but not enema uh, always there will be bacteria remaining in your gut you don't have to worry about enema it doesn't cause any problem but the other ways of enemas which you do <laughs> the chemical type of enema more uh, <laughs> more strenuous way of enema i don't know or i don't recommend the simple water enema done uh, from the anus doesn't cause any issue of gut microbiota right. this is a frequently asked question uh, can indigestion be treated with probiotics if so how long can a patient have probiotic yeah uh, so i am not a clinician to answer that but uh, there are papers on that like uh, uh, colitis or indigestion they have done human trials uh, and i haven't read it so i don't have a immediate answer i uh, encourage you to go and read it so just type this tag words in google scholar or just google uh, or in pubmed you will get this uh, paper and start reading now uh, uh, you don't need to read the whole paper just watching the images like you can see this image you can understand this paper because uh, you always need to check two things what happens in a healthy animal how it looks what happens in a disease condition how it looks so healthy versus disease you have an idea all papers you can see this figure this kind of figures so disease it looks like this healthy it look like this and when you give probiotic did it did this disease condition return back you can see it is partially return back right so just by watching it if you go to read the whole journal you will fall asleep because very complicated language but only by watching the figures you can understand the story and uh, all the figures have a title below it and that will be the conclusion of that figure so if you read just if you just watch these figures and read the discussion and introduction alone you can get a good detail of all these stories i encourage all the uh, medical students and the natural medicine doctors uh, youngsters joining here to start reading research papers it will really improve you uh, uh, your knowledge on treatments yeah any more questions yeah there is a question if you could answer yeah. uh, the question is what is your take on gut bacteria migrating to blood in an individual gut bacteria migrating to blood when there is a, a leaky gut it could be a leaky gut yes 
yeah, leaky gut, when there is inflammation, it migrates and it happens and there is immune system there to take care of it. Okay, you don't have to worry. Our immune system is so strong uh, that taking care of uh, bacteria is nothing unless you suppress it with steroids. And uh, okay, so taking care of bacteria and virus in the natural gut is nothing for a, a immune system. It handles just like that. So I don't think it's matter of worry, but um, when you are taking, uh, you know, when you combine treatments, like you have some treatments which can cause uh, drug excess acidity or uh, it already removed all the happy bacteria, and there is a injury in the gut, then you are mixing up treatments by yourself, then you have a problem. But uh, human body can heal itself if you give some time, like four to five days of just juice fasting, fruit fasting, soup, vegetable fasting, raw salad fasting, Within five days, all the inflammation heals up, majority of them, if it is not a chronic one. And you can talk to uh, kids around you, how long you take to heal a fever or an inflammatory disease. They will say, even if they are taking antibiotics, it takes them five days to heal that fever. Even though the fever is suppressed, but it takes five days to get back to your school. And when you are fasting also, it takes you five days. So it takes you five days to heal the inflammation. If you can wait for five days on a fruit fasting diet, then inflammation will subside. And then you get back to a normal life slowly. Yes. Any more questions? Yes. So the question is related to fruit fasting. Maybe we will take, take that up later the uh, following sessions uh, so uh, quickly now for five to seven minutes if you would like to uh, re-present these slides the yeah, important yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and uh, i want all these students to down uh, download these are freely available papers uh, so i want you to download them and hear and uh, yeah. we do have a mixed blend of uh, practitioners as well as students so yeah. only the important slides if you could brush up yeah yeah so uh, Initially, I was talking about that. See, there are uh, three uh, three point five million metabolites. Okay, what are these metabolites? Uh, they are molecules which take part in metabolism. Intermediates. When the metabolism do not complete, the pathway doesn't complete. They accumulate in between. For example, the Krebs cycle in mitochondria. Uh, if the Krebs cycle is not happening properly. Uh, alpha 2-hydroxyglutarate uh, accumulate. So this could have become ATP and it could be harmless. But when the metabolic pathway is inhibited in between, some of the partially metabolized uh, chem, uh, molecules accumulate. Like 2-hydroxyglutarate is going to promote cancer. So a lot, lot of studies are coming out uh, how metabolites uh, promote uh, rewire uh, signaling pathways and promote chronic diseases. So initially I was talking about some toxic metabolites made from uh, prolonged fermentation of meat in the gut. So we have clicrisol, uh, putrezine, TMAO, all these are how it causes a disease. So all those pungent smelling things. We are evolutionarily uh, we can identify the bad things, you know, the, it's, it's smells bad. To smell bad means it is causing some problem for you. That's why it smell bad. So evolutionarily, we are prepared. Our brain is prepared to detect it. Our immune system is prepared to detect all these. So initially I said how these toxic metabolites stagnated from gut can cause different diseases like immune cells. They form a lot of lipid inside and this is uh, my hypothesis that maybe all these toxic metabolites are inside these they are hiding it in the hydrophobic core maybe and uh, then i 
said some basics about what is an oxidative stress, how an atom become unstable, and how it can be stabilized. Uh, then I also stressed upon the idea that you shouldn't run behind stopping inflammation or stopping, stopping oxidative stress. The fundamental cause of the disease is not oxidative stress or inflammation. That it is just a fire. The fundamental cause is the toxemia. So again, you know, these are hypotheses which is under debate. But now the dots are getting connected because of the revolution of uh, mass spectrometry in metabolomics. So last two years, you can see a lot of these uh, uh, controversial theories are connecting their dots and uh, they are coming up in reality. So I showed some experimental evidence uh, and what is the difference between, see, we always say that Western diet is causing the problem. Now I have a different opinion now. The Indian restaurant diet, they, they, they are more harmful. I don't believe that the bread or the burgers are harmful. This is more harmful than the burgers or pizzas. And Italians eat a lot of pizza. They live 110 years, but it's quite naturally prepared. So the, how you prepared is important. Then I also said, so I want you to hear it from YouTube. Don't You don't need to sit and read them. So many YouTube videos have basics of metabolism. Like Han Academy is quite simple and uh, familiar to all of you. Study basics of metabolism because this is important for when you treat a patient. You should know what is going inside your cell. I also explained what AMA is. We don't know what AMA is, but we studied in Ayurveda what AMA is. Uh, AMA is the fundamental cause of all disease, but for me, it may look like this. All those smelly uh, metabolites, uh, uh, which are accumulating or stagnated, fermented in the gut, which enter our body uh, through the veins, which connecting to the liver. That is one straight way that the metabolites can enter the liver and then to the blood and to the human body. So I also said intracellular pathways. So many of you need to study what intracellular pathways. There are a lot of signaling pathways. So this is a cell membrane. This is in the nucleus. This is cytoplasm. We have mitochondria. And this is a blood uh, vessel or extracellular space. So whatever the metabolites coming in from the fermented bacteria enters the bloodstream, it comes finally binds to the receptors in the uh, cell membrane. Many of them get endocytos, come inside the cell. And then it creates a havoc. Lot of these molecules are molecular mimicry because they are carbon chains. They have similar conformations to many of these useful metabolic pathway enzymes or they can bind to the metabolic pathway enzymes because they look similar to other metabolites. So it's going to cause inhibition of the normal pathway. When one step is inhibited, like here, alpha ketoglutarate step is inhibited then 2-hydroxyglutarate accumulate, this cause cancer, okay? So metabolic stagnation can become a fundamental cause of uh, disease development. Then I explain how urea cycle is important for memory loss. Like here, how urea accumulation causes secretion of those smelly metabolites. And uh, if you can find out which, which are these metabolites, you can use specific uh, probiotic bacteria to reduce them, but we cannot do it. It requires really good expertise uh, and a huge team uh, working on genomics, mass spectrometry, and uh, uh, clinicians and uh, uh, probiotic experts working together. Then we can make it happen into clinics. Uh, could you please display the slide with the software links? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this one. And then we will conclude the session. Hmm. Yeah, this would be quite exciting. Each patient you get, you can check what could be the toxins related to that disease. It's not necessary that patient will have that toxin, but there is a possibility. 
and you can test it and future natural medicine or whichever medicine the test should focus on this direction to identify the toxins fundamental cause of that as i was telling just last line as i was telling we all believe that mutation is the fundamental cause of cancer but if you take uh, pancreas cancer 48 percentage of the patients have exactly same mutation at the same amino acid how can it be possible that always keras get mutated at the 12th amino acid position how can it be so specific unless our human body want to increase the number of cells to store some toxins i don't know and this happens because of uh, enzymes regulating the nucleotide pools re required for you know maintaining the stability of dna uh, dna uh, materials basic materials so the enzymes get stick to these toxic metabolites so these enzymes become inactive or less active so the ratio of dntps change and this can cause mutation so mutation is not the fundamental cause of cancer anymore it is a toxemia okay so these kind of things you can find from this database yeah okay i think we are done thank you uh, team alpha natural research and development for the uh, in depth analysis and presenting the biochemical processes uh, metabolic pathways in relation with the uh, disease development and uh, we wish you all the best so you you will be providing our contacts so they can ask more questions like they can read research papers if they don't understand please feel free to approach us we will be responding actively we want all of you to read thoroughly and understand the molecular basis of all this thank yeah, you so much for your me. contact details on the chat box if you yes, yes, yes. yeah sure so uh, dr praveen praveen's group so they can mail them directly and we'll be responding sure okay. thank you thank you for thank the you presentation so much. uh yeah participants we have a lineup of uh, next few presentations uh, for your information uh next we have two case presentations by dr uh, febin and uh, dr jinu followed by a uh, talk by dr praveen jacob on the topic exploring the role of gut microbiome on digestive and autoimmune disorders and then we have uh, dr uh, devjot dhar who is going to talk on bug speaks he's uh, that is the south asia's first gut microbiome test Uh, features and its possibilities so now uh, we have dr febin who's going to uh, do a case presentation dr febin is a naturopathy and yoga physician based in kochi kerala and practicing uh, since 2018 dr febin holds a uh, uh, degree in bachelor of naturopathy and yogic sciences and is master of science in physiology and a fellowship in uh, nutritional and environmental medicine he is a certified ozone therapy practitioner and a health coach and currently pursuing functional and nutritional uh, medicine practitioner certificate certificate from the us so his uh, basic focus is on gut related issues and autoimmune disorders i request dr uh, febin to kindly do the presentation can i share the slides is it audible hello yes you are audible uh, you could share the slide so first of all i thank uh, the entire team of alpha naturals and uh, dr praveen uh, for giving me an opportunity Uh, to present the cases and uh, for uh, guiding me from my basic college days uh, through the entire uh, arena of uh, gut so the first case uh, it was a patient uh, she was a 63 year old uh, female uh, patient presented with a known history of migraines and ongoing complaints of nausea increased frequency of bowel movements and hair fall additionally she reported experiencing fecal urgency when 
consuming food from the outside uh, the symptoms always worsen notably upon uh, consumption of salty spicy and uh, fried uh, food items uh, basically her height was 162 cm weight was uh, 59.3 kg she always had a general weakness and fatigue there was a mild pallor and uh, in the cpc there was a mild decrease in the hemoglobin uh, and uh, on a, on further investigation uh, we were suspecting h pylori infections and her uh, h pylori igg antibodies were uh, very high it was beyond 150 uh, uh, with a basic reference range of uh, less than uh, 0.9 and uh, her uh, anti uh, thyroglobulin antibodies was also very high uh, and uh, uh, for as a treatment protocol basically uh, in the diet we have given uh, grains and lactose free diet along with uh, restricted salt intake and uh, she was advised to take uh, plenty of uh, vitamin c rich foods like guava papaya etc and we were given some uh, basic uh, health supplements uh, first one was salicylic it is basically a Table combination uh, prepared from Arthur Naturals uh, it helps to eradicate the uh, H. pylori, and uh, there was a probiotic called as Florasol uh, to improvise the uh, good bacteria in your in the gut. And uh, apple cider vinegar was uh, given uh, to maintain the low pH in the stomach uh, to help to aid the digestion. And uh, uh, she was also having a hypo uh, acidic condition in the. Uh, gut and uh, thyroid care formula is uh, given for uh, improving the thyroid health and uh, help to to help the thyroiditis and also an immune with tablet basically a vitamin tablet was also given and uh, after one month of uh, treatments her uh, h pylori igg antibodies became negative with a 0.33 and a reference range of point uh, less than 0.9 and uh, her anti thyroglobulin antibody also came down to 140.33 uh, uh, it is still uh, high but it came down drastically and she was also feeling uh, very well uh, and uh, my second case uh, she was a 21 year old female patient uh, with a medical uh, history of grade 1 gastroesophageal uh, uh, and uh, she always uh, had to go to the emergency uh, due to severe gastritis uh, and uh, continuous vomiting after uh, like uh, and uh, she was also having so uh, significant weight loss uh, she always had a past history of persistent vomiting uh, and uh, it is also always associated with her uh, menstrual periods it used to get uh, temporary relief uh, on uh, taking a medication but uh, it was always recurring additionally the patient was also having uh, experience of dysmenorrhea hair fall and anxiety and acne and uh, her height was uh, 151 cm on the first visit uh, the her weight was uh, 42.55 kg her bp bp was 100 per 70 uh, she was having uh, pallor and general weakness Uh, on uh, ultrasonography of the abdomen it was released that uh, revealed that there was uh, some small mesenteric nodes in the right lumbar region with poor central fat and uh, uh, presence of polycystic ovaries uh, blood tests were positive for h pylori igg and the uh, patient was uh, moderately anemic with low levels of serum iron uh, the treatment protocol was very similar to the previous case uh, she was given uh, the same uh, gra- grains and lactose free diet with the uh, salt intake and she was advised to take a uh, uh, vitamin c rich foods like guava papaya etc and uh, she was also given uh, hal acid uh, to eradicate the h pylori bacteria and uh, probiotic was given to improve the uh, gut uh, bacteria and uh, apple cider vinegar was uh, given and uh, she was also given a, a, a specific combination of uh, herbal uh, supplements called as uh, female hormone balance to uh, help her with the uh, uh, relax of uh, vomiting and issues during her periods and she was also given iron supplementation and she was also uh, advised to make a aloe vera jaggery probiotic uh, at her home and uh, this is how it's done so i'll i will be sharing this later and uh, during second visit uh, after one month the patient showed uh, improvement in their condition and the vomiting had significantly reduced uh, weight was increased to 46 kg uh, the dosage of hal acid was adjusted to once a day and probiotics were uh, reduced to twice a day 
and on the third visit the patient's weight had reached 48.9 kilograms and all the symptoms are fully resolved uh, the patient was uh, recommended to continue the diet devoid of uh, grains and lactose for a period of uh, two more months thank you thank you Thank you, Dr. Fabian. Do we have any questions? We now move on to the next presenter. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Jinu Anthony to be uh, ready with her presentation. So, Dr. Jinu is a Bachelor of Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences and ha has a Master's in Clinical Nutrition and Dietetics, presently working as a chief medical officer in uh, KINNS Ayur Center, uh, Kaginali Haveri. Uh, her main focus is on educating, guiding, and addressing the root cause of various gut related disorders and metabolic uh, syndromes. Dr. Jinu, over to you. Dr. Jinu, you may start with your presentation. So is my uh, presentation is visible? No, your screen is not visible. You're audible. Let me The team of Dr. Praveen, can you help me be uh, sharing my case presentation? Dr. Jinu, wait one second. I'll share the presentation. Okay, okay. Dr. Fabian, are you online? Yes. Yeah, uh, there's a question for you for the previous case. Okay. So the case that you presented, is this patient suffering from IBS or IBD? Uh, the patient had a mild IBS, uh, but mainly issue was uh, the gastritis and uh, uh, acidity issues. Okay. So am I audible, no, ma'am? Yes, you are. You can okay. start from the beginning. Okay. Thank you for the time, all. So thank you for the introduction, ma'am. Good afternoon, all. So once again, myself, uh, Dr. Gino Anthony. So at present, I'm working in uh, Karnataka. So I have started with my career with uh, Dr. Praveen. So under his guidance, I have uh, treated many uh, so many gut-related disorders, autoimmune disorders, and metabolic disorders. So with wholehearted gratitude and with his blessing, I am presenting one of my uh, successful case in uh, Crohn's disease. So, so the presentation, the case presentation, the next slide. Is uh, okay. So, a 20 year old girl, 
named Smita. She stays in Hubli, Karnataka. She presented to us in the month of October. She was a non case of Crohn's disease, and uh, her major complaints was her major complaints was uh, mucus in the stools, increased frequency of motion, and uh, sometimes bleeding in the motion, and uh, the weight loss of uh, five kg in six months. And already all these symptoms she is having from the past one year, she is already under her uh, allopathic medications. Still, she was not finding any uh, relief in her oral medi with oral medications. So under the uh, clinical examinations, we found that the next slide, please. So in the clinical examination, we found she was having generalized weakness was there and she was mildly anemic. And according to her height, she was underweight also. And so we have undergone her, uh, she had brought her CT. In fact, I have uh, uh, documented that. So that in that CT, it was clearly uh, diagnosed it as Crohn's disease. So in order to differentiate from ulcerative colitis, she was having mild bleeding also, I have told you. No? So we have done the fecal calprotectin and it, it came in the normal range. So we have started the Crohn's disease. So this was the oral medications, whatever she was taking. She was under steroids as well as the anti-inflammatory drugs. And she was under uh, oral mesocol also, not only powder, she was taking the tablet mesocol also. So the next slide. The day when she got admitted in our hospital, we started with the grain-free diet. So uh, the importance of a grain-free diet in the next sessions, Dr. Praveen will be explaining to you. So from the day one, we have stopped all the grains like uh, wheat or rice, jowar, millets, all kinds of grains we have stopped. And we have introduced the probiotic, SBO, it's a soil-based probiotic, two times in a day. The uh, importance of the probiotic in the previous sessions, I hope you all got to know. And in the small dosage I have started, I have not started the inulin in this much quantity at first because we need to see whether her body is will be able to uh, digest the prebiotics, whatever we are given. So I have started only uh, the prebiotic called inulin in a small dosage. One spoon only I have started in the initial stage. So the day two and day three, we will be noticing how her motion will be, whether she will be able to digest the prebiotic. Since she was able to digest the inulin prebiotic, what we have given, I have increased the dosage of the inulin prebiotic to two spoons, three times. Along with this, we were giving the digestive enzyme to her digestion was weak. And uh, collagen, it uh, helps in the formation of the connective tissue. That, that also he'll be explaining to you. And his uh, Dr. Praveen Jacobs Kashaya, IBD Kashaya. So along with all these protocols, I have uh, told her to uh, continue with her oral medications also. So by I think by fifth or sixth day, I have told to taper her the steroids and we will see how the uh, motions and how she is uh, reacting on that. So when immediately after uh, dosage, uh, tapering the dosage to half, uh, she found little uh, difficult. Her motion have increased. Uh, means that uh, two, three, three, four days, she was having normal uh, motion only. And so reduced, the frequency have reduced. But the day when I tapered, that day it have increased. And the very next day it have came to the normal one or two times, I guess, not more than three times. And the mucus have stopped. Within eighth day, the mucus have stopped. And after 10th, 10th day, patient will get discharged. And as per our advice, uh, she have she was continuing the grain-free diet with all the pre and probiotics. And I was giving her the continuous follow-up also. So after I think by 14th, 15th day, within after some 11, 12 days, I have stopped her steroids and have told her to take only the tablet oral mesocol. That's uh, that was the only anti-inflammatory drug what she was taking. By after one month. I have uh, within a half day, uh, one month, I have uh, tapered the dosage of that also. And after one month, I think I have uh, told her to stop the uh, mesocol tablets also because her motion was not formed in the 10 days also. Motion was not formed. By the end of uh, one month, after one or one and a half months, her motion became formed in the same diet, in the same grain free diet. She was having very uh, semi solid motion from the loose motion. It, came to semi-solid, then still it was having semi-solid only one month. After one and a half months, it uh, came to the uh, normal motion, formed motion in the same grain free diet and she was continuing the 
probiotics. I think I have continued the SBO for three months, IBD Kashaya also for three months and prebiotic I have told her to extend for six to seven months. Prebiotics she was taking. I think I have given her inulin, uh, gum arabic, aloe vera prebiotic and collagen. When, uh, once her motion came to form, formed and after stopping all the medications, I have told her only to continue the prefiber prebiotic. And this was the previous scan report. As you can see, it is mentioned that she was uh, diagnosed with the Crohn's disease. And after some, uh, then she went back to her studies. Then after that, I have told her to repeat once again the scan. Then afterwards, she have done her scan and she have uh, sent to me that her uh, large intestine and small intestine was perfectly all right. And even her symptoms, ESR had came down. ESR was... Hi, I didn't mention that ESR was high, ESR CRP, but the, all the inflammatory parameters I was following up in every one month. And uh, this reports she have shown to her uh, family doctor who was uh, giving uh, the gastroenterologist who was treating her, the one who told that you need to be in an oral mesocol for lifelong. So, so he, she showed her these reports, uh, new reports to him. And even he was also shocked to see these reports without mesocol and without any oral uh, um, steroids, how she got to normal condition with all the normal uh, inflammatory parameters. Even in fact, he was also shocked to the extent that till today I am treating his patients too. So that is the uh, magic of Dr. Praveen and Dr. Praveen's vast knowledge. So if you are a doctor, you are interested in clinical practice who wanted to give a very good result to your patients who are trusting and coming. You can uh, blindly follow Dr. Praveen. He has a vast knowledge and he's at all time ready to spread his knowledge also. And uh, I guess he will be explaining to you the importance of all the, whatever the protocols, whatever I have given. So he'll be explaining to you in the next sessions. Thank you all for listening. Talk, thank you, Dr. Praveen and the team for giving me this platform. Thank you, Jean, Dr. Gino, for presenting your success story and uh, endorsing Dr. Praveen and his uh, clinical protocols to uh, heal uh, most challenging incurable gut conditions. Uh, participants, you know that gastro gut experts are the organizers and uh, you can follow them. They're specialized in uh, gut related issues and gut health and they follow uh, a natural triple therapy uh, you know, formulated by Dr. Uh, Praveen Jacob which is uh, proving to give a very miraculous cure for uh, extensive gut diseases, uh, which is based on probiotics, prebiotics, uh, herbs, and uh, other methods. Uh, so now, uh, Dr. Gino has already given a brief intro to the man himself. Uh, we now have presentation by Dr. Praveen Jacob. Uh, Dr. Praveen Jacob is uh, very well known among the students as well as uh, the medical practitioner for his uh, vast knowledge and his uh, enthusiasm to teach in to share knowledge. And uh, right now it's, it's an honor to all of us to listen to him for the next uh, 60 minutes. He is a CEO of Alpha Naturals. He is a prof adjunct professor at uh, Nite University and uh, uh, he is a man of many accolades and a very simple down to earth person who is leading a huge team behind many other teams uh, which are extensively working on uh, uh, nutribiotics and uh, right now we have with us dr praveen jacob who is going to uh, speak on exploring the role of gut microbiome on digestive and autoimmune disorders uh, welcome, Dr. Praveen Jacob, and uh, over to you for the next 60 minutes. Uh, could you please unmute your mic? You're not audible. Could you connect again? It's not audible. I'm 
as we wait for dr praveen jacob to connect let me uh, give a To brief you on uh, expertise of uh, Dr. Praveen Jacob, he works ex extensively uh, in the field of importance of gut bacteria on human health, evolutionary nutrition, uh, dietary lipid and its uh, role in human health, autophagy, herbs and its uh, biochemical pathway of action in various diseases. Uh, he also has expertise in how to target gut bacteria in treating various diseases. Is a neurochemical perspective of managing obesity. He speaks extens extensively on coronary vascular disease and its prevention. And finally, the autoimmune disorders management by manipulating the gut bacteria. So if you are an enthusiast uh, of uh, gut health and would like to know a uh, lot protocols based on evidence, uh, contact Dr. Praveen Jacob via WhatsApp. He has provided his uh, uh, number on a WhatsApp group that has been provided, you can directly talk to him. Also, uh, to uh, once again update you, the Gastro Gut Experts team uh, in association with Alpha Naturals by uh, led by Dr. Praveen Jacob is introducing franchisee of gut clinics. So if you are a practitioner and would like to set up a gut clinic, with the protocols provided by the gut uh, health experts. And also they would be helping you with the establishment and the standard functioning uh, of the clinic. And also they are launching a fellowship program on uh, gut health and autoimmune disorders soon. So stay tuned for uh, updates on these programs. Also follow up uh, with gut health uh, gastro gut experts for their upcoming CME programs. So uh, next, after Dr. Praveen Jacobs' uh, presentation, we will have in the afternoon, we will have Professor Vimal Karani, uh, who is a professor in nutrogenomics and nutrigenetics. He is a deputy director of IFNH, University of Reading, UK. Uh, we'll be addressing on from nutrigenetics to gut microbiome towards precision medicine, followed by uh, a talk by Dr. Chandan. Dr. Chandan will speak on revealing the connection between gut microbiome and uh, skin disorders. Uh, we have Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gut microbiome towards precision medicine, followed Hello. by uh, a talk by Dr. Chandan. Dr. Chandan will speak on revealing the connection between. Yes, doctor, your screen is visible. Could you just check your audio, please? Hello. Yes, your audible. Am I, am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. You could please carry on with the presentation. Where is your sound available, Dr. Chandan? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, you're audible. So you can continue with the question. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I extend my heartfelt appreciation to all the knowledge seekers who have joined us for our second international conference. So I am operating a 200 bedded hospital in rural side of Karnataka. We cater approximately three, 300 outpatient and inpatient every day. So there is some disturbance, sorry. Doctor, you're online from your other uh, account. 
the first first account which you were uh, trying to sign in maybe you could sign out from that yeah so we sorry so we cater approximately 300 outpatient and inpatient cases every day so during the early days of my career maybe about uh, one decade ago i started my career by treating metabolic syndrome and i used to promote a concept low carb high fat diet to handle metabolic syndrome such as diabetes obesity and pcod because you might be knowing that india has highest prevalence of uh, metabolic syndrome patient today mm -hmm. but a breakthrough but i was i was like i could handle very effectively metabolic syndrome by reducing carbs and adding fat but i never known how to treat autoimmune disorders because we are located in a rural site we often get gastritis cases ibs cases autoimmune psoriasis but i don't did not have any clue how to handle these cases but a breakthrough occurred in 2017 when an eminent scientist presented with the complaint of gas bloating depression pigmentation and severe constipation even he lost his job and his life his life had taken a drastic turn for the worse even job job loss and divorce as well and all the scientists i was really intrigued what happens to him this complaint all this complaint he developed uh, when he tried the yeast supplement suggested by friends for a month just he took a yeast supplement just for a month and within a month after taking yeast supplement he presented with all the symptoms pigmentation ibs constipation lost job lost wife i became intrigued by this uh, you know this case i started asking question what what is the connection between this yeast supplement and pigmentation all all of the his ailments is suffered then i that's some my first cases related to gut issues i went to many studies and i found that yeast overgrowth can damage gut microbes today i know that what he was suffering is like small intestinal fungal overgrowth that was my first case ever since then i started studying lot about uh, uh, you know the relation between gut microbes and different type of uh, ailments and my clinical practice dramatically improved when i targeting treatment protocol tar like uh, targeting gut dysbiosis and the gut dysbiosis and also i realized that gut dysbiosis is not merely like presence of harmful bacteria even abundance of good microbes can leads to gut dysbiosis or maybe in some circumstances lack of good microbes in a general rule 80 20 a good health comprised of 80 percentage of good microbes and 20 percentage of harmful microbes when there is a you know disruption of this balance that can leads to autoimmunity and digestive disorders today my topic allotted to me is digestive disorders the connection between digestive disorders and gut dysbiosis let me start with my presentation Send the person here. Yeah. So gut is. the gut dis gut dysbiosis is related to autoimmune disorders digestive disorder allergy disease and mental disorders and the most of the presentation is from my clinical practice because as i told you initially we do cater approximately 200 patient every day so the protocol we have developed by you know we have a group of doctors uh, working along with me we have developed by exposing to hundreds of our patient so autoimmune disorders for instance not all autoimmune disorders are related to gut from my practical experience we found that 50 to 60 percentage of autoimmune disorders are gut mediated digestive disorders there are two types of digestive disorder predominantly autoimmune digestive disorders like crohn's disease ulcerative colitis ileitis 
and functional digestive disorder like blood, gas, gastritis, IBS, diarrhea. So the fundamental cause, the root cause of the digestive disorders are in some circumstances like uh, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or it might be small intestinal fungal overgrowth. It might be small intestinal parasite overgrowth. There are multiple factors contributing to digestive disorder. So I would like to explore the mechanism of uh, digestive disorder. Yeah, the digestive dysfunctions are strongly related to two root causes. The first is hypoacidity or hyperacidity. And second, the peristalsis movement. Hyperperistalsis movement or hypoperistalsis movement. Yeah, so the root cause like hypoacidity and hyperacidity and peristalsis. When the peristalsis movement is hyper, food cannot stay for longer time. It passes quickly, leads to diarrhea. When the peristaltic movements are impaired, food stays for longer time, that leads to constipation. And for instance, the stomach acids plays a very crucial role. Ayurveda says that the most of the disorders are related to mandatni, lack of digestive fires. Ayurveda proclaimed about 4,000 years ago that a condition called as mandatni, lack of digestive fire. So it's, it's known today that when the stomach acid is very low or when pH is very high, food cannot digest adequately. That can lead to putrefaction of, uh, you know, the fermentation of the foods and it can create numerous type of toxins. For instance, hypoacidity and hyperacidity, both are mediated by a bacteria called as H. pylori bacteria. And the serotonin, peristalsis movement, hyperperistalsis movement, which is the root cause of irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea. And, you know, the hyperperistaltic movement is result of excess of serotonin. Because serotonin is the major brain hormone, which has two missions, two tasks. The primary mission of serotonin to induct peristalsis movement. After initiating the peristalsis movement, serotonin is taken to brain where it serves as the brain hormone. So in SIBOS, uh, like in uh, IBS, the serotonin is not transported to brain. There is the excess of serotonin accumulating in the intestinal tract that leads to hyperperistalsis movement and result in a manifest as diarrhea. So instance, in constipation, the serotonin production is impaired. And when you don't have adequate amount of serotonin, that reduces the peristaltic movement and leads to constipation. So the, for instance, the, the serotonin production is strongly regulated by gut bacteria, a condition called a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that prevent the reuptake of serotonin to the brain and which ultimately eventually result in accumulation of serotonin and manifest as irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea dominated IBS. And one more bacteria like SIBO bacteria increase serotonin. Whereas another one, you know, one another type of bacteria called as methanogenic bacteria or intestinal methanogenic bacteria, which can reduce the serotonin production. So the peristaltic movement is reduced and manifest as constipation. And in stomach, hypoacidity and hyperacidity, both are related to dysbiosis of like abundance of H. pylori bacteria. So you can say the most of the digestive disorders from my experience, as high as 90% of digestive disorders are result of these two dysbiosis, like H. pylori, SIBO, and intestinal methanogenic overgrowth. So let me explain the mechanism. The important aspect of H. pylori bacteria, which can create hyperacidity as well as hypoacidity. Let me tell you how it is. A, a same bacteria can, you know, uh, contribute to two like, contrasting symptoms like hyperacidity and hypoacidity. So let me explain 
the H. pylori infection and the mechanism of hyper and hyperacidity, hypoacidity. The stomach is comprised of two portions, predominantly corpus region, which consists of body and fundus, and andral region. The G cells, G cells which produce secrete gastrin hormones, are located on andral region of the stomach, whereas the acid is secreted from the upper portion, from the corpus region. The parietal cells which secrete hydrochloric acid located on the upper side of the stomach, and additionally, somatostatin, which is the hormone, reduce the hydrochloric acid secreted from corpus region. Okay, so somatostatin inhibit HCL production, whereas gastrin hormone enhance, facilitate HCL production, hydrochloric acid production. So when H. pylori infect the lower portion, andral region of the stomach, which leads to G cell inflammation and result in excess secretion of the gastrin hormone and hyperacidity. The gastrin hormones, which in turn can bind to the parietal cells and facilitate in HCL secretion. Whereas when H. pylori infect the corpus region, the upper portion of the stomach, which will cause, induce the inflammation of D cells, excess somatostatin is secreted and somatostatin inhibit HCL production, leads to hypoacidity. So this is the mechanism of hyper and hypoacidity. If H. pylori bacteria infect lower portion of the stomach, that is the andral gastritis, leads to excess secretion of gastrin hormones and leads to hyperacidity. Whereas if the H. pylori infect the corpus region, corpus gastritis, excess secretion of somatostatin and hydrochloric, the acid production is inhibit, leads to hypoacidity. So the helicobacter pylori, so implicated in stomach ulcer, duodenal ulcer, maybe 90 percentage of adenocarcinoma of the stomachs are mediated by H. pylori bacteria, gastric atrophy, reflex esophagitis, duodenitis, even migraine are strongly related to H. pylori infections. And in India, I feel it's around 60 to 70 percentage of Indian population suffer from H. pylori infection. H. pylori and hypoacidity. H. pylori affects the fundus region. Somato somatostatin gets induced. Parietal cells are damaged. HCL production is inhibited and leads to hypoacidity. And hyperacidity, if H. pylori infect andral region, which leads to G cells get inflamed, yeah. gastrin gets induced, HCL production is increased and leads to hyperacidity. So there are the four steps by H. pylori invade the stomach cavity. The first is the most important step. It's worthy to mention that H. pylori is the bacteria, though it survives in the stomach cavity, it loves to survive in a pH between 5 to 7. So H. pylori all, all, can thrive only in alkaline pH. So the first step of H. pylori bacteria is to manipulate stomach acid by secreting a hormone, uh, sorry, secreting an enzyme called as ureas. 20 percentage of total protein synthesized by H. pylori is ureas enzyme. The ureas enzyme convert stomach urea into ammonia. So the H, you know, result in alkaline pH. So keep bear in the mind, H. pylori can multiply and invade in a pH ranging five to six. The second step is, H. pylori uses its flagella to penetrate the mucous membrane and finally attaching to epithelial cells and secreting numerous type of toxins. Even I don't want to go, you know, like uh, mention elaborately about H. pylori. Uh, I would like to go come to the protocol quickly. Yeah, so one of the major dietary protocol to control H. pylori infection, I use nickel-free diet. So what is the significance of nickel-free diet in eradication of H. pylori bacteria? So this figure represents H. pylori. It has got two member, outer membrane and inner membrane. When there is excess acid in the host stomach, when the pH is very low, which activate 
one enzyme called as urease. The urease enzyme can convert urea into bicarbonate and ammonia. Both are strong alkaline agent. So bear in the mind, the urease enzyme, which is usually in inactive stage, get activated when the nickel, a metal nickel is inserted to the urease enzyme comprised of two fractions, ural B and ural A, which is a subtraction of urease enzyme, ural B and ural A, which get activated when the nickel is inserted. So that implies that the nickel-free diet are highly beneficial to eradicate H. pylori because the urea enzyme activated only after insertion of the nickel, the metal called as nickel. So I use nickel-free diet. Nickel is very rich in whole grains like uh, uh, whole grains, uh, red rice, whole wheat, like millets, nuts, pulses are rich in nickel. So I use white rice. Yogurt, like you can just check it. Nickel free diets are very highly beneficial. Next is H. pylori. There are different strains of H. pylori, a CAC strains of H. pylori, vacuolating strains of H. pylori. For instance, the CAC strains of H. pylori strongly related to adenocarcinoma of stomach and vacuolating strains of H. pylori infection that can lead to gastric atrophy so the hypoacidity and protein synthesis the h pylori infection as i told you result in hypoacidity which has very very uh, significant role like the stomach acid plays a major role in protein digestions so two major purpose missions of stomach acid the first one is to the first one is to digest protein. Second, to filter microbes, which is the two missions of stomach acids. So compare, there are three types of animals, herbivorous, carnivorous, and omnivorous. The herbivorous stomach is highly alkaline in nature. For instance, the pH is between 4 to 5. The omnivorous, the stomach pH is between 3 to 4. The carnivorous, they have a stomach pH of 2. The scavenger stomach pH is 1.5. So which clearly indicates that the main purpose of stomach acid is to break down protein. The, carniv the herbivorous. But for fat digestion and to break down carbs, stomach acid does not have much role. That's why the herbivorous stomach is highly alkaline and carnivorous stomach is highly acidic in nature. So even the human stomach, I, I'm really astonished to see that human stomach, the pH of human stomach is close to two. That in place because we have unique structure, unique characteristics compared with other mammals. There are about 6,500 mammalian species found in the planet today. Of 6,500 mammalian species, we have unique features like larger brain. Another, the longevity of human species. Human is the second longest living mammal in the planet. Our lifespan is 80 years. Compared with the closest relative of human, the chimpanzee, monkeys, and primates, lifespan is limited to 20 years. So we have four times longer lifespan. That's what is very crucial to choose right food for human being. Like we cannot eat like monkeys or we cannot eat like other rest of the mammals because of the inhuman being, for instance, the 45 percentage of total energy budget allotted to brain. But in rest of the mammalian species, 60 percentage of energy is allotted to muscles because their major strategy is movement. So muscle, the muscle required more energy. Our major strategy of survival is our brain. So our brain required more energy, like 45 percentage of total energy are stolen by human brain, which account merely 1.5 percentage of total body weight. That's what the protein and fat is very crucial in, in human diet. That's what our stomach became more acidic to nourish our brain very rapidly. That's what whenever we manipulate our stomach acids, 
the protein cannot digest that is a major side effect of hypoacidity because the pepsinogen inactivate pepsinogen converting to pepsin in the ph below 4 whenever our stomach is alkaline the pepsin cannot be synthesized the pepsinogen cannot convert into pepsin which result in impaired protein digestion small peptides are generated the peptides undigested protein is very dangerous because it can induce autoimmunity and toxicity in human body so that's what always should be, be I, <clears throat> the my first question when a patient comes to my clinical uh, clinic uh, presenting with a stomach upsets can you digest protein adequately i ask them how do you feel with a paneer how do you feel with the x a simple question i will ask them if they say that i will discomfort i get bloating and gas whenever i take paneer or protein that you know that's my diagnosis so i conclude that it is hypo acidity so stomach acid plays a very crucial di role in digestion of proteins nickel free diet enhances the helicobacter pylori eradication trait so i use it now you know it's not fact that the currently the major h pylori treatment is called as triple therapy which consists of two antibiotic one antacids and about two decades ago the h pylori eradication with the triple therapy was very successful but today because of antibiotic resistance the eradicate the success rate reduced to merely 30 to 40 percentage so antibiotic the h pylori bacteria is increasingly developing antibiotic resistance therefore we have developed a natural triple therapy with a success rate close to 90 to 95 percentage which consists of the major component is nickel free diet nickel free diet second i use probiotics third i use couple of herbs to eradicate h pylori bacteria and we are getting remarkable improvement for our patient just in two or three weeks of period and it's very cost effective as well and i feel it's around, the cost of this treatment protocol will be around 2000 to 3000 rupees so i use herbs like uh, one of the major herb i use is pomegranate peel the pomegranate rind extract is highly beneficial to minimize h pylori multiplication for instance the studies h pylori the movement was 15 mm 20 mm which was restricted to 15 mm when five percentage of pomegranate rind was added when 20 percentage of pomegranate rind was added the movement of h pylori minimized to just one mm next inhibition of flagellin gene expression responsible for the movement of h pylori exposition of pomegranate peel extract next is black cumin black cumin with the honey thrice daily lyco rice lyco rice about 20 25 gram of lyco rice boil in a cup of water and i recommend twice daily after the food and even i use uh, some of the probiotic the one of the probiotic which i have developed uh, uh, is called as florasol and additionally so this is a triple therapy herbs nickel free diet and probiotic so i even i recommend a homemade probiotic in my hometown kerala i hail from kerala we use fermented ganji the rice cooked over you know the cooked rice kept overnight with a cup of water and morning it serves as the major breakfast recipe for one like fermented rice kanji with the uh, one more is my favorite is aloe vera jaggery probiotic all you required is half liter of aloe vera gel 500 gram of jaggery and three spoon of maybe five percentage of apple cider vinegar so for instance if you have one liter of aloe vera jaggery blend at five percentage five percent like 50 ml of vinegar ferment for about one week five to seven days and i recommend my patient one tablespoon or two tablespoon thrice daily after the food so two types of probiotic i use one the, the supplement probiotic in the supplement form probiotic in the natural form 
nickel free diet and herbs for eradicating h pylori which can and if i found the patient suffer from hypoacidity i ask simple questions to rule out hyperacidity from hyperacidity i ask the patient can you stay whole day with without food some patients say no i cannot skip a meal that irritate me i get giddiness i get nausea if i skip a single meal that most likely hyperacidity patient says to me fasting i can do fasting without any discomfort whole day i can stay without food maybe i ask them what about protein like i protein protein cause disturbance or paneer x then i conclude that hypoacidity then ask them to take one table one teaspoon of vinegar apple cider vinegar in a cup of water before food and ask a simple question how do you feel now patient says feeling much better hypoacidity otherwise hyperacidity for hyperacidity triple therapy hypoacidity precisely like same treatment like triple therapy probiotic nickel free diet but additionally one teaspoon of vinegar before food and even there are couple of ayurvedic herbs known to increase stomach acid one is plumbago sailanica chitraka second is pepper ginger tipli these are the herbs increase the stomach acid even i recommend these herbs as well so this is a protocol to handle hypoacidity and hyperacidity both are mediated by say and even i recommend to avoid these foods like raw vegetables citrus fruit wheat items nuts beans potato whole grains this all restricted only for 10 days so this is a protocol for hyper and hyperacidity so most of the stomach upsets 70 to 80 percentage of the stomach upsets are mediated by h pylori bacteria including hypoacidity and hyperacidity maybe 10 to 15 percentage of gastritis are related to non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs 5 to 10 percentage alcohol abuse and junk food consumption but majority of the chronic gastritis always are related to h pylori infection now i am moving to the dysbiosis called as so as just as i mentioned the stomach upsets are related to h pylori next i am moving to intestinal dysbiosis the mainly there are four types of intestinal dysbiosis one is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth two types of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth uh hydrogen sibo and hydrogen sulfate sibo small intestinal fungal overgrowth small intestinal parasite overgrowth which are strongly related to diarrhea dominated ibs gas and bloating and uh, so let me explain the mechanism of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and how it can mediate or you know contribute to diarrhea dominated ibs yeah small intestinal bacterial overgrowth strongly related to depression anxiety and diarrhea dominated ibs small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in irritable bowel syndrome so what do you mean by small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as we know that human body comprises of two types of cells about 35 trillion human cells and 40 trillion of bacteria cells and most of this bacteria are found in large intestine small intestine small intestine harbor merely small tiny amount of bacteria even stomach has very little quantity of bacteria most of the microbes are large intestine in some circumstances the microbes from the large intestine can move to upward directions and they can settle down in intestinal tract leads to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and what is the mechanism of sibo how the sibo 
can lead to irritable bowel syndrome or hyperperistaltic movement, which is the classical feature of small intestinal bacterium overgrowth. Strong, the SIBO can like, you know, leads to irregularities in serotonin productions. Maybe uh, the role of serotonin in the pathophysiology of irritable bowel syndromes. So the, as I told you, 90% of serotonin are synthesized in the intestinal tract, in the gut tract, and taken to brain by proteins. The carrier protein takes the serotonin to brain. SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, suppress the production of serotonin carrier proteins. So in, inadequate carrier protein, the production of carrier protein, protein leads to accumulation of serotonin in intestinal tract. So the peristaltic movement is increased. So the main mission of serotonin can act as a neurotransmitter by binding the smooth muscles of gut tract and inducting peristalsis. When the serotonin is not transported, carried to brain, too much of serotonin is accumulated in the intestinal tract, hyperperistaltic movement and symptoms of depression because serotonin is not delivered to brain adequately. So depression, anxiety coupled with the watery diarrhea. So this is a mechanism of SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and you know, like uh, diarrhea dominated IBS. So IBS of late, I start calling IBS as irritated bacteria syndrome. It is no longer irritable bubble syndrome. It is an irritated bacteria syndrome. The root cause is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. One of the, another factor, the proton pump inhibitor, antibiotic abuse, or, you know, excess sugar, which is the root cause of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. SIBO can manifest as joint pain, malnutrition, diarrhea. The main symptom is diarrhea coupled with the depression. Acne, rosea, fatigue, bloating, nausea. Fibromyalgia, gut microbe and its biomarkers. Radication. So one more question. So there are different types of uh, IBS symptoms. Okay, maybe fungus mediated IBS. Hypoacidity, another import, the, you know, uh, hypoacidity can even manifest as IBS. It's like a sticky type of stools. The stool passes like a sticky type of stools. If the stool is like water, it is SIBO radiated. So to rule out the IBS from hypoacidity mediated or SIBO mediated, fungal or parasite mediated, just a simple question is helpful. Ask my patient, how do you feel with the rifagat? which is an antibiotic, some patient says that after antibiotic, my symptoms improved. Then I conclude that it is SIBO-mediated IBS. If it is hypoacidity mediated or fungus-mediated, there will not be any reduction of symptoms, improvement of the symptoms, even after antibiotic therapies. And one more important aspect, watery diarrhea with the depressions are related to SIBO. Hypoacidity mediated IBS or fungal-mediated IBS they just manifest as a sticky type of stools, like, you know, amoebic dysentery. It looks like amoebic dysentery, not like watery diarrhea. So even there are around 18 factors, 18 factors can contribute to diarrhea. Most important is SIBO. So 60% of diarrhea dominated IBS can be related to SIBO. There are other factors as well. There are 18 types of diarrhea. So I would like to give the glimpse about different types of diarrhea as well. Like <clears throat> the major factor, the first, when a patient comes, I rule out hypoacidity because I have seen like around 10% of IBS are related to hypoacidity. Ask them to take apple syrup vinegar. If they feel improvement, their symptoms, it is hyper, very easy to treat. If after ruling out hypoacidity, then I move to SIBO mediated. I just provide them uh, the protocol related to SIBO. Then SIBO, SIBO, and causes of diarrhea. The number one is hypoacidity. Just can rule out by apple cider vinegar test. Maybe very like 10 to 15 percentage are related to hypoacidity. See 50 to 60 percentage of IBS related to SIBO. Two types of SIBO. SIBO hydrogen symptoms, watery diarrhea, 
depression and anxiety and sibo sulfate very rare fibromyalgia body sensitivity and mild type of diarrhea next is fourth one is small intestinal fungal overgrowth very rare maybe 5 percentage of total ibs are related to small intestinal fungal overgrowth first i tried this two protocol hypoacidity and sibo protocol if both protocols are not successful as as my patient for stool mapping after one month so mostly candida overgrowth it's very rare maybe they have other symptoms like tongue coating fever diarrhea and omitting as well small intestinal fungal overgrowth small intestinal parasites maybe around again 5 to 6 percentage of uh, 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 the ibs symptoms can be related to small intestinal parasite overgrowth cbc if the eosinophils are elevated low ferritin associated with the anal itching skin rashes low ferritin even i recommend finally stool muffing so the protocol i recommend seven days of deworming modern medicine deworming with the modern medicine the sixth type of uh, we have seen five types of ibs hypoacidity sibo small intestinal fal fungus overgrowth small intestinal parasite overgrowth next we are going to infectious related uh, post infectious diarrhea sixth one post infectious chronic diarrhea the seventh reason fructose intolerance very rare low blood sugar chronic fatigue fructose intolerance also can leads to diarrhea eighth is lactose intolerance bloating gas bile acid malabsorption digestive and same insufficiency so you know this all can contribute to so it's very uh, we need to rule out each and every cases maybe 80 to 90 percentage get complete remission just by sibo protocol and hypoacidity protocol if the protocols are failed patients are not getting prognosis better prognosis then i will move to rest of the protocol then there, there are autoimmune diarrhea ulcerative colitis crohn's disease ileitis and celiac disease these cases are most likely they are diagnosed before coming to the clinic so we have a different protocol as dr jinu presented a case history about crohn's disease and as far as the autoimmune diarrhea is concerned the Crohn's disease are relatively easier to treat. So far, we are getting, uh, uh, we have achieved around 90 to 95 percentage success rate for Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis takes slightly longer time, maybe three months to six months. Iliatis and Iliatis also take longer time to handle. Celiac disease, uh, I did not treat much celiac cases so far, but we do get plenty of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Then there are Infection mediated diarrhea, intestinal TB, symptoms, weight loss, vomiting, night sweat, and anemia. It is very tough, you know, tough task to distinguish intestinal TB from Crohn's disease. It takes maybe one year, year or one and a half year to distinguish intestinal TB from Crohn's disease. Clostridium deficiently, acute gastroenteritis, post infectious diarrhea. So we have seen 18 types of diarrhea. The most common one is SIBO mediated diarrhea, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, followed by hypoacidity. Then, it most likely, it's related to small intestinal fungus overgrowth, small intestinal parasite overgrowth, bile acid malabsorption, fructose intolerance, bile acid mal malabsorption uh, after collect. <coughs> Yeah. So digestive and same insufficiency. So these are the some of the uh, underlying cause of diarrhea. Now the protocol, the SIBO protocol. The SIBO protocol. Time finish. Okay. So even like we have seen for H. pylori infection, triple therapy, nickel-free diet, probiotics and herbs. Likewise, the major dietary protocol to eradicate SIBO, fungus and parasite, glucose-free, fructose-free diet. Because the major fuel of 
bacteria, small intestinal bacterial, over, which are mostly anaerobic microbes, anaerobic bacteria or parasite or fungus, that depends on simple sugar, glucose and fructose. So I stopped starch, glucose and chromulose sugar for two weeks. That's the backbone of SIBO eradication treatment. Fructose free, glucose free, starch free diet. So I keep, I mostly I will put my patient on soup, steamed vegetable, soup with a little bit of butter, buttermilk diet for one or two weeks. Maybe if they're non-vegetarian, ask them to take small quantity of chicken soup, which is the dietary protocol. Not all probiotics works here. Spore-based bacteria are very crucial. For H. pylori, I use different strains, but for SIBO, SIBO, the major strains are spore-based bacteria and S. bulrari, Saccharomyces bulrari, which is the major probiotic strains used here. And there are herbs like here. I use about five to six herbs. Very helpful. And my SIBO protocols sir, if it is the, it's by SIBO. Very successful. Diarrhea dominated IBS is very easy to handle compared with the constipation dominated IBS. Usually constipation dominated IBS, it takes about uh, three months to five months to get better prognosis. Whereas, Diarrhea dominated IBS, the, the you know, uh, response is very rapid, just in 10 days. Mostly patients get complete recovery before they discharge from our hospital. We encourage our patient to get admitted for two weeks for SIBO protocol. So SIBO is very, very easy to handle compared with the constipation dominated IBS. So herbs, herbs like uh, uh, bale fruit, bale fruit, I use uh, some of the herbs like uh, again black cumin oil, bale fruit extracts, goodichi extracts, and I use uh, hemis hemisdemus indicus, which are some of the herbs I use to eradicate uh, SIBO bacteria, and supplemented with uh, uh, augmented with uh, SB or spore-based bacteria and Saccharomyces boulardii, and grain-free glucose free starch free diet which is a protocol for SIBO eradication of SIBO like a major thing is star bacteria by avoiding glucose and fructose so spore based bacteria even lactobacillus ruteri is found to be very widely beneficial so uh, the same dietary protocol is applicable for parasite and fungus as well because parasite and fungus that depends on on the uh, glucose and fructose what we consume antimicrobial herbs. Next, let's move to uh, the protocol for constipation. So the constipation, the majority of the constipation are mediated by methanogenic bacteria like hypoacidity and hyperacidity, H. pylori, IBS and diarrhea by small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, whereas the constipation mainly by methanogenic bacteria and overgrowth of methanogenic bacteria can in fact the mechanism, the methanogenic bacteria produce excess of methyl gas. And how this methyl max impair the peristaltic movement. Because as I pointed out earlier, the serotonin is the major neurotransmitter bind to smooth muscles of GI tract and intact peristalsis movement. So the methyl gas produced by methanogenic bacteria can block the serotonin receptor of smooth muscles. So it is like uh, keeping a paper piece in the keyhole. keyhole. So the original key cannot fit into that. You know, Similarly, the methyl gas can act as a pepper piece. It blocks the serotonin receptors and blocking the bowel movement leads to peristalsis movement. So 60 to 70 percentage of constipation is result of methanogenic bacteria, which produce methyl gas. It is neither from lack of fiber uh, or, <clears throat> or you know, the dietary factors. The major factor is the methyl gas by methanogenic bacteria. So let me tell you what's the protocol. 
and the and also bear in the mind the prebiotics are not recommended here sibo because the prebiotic can fuel the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth prebiotics are not recommended but for autoimmune diarrhea prebiotics are recommended not for sibo diarrhea or fungus mediated diarrhea or parasite mediated diarrhea prebiotics are not recommended but for constipation the major strategy adding as much prebiotic as possible diverse type of prebiotics and because the prebiotics after reaching to colon they convert into a type of acid called as short chain fatty acids so the best medicine best protocol to treat constipation enhancing the production of scfa short chain fatty acids so there are other factors as well but the overwhelming percentage of constipation are related to methanogenic overgrowth next is impaired serotonin production gut dysbiosis methanogenic bacteria the methyl gas block the serotonin receptor but there are some other type of bacteria dysbiosis colon dysbiosis which impair the serotonin production this also can leads to constipation second impaired cortisol production parasite infection small intestinal parasite overgrowth it can manifest as diarrhea and also as constipation also bile acid malabsorption bile acid also increase peristaltic movement so this the but the major factor is intestinal methanogenic overgrowth the methanogen and hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria distinct gut microbiome profile and irritable bowel syndrome subtypes so we need to the difference between the methanogenic overgrowth and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth caused by archaea abnormal pain bloating belching constipation skin condition leaky gut and malnutrition nausea heartburn anxiety fatigue joint and muscle pain and sibo symptoms caused by bacteria bloating belching diarrhea depression weight loss nausea diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome so there are constipation dominated ibs is mediated by intestinal methanogenic overgrowth and diarrhea dominated ibs the mostly it's related to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth so in mixed ibs let me come to the etiology of mixed ibs in mixed i say patient have both bacteria methane dominated sibo and uh, hydrogen dominant sibo that leads to mixed type of ibs so the protocol the major protocol the major protocol is uh, the mechanism like a pickle mechanism the how to eradicate this colon bacteria so methanogenic bacteria simple mechanisms are applicable pickle mechanism always i love to call as like a pickle barani picky water plus carrot the ph of water is close to 7 isn't it close to see alkaline ph the carrot rotten very rapidly very quickly within 2 3 days carrot damage but when you lower the ph of water by adding a teaspoon of vinegar drops of vinegar the carrot preserve for many years maybe 2 year 5 year or 10 year when the ph of water reduced the carrot got preserved when alkaline ph carrot got damaged same mechanism is applicable so in acidic ph many harmful bacteria get eradicated they cannot be creating environment inhospitable uh, environment where they cannot multiply rapidly so but we cannot as i told you the methanogenic bacteria in colon contribute to constipation so how to kill them but we cannot pour the acid directly to colon and there is a smart mechanism something called as short chain fatty acids scfa two carbon acetic acid 
three carbon propionic acid and four carbon butyric acid and the fatty acids classified into four divisions short chain medium chain long chain and very long chain fatty acids so to treat gut dysbiosis it's not just pre probiotics the best medicine the best strategy enhancing the production of short chain fatty acid scfa short chain fatty acid after reaching to colon they slightly lower the colon ph and create a environment inhospitable for harmful bacteria like e coli bacteria implicated in uti urinary tract infections we have seen methanogenic bacteria in colon leads to constipation likewise klebsiella bacteria klebsiella bacteria abundance of klebsiella in colon are related to ankylosing spondylitis the p copri bacteria are related to zero positive rheumatoid arthritis autism clostridium bacteria likewise for different type of autoimmune disorders various type strains of bacteria are strongly related so to minimize the growth of this bad bacteria harmful bacteria in colon like pickle got preserved in low ph similarly increasing the acid production in the colon which acid short chain fatty acids in order to generate short chain fatty acid in colon one has to take different type of prebiotic fiber short chain fatty acid neither found in plant food nor in animal food they are similar to alcohol alcohols are result of the fermentation fruits fermentation similarly short chain fatty acids are the result of fiber fermentation two types of fiber soluble fiber and insoluble fiber the soluble fiber after reaching to colon convert into short chain fatty acid and colon ph is lowered harmful bacteria are removed that's what i told you so the soluble fiber which can convert into short chain fatty acid generally called as prebiotic fiber so the best strategy the main strategy adding as much prebiotic fiber as possible so even addition to that short chain fatty acid increase induce an a2 11 fold increase in 5 hydroxy tryptophan which is serotonin release an 2 to 3 fold increase in calcitonin gene related peptide so the serotonin the serotonin you know short chain fatty acid enhances production of short serotonin by 10 times serotonin enhances the peristaltic movement indirectly so two ways serotonin are helpful to address constipation the first one serotonin directly increase the production of serotonin second serot the short chain fatty acid reduce the ph of colon so the methanogenic bacteria cannot grow on this low ph acidic environment so prebiotic and short chain fatty acid soluble fiber soluble fiber after reaching to colon they convert into short chain fatty acids short chain fatty acid lower the ph favor bifidobacterial growth and produce trigger the production of lactic acids and pathogenic bacteria cannot survive same pathways are highly beneficial for female urinary tract infection and you know one mystery around 30 to 40 percentage of uric acids strongly related to fatty liver non alcoholic fatty liver disorder but maybe around 40 percentage of uric acids are gut mediated it's a, a toxin producing shiga toxin producing e coli bacteria just you can refer the uric acid and shiga toxin producing gut bacteria so if same protocol is applicable to fix gut dysbiosis reducing the colon ph by adding different types of soluble fiber that might be the reason in human breast milk after fat and carbohydrate third major constituent is not protein you know the fat protein and the you know all the mammalian milk the major constituents are fat protein and carb but in human breast milk third major constituent is prebiotic fiber thousand types of soluble fibers are found in human breast milk mother nature 
well aware that our gut, we have two types of cells. We are made by two types of cells. The fat, protein, and carbs can nourish our cells, but bacteria cells are nourished by soluble fiber. That's what always I tell. The constipation originated when we started cultivating grains because grains are a source of insoluble fiber. But fruits and leaf or tubers rich source of insoluble fiber. That this transition from forest dwelling to agriculture significantly change the structure of our fiber intake. Ancestors, hunter gatherers, they had access to soluble fiber because today most of our fiber come from insoluble fiber from grains. That's the one cause for constipation. I call Karnataka because we always conduct camps in the rural side. Rice belt is a pipes belt. I joke to my friends because I travel lots about North Karnataka. They're, they don't the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, rice and buttermilk or pickle. That's a diet. They don't. I feel the pipes prevalence could be 60 to 70 percentage and cause huge prevalence of constipation. Though don't take any other type of fiber in day. Hmm? So uh, the grains fibers are insoluble. So we need to add different type of soluble fiber to, to, uh, to increase the peristaltic movement and address the constipation. Doctor, we have only 10 minutes more in case you want to present or we could take the questions. Yeah, so these are the, the food rich in fiber, soluble fiber. My favorite is flax seeds, gum arabic, chia seeds, banana flower, the rind of banana, stem of banana, chicory, passion fruit peel, maybe uh, like uh, uh, onions, this all are great source of, usually the onion and vegetables, fruits, the fiber, the fiber content is just two to three percentage. But flaxseed, chia seed, fenugreek, I forgot to mention fenugreek. I recommend my patient a mix of flaxseed, 100 gram of flaxseed, 100 gram of fenugreek, and 100 gram of sesame, till. Blend together 300 gram powder, 50 gram every day for 10 days to 15 days. Very beneficial prebiotic. They have incredible potential to convert into short chain fatty acids. So the soluble fiber, unlike so insoluble fiber, cannot incorporate to stool. For instance, you take one teaspoon of soluble fiber, you get one teaspoon of short-chain fatty acid in colon. But insoluble fiber, you take one teaspoon, one teaspoon get incorporated to stool and evacuate through the stool. So the protocol for constipation, prebiotics are the major steps. So I remind you, prebiotics are not recommended for SIBO or for stomach dysbiosis or SIBO SIBO you know, uh, it's not recommended. It's mainly for constipation. So prebiotics, different type of prebiotic. So I use natural prebiotic and supplement prebiotic, inulin, galacto -olig oligosaccharides, tracto oligosaccharides, uh, pectin, uh, like gorgum, different type of soluble fiber I use for my patient. Next is probiotic. I use two types of probiotic, not all the same. And like, uh, like bacillus coagulans, one of the strains highly beneficial to increase the peristaltic movement. Usually, the S. bulradi, I don't give because that may lead to mild constipation. So, probiotic and one more probiotic, aloe vera honey probiotic, fermented aloe vera and honey. Uh, maybe one half liter, uh, 500 ml of aloe vera gel, 500 of honey, ferment for seven days in refrigerator. And every day, 150 ml for 21 days in empty stomach. And prebiotic, probiotic, herbs. And grain-free, the diet, this is a diet, grain-free diet for one month. That's what I told you. Constipation-dominated IBS takes a little longer time. So fat also important because by salt, Ayurveda says, 3 teaspoon of ghee, 10 to 15 ml of ghee in lukewarm water before sleep. Because the fat, intact bile salt secretion, enhanced bile salt, and bile salt can act as a neurotransmitter to improve peristaltic system. So plenty of coconut, the two teaspoon of coconut, virgin coconut oil, empty stomach. It's a good remedy for constipation for kids. 
and ghee fruits this is a diet for uh, so diet herbs prebiotics are the most important steps to address constipation i hope so i don't have time to explain the gut related uh, you know even i just give a brief about autoimmune disorder gut related autoimmune disorder small intestinal related uh, autoimmune like uh, all the psoriasis eczema dermatitis wherever ig is increased ig antibodies are increased uh, strongly related to small intestinal dysbiosis colon related autoimmune disorders zero positive rheumatoid arthritis where ra factor is elevated and ccp elevated esr crp which is a gut related if the zero negative rheumatoid arthritis are mostly related to viral origins even in psoriasis not all psoriasis are related to gut there are oxidative stress also can contribute to psoriasis so maybe i hope in future i can conduct one more session about uh, uh, autoimmune disorder subclassification gut related oxidative stress and viral mediated so we have developed three protocols to address autoimmunity from this particular perspective and i hope you enjoyed my talk and i got uh, Thank you, Dr. Praveen. Uh, we have 10 minutes if you could answer the questions. Hello? Yeah, Dr. Praveen. Shall we go ahead with the question and answers? Okay. Hello? Yeah, doctor. Okay, you had mentioned that uh, you categorize the uh, diseases based on the symptom presentation. The question is, uh, do you is there any specific test available to detect IBS other than uh, solely uh, diagnosing it based on symptoms? See, the major issue... <clears throat> We work in the rural side, our, our, most of our patients are from below middle class families. So by symptoms, by because we are exposed to hundreds of patients, just by symptoms, we are able to diagnose and we are, to, we, we are able to successfully treat our cases. For few patients, we recommend stool mapping. Stool mapping. I, and so far, I never recommended hydrogen pre-test or methane pre-test. We don't have the facility here. But most of our diagnosis depends on symptoms of the patient. And in some circumstances, stool mapping. Next question is, with reference to uh, short-chain fatty acids, there is a view that we need to focus more on the total of... Uh, short chain fatty acid and butyric acids and uh, what is your take on this yes see the dietary choices of uh, uh, the short chain fatty acids are very right like the name of butter name of butter derived from butyric acids so the major issue here the dietary short chain fatty acids are digested in the intestine it cannot deliver to colon so the best trick is to Enhance the short chain fatty acid production in colon by diversifying different type of prebiotic fiber. We had a question before uh, that is intake of sugar and uh, relation to gut flora which you have already covered during the session and there was a request if you could give a brief on which prebiotic is uh, or which probiotic is suitable for which condition okay maybe there are different usually i use uh, for psoriasis eczema ig elevated ig i use only spore based bacteria sbo probiotics never recommend any other type of strains for constipation, 
as usually recommend uh, like uh, 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 rutari, lactobacillus rutari, bacillus coagulans, and animalis, animalis, uh, bifidobacterium lactis, bifidobacterium animalis, and mm. lactobacillus rutari and co bacillus coagulans. For stomach issues, general lactobacillus claims I'm using for stomach upsets. But we should exercise caution when you recommend probiotic for psoriasis, eczema, dermatitis, and allergy cases. Rest of the case, I never found any trigger. Oh. Oh, now, the next question is related to the grains that we had mentioned. Uh, the diet should be gluten-free or just grain-free diet? Grain what free. about millets? Millets too, same, same, same category. They all produced by grass. See, the all grains are seeds of grass. I don't feel any different between wheat or rice. For a, not for lifelong, just in, for a month of month or two months. I restricted all type of grains, including millets. I think we could, uh, that's all for the session. We'll move on to the uh, next presentation now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Praveen Jacob. Uh, your presentations are always uh, very straightforward, easy to grasp, but uh, have in-depth knowledge about the clinical conditions and the protocols. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, if anybody would like to get in touch with Dr. Praveen Jacob, you're already on the WhatsApp group. You can uh, message him or uh, uh, log on to gastrogutexperts.com website and you could contact the organizing team. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You could close the uh, screen. We'll move on to the next presentation. Now, next we have uh, Dr. Debojoti Dhar, co founder and director at Lucin Rich Bio Private Limited. Dr. Debojoti is a co founder and director of South Asia's first microbiome company, Lucin Rich Bio Private Limited. He received his PhD in molecular biology from Indian Institute of Science and has a postdoctoral research experience from UMass Medical School, USA. He has worked extensively on translational control of gene regulation during his PhD and postdoctoral research. He has over 15 years of experience in academic and industry research and development activities, especially in metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and gut health, along with uh, strong multi-domain knowledge in pharmaceutical and uh, biotechnology industries. Dr. Dar has led Lucin Rich Bio and won many national and international awards, including the prestigious National Startup Award 2021. And uh, he is currently the member of expert committee constituted by Government of India on functional food. Welcome, sir. Uh, may I kindly request you to present your topic on uh, Bug Speaks. I, I hope I'm audible and my screen is visible. Uh, your volume is, uh, you could increase the volume slightly low. Is it, is it better now? Uh, still low. You could, could just check the audio once. Better because I have uh, put it as, as maximum now. Okay, let's continue. Um, uh, thank you, thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, for this interesting uh, session, and especially to Dr. Praveen Jacob. Um, wonderful presentation, Dr. Jacob. And as usual, you know, we get to learn so many things from you every time you present. Um, <clears throat> 
So I'll start with uh, with with uh, the session um, on Bug Speaks. Um, so Bug Speaks is South Asia's first microbiome test, and uh, you know we developed this test way back in 2017-18. So it was one of its kind when we launched it in India at that point of time. Uh, not only in India, in, in the whole Southeast uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia region. So we have learned a lot during this journey uh, of five years when first Bug Speaks uh, report came into existence. So um, I'll basically try to take you uh, to the various features of this test and also try to um, answer a few questions uh, later on based on this uh, uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the whole idea when we started working on the microbiome was to look at an aspect of uh, human health, which was not uh, very apparent at that point of time. As all of you here would know that uh, microbiome is an age old concept. I always say that the science is old, but the technology is new. So what we are doing right now is to use the new technology to understand the microbiome science better. And, and whatever understanding and knowledge we've had, we are trying to translate that to the end user. So as you all know, uh, there's a lot of uh, chronic disease burden uh, all over the world. And the kind of uh, treatment regimen that we follow, um, uh, they are not basically uh, too good because they, they, they add a lot of economic burden and the quality of life also does not, in, does not improve. So what we are trying here, um, as all of you or most of you are also uh, on the same path, is to look at the microbiome and give a certain solution which can probably make uh, the quality of life better and also the economic burden on, on people can be reduced. Uh, that's, a, that's a journey that we have started, all of us here, I think in this particular uh, uh, conference, but that is something that we are going to uh, probably keep on uh, doing in the next couple of years or more. So what are we talking about? We are talking about a, a solution which can probably rebalance the gut microbiome. But to rebalance the gut microbiome, one, one has to understand what, are, what, are, what exactly the profile of the gut microbiota is. And that's where the technology comes in. That's where what we do come, come in. So what are the advantages of, of looking at the gut microbiome profiling? One, it is non-invasive. So you don't have to put anything inside the body. Second, it profiles all the microorganisms from the stool. Um, we, we will discuss the different uh, modalities of that also. Third, you don't need to culture the microorganisms uh, because one of the uh, limitations of culturing is that you cannot grow all the microorganisms in the lab. Fourth, you can provide a lot of information on the relative abundance of uh, various microorganisms. Fifth, you can uh, look at the diversity. Um, I think uh, the first speaker in the morning showed a lot of uh, Shannon diversity uh, uh, matrices for, for all of us. So that, that really uh, gives an impact um, or, or a lot of information is provided through the diversity matrices. Uh, we can provide strain level information, functional aspects can be ascertained, and, and the most important, personalized food recommendation can be provided. So when you look at all these aspects, uh, it, it really comes out as a very strong package. Very interestingly, uh, you know, the gut microbiome profiling can also uh, give you some more idea uh, or clues to the existing diseases. For example, uh, Suppose you find parasites uh, such, uh, such as tapeworm, which is strongyloids uh, sterocolis here. Uh, they have symptoms similar, uh, similar to IBD. So, you know, sometimes when you have some, some symptoms like this, it's better to look at all these kind of microorganisms, which uh, gut microbiome profiling can do. For example, if you have diarrhea, uh, some of these guys can also actually cause di the diarrhea in the intestine. So, so these kind of profiling can also add to the value. So what is Bug Speaks? So basically Bug Speaks is a do-it-yourself kind of a kit. Um, it's an it's a at-home gut microbiome-based uh, test package. Um, it provides hyper-personalized recommendations and also it, it provides a risk uh, assessment or susceptibility uh, of around 16 diseases and conditions. Now, some of the features of the Bug Speaks uh, that I'm going to talk to you about here uh, are, 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 follows, are as follows. The first important thing is the rich index. So rich index is a proprietary uh, score developed by us, which basically gives a snapshot of, of your gut health. 
now as you as you would all imagine when we started this journey way back in 2017 18 uh, we did not know what to put in a in a score like this so our, our clients our patients used to come back and say uh, you know hey you know i know that i have x bacteria and y viruses but i want to know whether my gut is healthy or unhealthy so so that propelled us to look into this kind of a scoring system and um, and this this kind of scoring system has actually evolved as we have moved on uh, since 2018 um uh, i'll 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 uh, give you a few uh, you know insights on that as well as we move on but other than that the rich index part uh, we also give susceptibility to certain diseases we provide the nutritional recommendation and all of these are are based on proprietary technology and uh, patent pending technology the process is very simple um uh, <clears throat> we work with uh, you know partners like dr pravin jacob uh, and we do have a website where people can go and book the test uh, once the test is booked Uh, a kit is sent to the person's home and from there the sample is collected all by our courier partner once it reaches our lab in bangalore we extract the dna from the sample we do uh, next generation sequencing and then the magic sauce uh, comes in which provides the interpretation and report uh, this is how the kit looks obviously there are uh, certain things that are added and uh, removed uh, uh, based on the knowledge and understanding but generally this is all uh, the kit has um, Uh, the the solution in in this kit uh, the, as you can see there's a tube in this kit in this tube there's a solution what the solution does is once the sample goes into the solution uh, the, the sample is preserved the dna is preserved because uh, we need the dna and that's the basic uh, input material for us uh, secondly all this can take place at room temperature so there is no cold chain uh, transfer of of these samples so this is where the dna extraction and sequencing um, uh, you know differs between different uh, organizations that do this kind of work we we basically use shotgun metagenomic sequencing which which was a strategic decision taken by us way back in 2017 we could have gone for 16s rrna sequencing that would have meant that we are looking at only bacteria and archaea but we 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 um, you know strategically took a decision of looking at all the microorganisms because we feel that it's an ecosystem although bacteria are 99% of that ecosystem the 1% uh, of other microorganisms or kingdoms do play a role so that's how we uh, stuck to shotgun metagenomic sequencing although it, it was much more expensive at that point of time as compared to 16s rrna sequence now here comes the analysis and inter this is the magic sauce See, look uh, anyone can do sequencing if they have the capital resources anyone can put a machine buy a machine and get the raw data out but what differentiates a company like us or a report like this is the analysis and interpretation and believe me there's a lot of biology that has gone into the back end um, there's a lot of bioinformatics there's a lot of coding that goes into the back end and just to give you a brief this particular slide basically gives you a kind of brief so we have uh, you know one of the world's largest uh, you know databases uh, which looks at the microorganisms right now i think it is around uh, 250000 uh, microorganisms database we have another database which looks at uh, the, the the nutritional part of it so which organisms are linked to what nutrients um, are, are all curated there then we have another database which looks at some of the diseases that are linked to the microorganisms well all of these database then go into our advanced interpretation engine now this is the engine where we have all the uh, you know uh, the interpretations going on it has uh, patent pending uh, matrices uh, decision taking matrices and so on and so forth and once all of these go together this is what i call as the magic sauce of of the reporting and finally you see the report so i'll i'll give you a glimpse of the report uh, again as i said when we launched this test in 2018 the report looked completely different now it looks completely different in another 6 months it will be another version of the report because the field is advancing at an enormous pace as all of you in this conference would would agree with me that uh, a microbiome field has just boomed uh in the last 2 to 3 years and especially post covid uh, we will we'll talk about that experience also if time permits but anyway uh, just give you a glimpse of the report uh, the fundamental part of the report is this rich index which is a microbiota based intestinal health score um it it looks into lot of parameters and not just the diversity so what we realize is yes diversity is an important uh, parameter but it's not the only parameter so we look at lot of other factors Uh, which are uh, which which go into defining what you call as a good gut and and all of these in the back end uh, you know 
is included and we we get a score uh, which which gives you an indication of how, how good or bad the gut health is uh, then we have other uh, parameters that we look into for example probiotic characterization pathogen characterization foundation microbiota antibiotic recovery potential vitamin production potential scfa production potential and so on and so forth one of the interesting or important aspects of this report is the foundation microbiota as you know any ecosystem needs certain keystone species um, and, and in the gut microbiota there are certain set of microorganisms known as keystone species or foundation microbiota this is just a snapshot this is not the all the all the list of the organisms are not uh, present in this slide but what it gives is basically an indication of uh, of how these keystone species are doing in an individual's gut um, similarly probiotic characterization we actually look at the different kind of uh, probiotics not only bacteria but also the fungus for example saccharomyces boulardii um, is also uh, looked at um, and then based on that we we basically segregate into uh, the probiotics which are uh, less abundant probiotics that are not abundant and uh, probiotics that are already there so that kind of gives a handle to the treating uh, clinician or the nutritionist to look at that and then um, you know provide uh, uh, the therapy pathogen characterization again is a very interesting uh, part of the report although this is not a diagnostic report but it definitely gives some sort of an indication of of how things are um, and and any pathogen or, or commensal which can cause uh, disease uh, if it is higher than the healthy is is flagged in the report uh, we always recommend that uh, anything which is being flagged here should be clinically correlated and if the treating clinician um, you know wants to corroborate that that should be done before taking any uh, course of medication or changing the course of medication the most important part of the report um, is the personalized nutritional recommendation now uh, please understand this personalized nutritional recommendation is not based on the disease of that individual we are not looking at the disease of the individual and giving this recommendation this is just based on the microbiota profile of that uh, individual uh, so the idea is that um if you can bring back u biases from dis biases based on uh, the nutritional recommendation uh, then lot of the clinical uh, manifestations of lot of the diseases can be taken care of so uh, we have broken the nutritional recommendation into three phases uh, uh, which which basically uh, you know culminate into a three month kind of a program now the question can be why three phases why three months uh, well this is just to improve the compliance initially in 2018 when we started bug speaks in india and south asia we did not have this uh, three phase diet so a lot of people used to come back and say you know i'm not able to fine tune my new, uh, you know meal plans because the the nutrition recommendation was uh, quite exhaustive and hence we 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 came to the conclusion of providing a three phase nutrition recommendation along with meal plans so the idea is that in the first phase two weeks we basically provide the you know uh, nutrients or food which are which which are naturally anti uh, bacterial or anti pathogenic uh, anti inflammatory and so on and so forth the second phase of 8 weeks which is 2 months we provide uh, you know the the actual kind of uh, food uh, which are uh, linked to the gut microbiota profile of that individual and the phase 3 is just to uh, continue with that uh, it does not mean that one person has to stop after 3 months if he or she is getting benefit he is Uh, or she is more likely or most likely to continue with uh, with their kind of uh, food regimen this is the kind of the disease breakup this is just to give you a, the audience um, you know a kind of an idea of how different kind of people with different kind of uh, you know chronic uh, diseases are are taking these kind of tests um, now we have been in this uh, domain for the last uh, as i said four five years now uh, and slowly we are seeing that people with not only the uh, fgids or functional gastrointestinal diseases but people with uh, you know skin disease uh, uh, depression anxiety are are taking these kind of tests uh, we get lot of calls from uh, autistic uh, uh, you know parents for of autistic children um, so that's that's a change that I, that i have been seeing um, of late uh, in india especially in the gut microbiome space um there are few first to our name um the obviously we are the first uh, south asian company to start this uh, journey of microbiome in india um 
lot of tests have been sold across the world. Uh, we 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 are uh, exporting it to now Philippines and Thailand as well. And then we have had uh, retail clients from Lebanon, UK, Malaysia, UAE, uh, etc. Hungary also recently. Um, we recently uh, completed a clinical trial to show uh, to see the efficacy because we we've got a lot of anecdotal evidence from people saying that you know they've got benefited once they took the test and followed the nutritional recommendation. Uh, but it has to be, you know, done in a clinical trial setting. So we did a clinical trial. Uh, we are writing that paper, and hopefully, in 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 a month or two months' time, we should be able to at least submit the paper. And we found very interesting results. We found reduction in HbA1c in diabetic patients. We found reduction in, um, you know, systolic pressure um, in that cohort. We also found a reduction in inflammation, uh, and so on and so forth. So so hopefully, in another month or two months' time, we should be able to see this paper uh, in an international journal. So what are the distinct advantages? See the distinct advantage is that it's, it has more precision, um, it is highly personalized, and, and it, it, it comes with some new age evidence uh, as well. And I'm sure like anything new which comes in, uh, you know, people take time to adopt and adapt. Um, but the, the, the trend that I've been seeing in the last four or five years has been really great. Uh, uh, although the, this test is expensive, and this test is ex expensive because of the technology that is NGS and NGS, as you all know, is expensive. Yet, um, I'm seeing a real uptick of people taking this test uh, in their routine life. Uh, there are various clinical segments, not, not only the gastrointestinal uh, segment, uh, you know, as, as I was telling you earlier, uh, skin diseases, uh, mental uh, diseases, uh, depression, etc. Chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension. We have a lot of patients uh, with NFLD, um, you know, who have taken this test. And, and, and there's another segment where I think this test can really create a lot of uh, positive outcomes um, is pregnancy, preconceiving, and maternal health. So that is something that I have not yet seen um, uh, that boom, but I'm sure in the coming months or years, this is a segment where this test can really. Uh, show its uh, positive outcome. And of course, uh, you know, uh, wellness programs for corporates, employees, because see, in today's day, a uh, lot of people uh, take a lot of food outside, uh, stress levels are very high, and hence, these kind of tests, which provide some actionable information, um, uh, can be a boon to a lot of uh, youngsters, especially. Um, and of course, Ayurveda clinics, wellness resorts, and so on and so forth. Uh, before coming to the end of the presentation, I'll just uh, showcase two case studies. Um, so this was uh, one patient uh, uh, who had taken uh, Bugs Peaks test twice. Um, so uh, he was a male patient, around 35 years of age. He had obese and he had indigestion and acidity issues. Um, so he took the test and he started following the, uh, following the recommendation. Uh, what he said that he, he lost six kgs in the first month itself, and after three months, he retook the test. When we looked at some of the parameters, we also found uh, very interesting uh, changes in, in those parameters. Uh, one was the rich index. As you can see uh, earlier, his rich index was 3.34. It had gone up to 4.09. Uh, the foundation microbiota initially, that was non-ideal. Uh, that got improved and became below average. It was not ideal uh, as such, but at least uh, the, the trend was towards, uh, towards that. Uh, SCFA production, again, was uh, very uh, non-ideal, as Dr. Jacob was telling about short-chain fatty acids. They are important. And his SCFA production potential, I'm talking about potential, not the actual SCFA uh, you know, detection, that also became better. From non-ideal, it became below average. Neurotransmitter was average. And uh, after three months, when he took this test, again, we found that the neurotransmitter had become ideal. This is one of the case studies. And I said, there are many anecdotal evidences that we have, um, but the clinical trial actually proved that it actually works in, in at least uh, one disease that we focused on. This is the second uh, kind of a case study. Here, a woman patient had taken the Bugs Peaks test. Uh, she had a history of psoriasis and lung infection, and we found an increased Aspergillus niger in her uh, stool sample. Uh, she did a, a urine metabolite test also, and that suggested uh, uh, aspergillus because 5-hydroxymethyl-2-furoic acid was found to be uh, high in her urine as well. So what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, Bugs Peaks 
did uh, suggest an aspergillus overgrowth, which was corroborated by urine metabolite in, uh, analysis. So with this, I come to the end of uh, the presentation and I'll be happy to take any questions uh, uh, on this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dark. Uh, we have a question for you. So uh, the question is, how will the test differ in reports of an individual if the test is done uh, at the beginning of the protocol and repeated after three months of any probiotic? Uh, you're not audible. Can you please unmute yourself? Yes, audible. Yeah. Um, so I just showed you one case study. Uh, that case study uh, was uh, similar to the question that is that has been asked. Um, so starting, uh, uh, you know, uh, the person had taken the uh, Bugs Peaks test. So his profile was different. Uh, the rich index that we have developed showed a lower uh, number, and there was, all the other parameters were not very good. But three months down the line, when he followed the Bugs Peaks test uh, recommendations, um, you know some of the parameters actually improved. So I think uh, that answers uh, this question as well. Uh, is there any sp uh, next question? Is uh, is there any specific site where one can study on microbiome studies? A specific site. Oh, Again, you're not audible. Okay. I'm saying we have a website. So if you want, I can share the website where they can come in and uh, take the study or take the test. Okay. The next question is, uh, does Buck speak test help in diabetes and hypertension treatments? Uh, could you please check the audio? Your voice is breaking. Yeah, it's yeah. Better? Uh, we can hear you, but it's quite low. Anyway, uh, yeah, it does. It does because th that's the clinical trial that we did suggest. Uh, it does help in hypertension and diabetes. Uh, we should be publishing this uh, data in, in a month's time, month or a two months' time, uh, hopefully. Okay. Uh, when participant has requested to repeat the uh, insights on uh, rich index, the slide presented on uh, rich index. Um, so rich index basically uh, is a parameter that takes into consideration uh, diversity, uh, takes into consideration the, the SCFA production potential, takes into consideration the vitamin production potential and, and many other parameters. Um, so based on all those parameters, uh, certain weightages are given and, and these weightages are given uh, on the basis of data that we have. And then, um, you know, a particular score, is given to that individual uh, sample. So this is what rich index is all about. Um, it's a proprietary and a patent pending um, algorithm. We are working to, uh, so internally we have seen that actually rich index can differentiate between the healthy and the non-healthy gut. Uh, so we are working on, on some parameters uh, to add some more parameters into it to make the delta even better. Uh, and hopefully uh, in another few months time, we should also see this as a publication very soon. The uh, next question is, uh, is this test available in uh, Kathmandu and uh, what is the cost of the test? Nepal. It's available uh, worldwide. Um, uh, you can just log on to the website and order the test and uh, the kit can be sent to you. Uh, we, we sell this test 
in Thailand and Philippines through our distributor. So if, if any individual is there, uh, they can get it through our distributor. Other than that, all other uh, you know, tests can be available uh, anywhere in the world. Could you please uh, repeat the website where they can order the test? Yes. Shall I, shall I put it on the chat? Or yes, I... yes. Or uh, even chat would. It's uh, bugspeaks.com, www.bugspeaks.com. And for all the participant, participants here, if you want to really try this, I will just give you another coupon code. So that will help you get some discount. Thank you, Dr. Dar. Participants, you can even follow Dr. Dar uh, as he writes blogs on disease uh, research and its impact on society and life sciences industries. So the website is, you can follow him on debiisc.blogspot.in. We will uh, paste this on the chat box as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Debujati Dhar, for uh, presentation on Bug Speak and on, on behalf of the organizing uh, committee extend. Uh, uh, a grateful nesting. Thank you. Participants, please note, we will have a, a very short break of 10 minutes. Uh, please do not uh, log out. You can stay online and uh, be back at 1.50 p.m. Our next presentation is uh, by Professor Vimal Kirani, is the one which you definitely should not miss out. Uh, he will log in at 1.50, so I request all the participants to be back online at in 10 minutes at 1.50 uh, p.m. Thank you. So Professor Vimal Karani, he is a professor in nutrigenomics, nutrigenetics. He is a deputy director of IFNH uh, University of Reading, United Kingdom. So he will be speaking on uh, uh, from nutrigenetics to gut microbiome towards precision medicine. And he specialized in personalized nutrition. So it's a speaker that you must hear. So be back at 1.50 p.m.
Hello, Rita, ma'am. Can we please start? I welcome back all our participants. Let's proceed with our next session. We have with us Professor Vimal Karani, who will be addressing on from nutrigenetics to gut microbiome towards precision medicine. Professor Vimal Karani is a professor in nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. He joined the University of Reading after his postdoctoral training at the MRC Epidemiology Unit and University College London. He has also received advanced training in epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, UK. Professor Karani has an interdisciplinary ac academic background with qualifications from molecular genetics, bioinformatics, statistical genetics, and genetic epidemiology. He has published extensively in areas related to nutrigenetics and non-communicable diseases, and presently has more than 80 peer-reviewed publications in journals like Nature, Genetics, Lancet, and so on. He is, he is a recipient of UK Nutrition Society's Silver Medal Award for his contribution to the world of global nutrition and his research on GNUL, that is genetic nutrient interactions, that is collaboration, that is towards implementing multi-ethnic population-based nutrigenetic studies of obesity in lower, lower middle-income countries. His, well, he has received a significant media attention for his work on nutrition, lifestyle, and cardiometabolic disease. Professor Vimal Karani, we are fortunate to have you back at our second International Gut Conference. Now I kindly request you to uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you so much um, for a wonderful introduction, Arita. Um, so without any further delay, let me share the screen. Can you see my slides? Yes, it's visible. Uh, are you seeing the slideshow? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So uh, a very good morning and good afternoon and uh, good evening to everyone who are joining from different parts of the world. So what I'm going to talk to you all today is about um, the translation of nutrigenetic findings to microbiomics to precision nutrition. Well, let's have a look at what I'm going to cover in my talk today. So basically, I'm going to talk about the translation of nutrigenetics to precision nutrition. So we are all aware of the fact that the various lifestyle factors, which includes your dietary exposure or exposure to environmental conditions, your physical activity, which can all interact with various biological intrinsic factors, which includes your genome, your proteome, your transcriptome, your metabolome, your epigenome, and also your microbiome. And all of these factors can interact together and contribute to the development of these cardiometabolic diseases. So the reason why I'm capturing all these aspects is that like gut microbiome doesn't exist on its own and implementing precision nutrition just based on gut microbiome is not an appropriate methodology. So we need to take into consideration of all these factors when talking about precision medicine or precision nutrition approaches. But the key challenging question over here is, how are we going to integrate all that information together? Well, of course, we do have this platform, which is what we call as artificial intelligence or the machine learning algorithms, which can be used for implementing that so-called personalized diet or the precision nutrition approaches. 
So this is exactly what I'm going to cover in my talk today. I'm going to touch upon each and every areas of research. And finally, um, pitching on the public health interventions and how that could lead to the implementation of the precision nutrition approaches. So to begin with, for those who do not have a background in nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics, so what is nutrigenetics? So nutrigenetics basically refers to the study of the impact of the DNA sequence variations on chronic disease outcomes in response to a particular diet. Well, for example, if you have a high genetic risk and you're consuming an unhealthy diet, what is the risk of becoming obese? Or what is the risk of developing obesity? In order to answer that question, we need to understand the interaction between the genetic factor and the dietary consumption. So this study of the gene-diet interaction is what you call as a nutrigenetic study. Whereas nutrigenomics is completely a different area of research. Because as the name implicates, omics refers to the expression and genomics refers to the gene expression. And as you know, nutrigenomics is nothing but the role of nutrients in gene expression, how a particular nutrient or how a particular diet can influence your gene expression. So gene expression is nothing but how your DNA is converted to RNA and RNA to proteins. So these proteins are basically reflecting your phenotype and your phenotype is nothing but the physical representation of an individual, your height, your weight, your BMI, your waist circumference. All these are basically the phenotypes and which are clearly a reflection of your gene expression profile and your gene expression profile is basically regulated by your dietary consumption. So findings from nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics are essential for the implementation of the personalized nutrition or what we call as a precision nutrition approach. That is where you're trying to develop an optimum diet for an individual based on that individual's genetic makeup and the gene expression profile. So this is just a kind of an overview for those who do not have a background in nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. So now starting with nutrigenetic analysis. So nutrigenetics, as I said before, it's nothing but the gene diet interactions. So as part of conducting these nutrigenetic studies, I'm leading two large collaborative network. So one is called as a D-Cardia collaboration, uh, which was initially funded by the British Heart Foundation. To date, we have nearly 35 studies comprising data from different parts of um, uh, the, the UK or U US or European population and also the Australian population and with access to the UK Biobank where we have a half a million people and also with access to various consortia based studies we have a sample size of literally less than two million people and these are some of the publications from the Decardia collaboration. So as you can see, Decardia collaboration is looking at the developed parts of the world but what is happening in developing countries? So as part of conducting the, the nutrigenetic studies in developing countries, I started this Genovin collaboration. Genovin stands for the G-nutrient interactions, which was initially funded by the British Nutrition Foundation. And these are the countries in which I've implemented the nutrigenetic studies for the first time, looking at the impact of the, the genetic factors and the dietary factors in relation to obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases. And what you see in the brackets are basically those funding organizations that have supported all my research activities. So I'm going to briefly touch upon the findings from the D-Cardia collaboration and the Genovin collaboration. So starting with the D-Cardia collaboration. So as the name implicates, D-Cardia stands for the vitamin D, cardiovascular and diabetes related traits. So in this collaborative network, we basically carried out a genetic study. That is, we used a genetic approach to examine the causal relationship. Because there are multiple association studies or general epidemiological studies which have explored the association between the exposure and the outcome. But all these association findings are highly confounded and they're prone to reverse causation. So to overcome all these problems, we used a genetic approach, which is called as a Mendelian randomization study. So this genetic approach, the advantage of this approach is that the genetic associations are less prone to confounding and they are free from reverse causation. So using this genetic approach in this D-Cardia collaboration samples where we have about like 2 million people, we basically looked at the causal relationship between obesity and vitamin D deficiency. You know, there are studies which have shown that high BMI can lead to lower 25-hydroxyvitamin D concentrations. And at the same time, there are studies which have shown that vitamin D deficiency can also lead to obesity. So to answer the question, whether is it obesity that leads to vitamin D deficiency or vice versa, 
we basically conducted this genetic approach and we identified that for every 10% increase in genetically instrumented BMI, there was a 4.2% decrease in 25-hydroxy vitamin D concentrations and which basically showed that obesity leads to vitamin D deficiency, which we published almost 10 years ago. And later on, we wanted to identify whether vitamin D deficiency is leading to any other cardiometabolic diseases. So we looked at the blood pressure and hypertension, and we identified that for every 10% increase in 25-hydroxy vitamin D concentrations, we were able to show that there was a significant drop in systolic and diastolic blood pressures, and also 8% reduced odds of developing hypertension. And that was published in Lancet. And we didn't stop with obesity and cardiovascular disease. We also looked at seven different types of cancers using data from multiple consortia. And we were able to establish a causal relationship between high risk of vitamin D deficiency and increased risk of prostate cancer, and which was published in the British Medical Journal. And then a few years ago, we carried out this study, which is a vitamin D pregnant mother cohort study, where we looked at the micronutrient deficiencies in pregnant mothers. And we wanted to see whether that micronutrient deficiencies had any impact on the newborn anthropometric measurements. And we were able to show that vitamin D deficiency was causally associated with abnormal fetal growth. Now, coming back to obesity. So obesity is kind of like the starting point for the development of various diseases. So using the data from the UK Biobank, where we have 500,000 people, we looked at the causal association between obesity and 925 disease outcomes, which includes a disease outcome from the endocrine system or circulatory system or skin disorders or various other diseases. And using this genetic approach, we were able to establish a causal relationship between obesity, that is genetically instrumented obesity, and 33 disease outcomes. And there has always been a question whether is it depression that causes obesity or is it obesity that causes mental health problems? And we again use this decardia collaboration samples to ex examine that causal relationship. And we were able to show that the genetically um, uh, prone depression was causally associated with obesity. And uh, a couple of years ago, we also looked at the milk consumption and obesity, and we were able to show that high milk consumption was causally associated with increased risk of obesity. So basically, all these findings clearly highlight the fact that obesity is kind of the starting point. So once you become obese, then you're prone to develop various other cardiometabolic diseases and also cancer and various other types of uh, diseases. So starting with obesity, obesity could be the target point for implementing that nutrigenetics or nutrigenomic approaches. So with this background, let's move on to the the, um, let's move on to the genuine collaboration. So looking at the genuine collaboration, which is basically looking at the lower middle income countries or the developing countries. So genuine stands for the G nutrient interactions and it's been nine years since I started this collaborative network. And the main objective is basically to implement the nutrigenetic studies for the first time in ethnically diverse population. So the first study was implemented in the Indian population and then in um, Sri Lanka and then in Indonesia and then in Brazilian population and uh, Ghanaian population, Turkish population, now in Peruvian population. And we are also running several other studies in um, other lower middle income countries in addition to the ongoing collaborations in the developed parts of the world. And these are some of the publications from the Genovan collaboration. So let me touch upon some of the interesting findings from the genuine collaboration. So we all know that we all carry different level of genetic risk in relation to obesity. But just because you carry a genetic risk doesn't mean that you're determined or destined to become obese. You can still overcome that genetic risk by modifying your lifestyle. But we need to understand what is that lifestyle factor that is determining or increasing your genetic risk. So we carried out studies in different parts of the world. So, for example, if you look at the South Asian population, so where you have India and the Sri Lankan population. So we carried out studies in both these populations and we were able to show that nearly one third of the population was consuming more than 500 grams of carbohydrate per day. So, you know, like for the South Asian population, the main source of energy comes from the carbs. So that is exactly what we identified as part of the dietary pattern. So nearly one third of the population was consuming more than 500 grams of carbs per day. And that was shown to increase the genetic risk of obesity. And that's a typical diet of like what we consume 
almost every other day in India or in Sri Lanka. Now, coming to the Southeast Asian population or the West Asian population, that is basically Indonesia or Turkey, there is significant consumption of the meat products. So there is increased consumption of the animal protein. So we observed that nearly one third of these populations were basically consuming more than 140 grams of total protein per day. And that was exactly what was seen in the Brazilian population as well, because they do consume a lot of meat products. So this basically shows that high amounts of protein, of course, protein is good for your body, but exceeding the dietary recommendation, because the dietary recommendation for protein consumption should not exceed more than 75 grams per day. But that was exceedable. I mean, one third of the population was consuming nearly double the amount of what is required for the body. And that was increasing the genetic risk of obesity in these population. That is a basically a typical breakfast for the Indonesian population. And as well as like for the Brazilian population, breakfast, lunch and dinner, they do consume significant amounts of the meat products. Now, coming to the Ghanaian population, which is a West African population, of course, they have a completely different dietary pattern. They do consume a lot of healthy foods, but the healthy foods are basically fried in oil. So that's basically increased consumption of the fat products. So those diets, their diets were basically high in saturated fats. So nearly one third of the population was consuming nearly about 23.5 grams of saturated fat, fat per day, and which was a mean intake. And also the total fat in consumption was exceeding nearly about 47 grams of total fat per day. And that is exactly what you're seeing as a, the diet of the Ghanaian population. The reason why I'm showing this dietary, the differences in the dietary pattern across different parts of the world is that the dietary patterns are not the only thing that is different across different parts of ethnic groups. Even your geographical conditions, your physical activity levels, your genetic makeup, they are all significantly heterogeneous. So given the heterogeneity involved in all these factors together, so doing a nutrigenetic study in each and every ethnic group is highly required. So the genuine collaboration not only restricted to these macronutrient co consumption, but also we, we went into the level of like identifying what is the source of, for example, if it's carbs, is it the added sugar or is it the cereal? Or likewise, if it's fats, is it the saturated fat or unsaturated fat? Likewise, if it's protein consumption, is it the animal protein or the plant protein. So we explored all these factors together as well. So there has always been a kind of a controversy going on. Is it the plant protein which is beneficial or is it the animal protein which is beneficial? So we carried out a study in 2000 Asian Indian um, um, uh, samples and where we identified that the plant protein consumption can overcome the genetic risk of type 2 diabetes. So in this graph, you can see on the x-axis, you have those individuals who are consuming plant protein less than 39 grams per day, and those who are consuming plant proteins more than 39 grams per day. And the black bar is basically those who have a high genetic risk, and the white bar, people who have a low genetic risk. And on the y-axis, you have the fasting plasma glucose. And if you look at those people who are consuming low amounts of plant protein, that is less than 39 grams of plant protein per day, they basically showed an increased risk for type 2 diabetes, especially if they have a high genetic risk. That is, they have significantly higher levels of blood sugar. On the other hand, we also looked at the HbA1c, which is an indicator of type 2 diabetes. And we found that those individuals who are consuming low amounts of plant protein, that is less than 39 grams of plant protein per day and carrying high genetic risk, they had significantly higher levels of glycated hemoglobin. And which is indicative of the fact that consuming plant proteins can overcome the genetic risk of type 2 diabetes. And in fact, like we also looked at the animal protein consumption and we identified that those individuals who are consuming more than 19 grams of animal protein per day, they showed a significantly higher levels of fasting blood sugar and higher levels of HbA1c if they carry a high genetic risk. So in summary, the genuine collaboration provides the first evidence of all these gene diet interactions in relation to obesity in different parts of the world. So in terms of implementing such DNA-based diets, you need to take into consideration of the findings from each and every ethnic group. Because these findings are the ones that can determine the implementation of the precision nutrition in those respective countries. So if you're interested in knowing more about a genuine collaboration, feel free to go into these uh, publications. And these studies basically highlight the fact that 
Um, it's not just with the macronutrients, but also with the micronutrients such as the vitamin B12 or vitamin D or various other studies. And this is another publication which is available online. So now coming to nutrigenomics, so we have seen nutrigenetics, which is the first part of the, uh, the precision nutrition approach. The next stage is basically the nutrigenomics. As I said before, the omics refers to the gene expression. So nutrigenomics is nothing but the study of the role of nutrients in gene expression. So it all, I'm sure you must have heard about this uh, saying, like what you eat is what you are, because what you're eating has got all the nutrients and these nutrients are entering inside your body and reaching your DNA, interacting with your DNA and contributing to the gene expression. And that gene expression is nothing but what you are. So what you eat is what you are, is actually a, a reflection of the nutrigenomic approach. So it all starts with your diet, which has got all the nutrients, macronutrients, micronutrients, and these nutrients eventually need to be absorbed by all the cells. So these nutrients will enter into the cell, reaches the cytoplasm, where it goes and binds to a specific molecule, which is the, basically the transcription factor. So this nutrient will go and bind to the transcription factor. And the main function of the transcription factor is to bind to the nutrient and take the nutrient to the nucleus where you have the DNA. So the nutrient along with this transcription factor binds to the DNA, provides energy to the DNA and nourishes the DNA and converts the DNA or provides energy for the DNA to get converted to RNA and RNA to proteins and proteins to metabolites. So this study of the expression of the RNA in response to a nutrient is what you call as a transcriptomics study. Transcriptomics is nothing but the RNA transcript expression study. And likewise, the study of the expression of the proteins in response to a nutrient is called the proteomics study. And the study of the expression of the metabolites in response to a nutrient is called a metabolomic study. So these omics approaches, genomics, transcriptomics, or proteomics, or metabolomics, they all come under one big umbrella which is what we call as a nutrigenomics. And understanding all these gene expression profiles is very much important because they serve as molecular biomarkers. So identifying these molecular biomarkers will help us to prevent the development of the disease. How? By implementing that so-called the personalized meal plans or the precision nutrition approaches. So this is how you translate the findings from the nutrigenomics to personalized approach. So if you know that you have an abnormal gene expression, so that abnormal gene expression is a reflection of your dietary pattern. So it gives you an opportunity to rectify your dietary pattern, and that automatically rectifies your gene expression profile as well. So this way of providing a personalized diet based on your genetic makeup and your gene expression profile, and that strategy is what we call as the personalized nutrition. So this is basically showing a schematic representation of how the DNA is converted to RNA and RNA to protein. So this conversion from DNA to RNA to protein, it cannot happen on its own. It requires an environmental trigger. And that environmental trigger is nothing but your diet, which has got all the nutrients which can go inside the cell, go to the nucleus, where it can go to the and bind to the DNA and regulates the gene expression and producing all the proteins required for carrying out various metabolic activities. Because all these metabolic activities like carbohydrate metabolism or fatty acid beta oxidation or amino acid metabolism, all these metabolic activities requires a role of the enzymes. And these enzymes are nothing but the proteins which are being produced from these genes. And that gene expression is required through your dietary consumption. So we have seen what is genomics, we have seen transcriptomics, we have seen proteomics. Now let's have a look at metabolomics, because metabolomics is kind of like a very interesting area of research. And at the moment, it's kind of a hot topic. The main reason is that looking at the metabolites is kind of like a true reflection of your dietary pattern, because the metabolites are the end product of your entire metabolic pathways. And there are more than 3000 metabolites which have been discovered. So for each individual looking at 3000 metabolites, it gives you a very good reflection of what kind of a dietary pattern you have. So for conducting a metabolomic approach, which is basically an analytical approach, requires sample from the individuals. So you can collect any kind of a sample. It could be a urine sample or blood sample or a serum sample, or it could also be a fecal sample. It, it entirely depends on your research question. And again, based on your hypothesis and question, you can design the technology that you want to implement. It could be a mass spec or NMR. And once you kind of run the analysis, 
you can basically decide like what kind of a methodology you want to employ. Do you want to look at all the metabolites? Then it becomes an untargeted metabolic metabolomic profiling technology. Or if you want to look at specific metabolites, then it becomes a targeted metabolic profiling technology. So based on that, like once you collect the data, for example, if you're looking at 1000 urine samples and from each sample, you're looking at 3000 metabolites. So the data that you're going to get is going to be huge and massive. So of course, you do have various sophisticated uh, uh, softwares, which can help you with anal analyzing all these metabolic profiling platform uh, results. And that can help you to identify whether the cases have high levels of certain metabolites or whether the controls have low levels of metabolites. And that will basically give you an impression of like what kind of a dietary pattern should be required to overcome the risk of developing such chronic cardiometabolic diseases. So this is basically a study which is an integrated omics approach which has been used for predicting the infant neurodevelopmental outcome. So this is a study that was published almost nearly 10 years ago, but it's a very interesting integrated approach. So what they did was basically they collected the samples from the placental biopsy, and these samples were integrated into the biobank, and where they carried out various multiomics approaches, which included the metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, and epigenomics. And all these data were basically fed into the bioinformatics software which helped them to develop a molecular signature. And that signature or the network was used for predicting the development of the neurodevelopmental outcomes in the infant. And from the infant, they also collected the samples and they integrated into this multi-omics uh, biobank. And this way of a retrospective comparison with the placental samples, with that of the prospective comparison with the neurodevelopmental outcome, that kind of a strategy is what is required for all these chronic diseases. Of course, the neurodevelopmental outcomes are much more very specific and much more straightforward compared to these cardiometabolic diseases such as obesity, diabetes. But a lot of research is going on in this area of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, and also in terms of cancer, whether the multi-omics approaches could be used for predicting the development of these diseases. Because if you know that you're going to develop the disease, it gives you an opportunity for you to develop the onset of the disease. So that's a whole idea behind the precision nutrition. So we have seen nutrigenetics, nutrigenomics, metabolomics. Now let's have a look at nutri-epigenetics. Because uh, the field of nutri-epigenetics, the concept of the epigenetics, it all started off with the animal models, uh, studies that were done in, uh, in mice. So that's why I have this picture over here. But basically, I'm going to focus mainly on the epigenetic approaches that have been done in humans. So epigenetics is considered as a non-genetic area of research. And epigenetics is nothing but the heritable changes in the gene expression. That is how the gene is being expressed. We are just looking at the expression. We are not looking at the genetic sequence. So that's why it's called as a non-genetic approach. It's basically a change in the phenotype without a change in the genotype. There's nothing happening with the gene sequence. There's nothing happening with the DNA sequence. What we are seeing is basically a change in the gene expression. And that change in the gene expression is being induced by the epigenetic modification. And one of the most widely studied epigenetic modification is the DNA methylation. So the DNA methylation is basically where a methyl group is added on to one of the four nucleotides in the DNA. And that nucleotide is a cytosine, so which is what is called as a methylated cytosine. So this methyl group is basically coming from your diet. If you consume a healthy diet, the healthy diet is rich in methyl donors. So these methyl donors will go and add on to cytosine and they control or regulate the gene expression. But if you consume an unhealthy diet, such as the junk foods or fried foods or fast foods, they don't carry any of the methyl donors. If the methyl donors are not available, so there's nothing to bind to the DNA. So the DNA undergoes the gene expression. So the gene expression happens 24 seven, and that can lead to overexpression and overexpression can result in the development of various chronic diseases. Whereas if you're consuming a healthy diet, which is rich in methyl donors, which can go and bind to the DNA, and they prevent the gene expression. And that phenomenon is what you call as the gene silencing. So consuming a healthy diet can regulate your gene regulation of the gene expression, because we don't need the genes to be expressed 24-7. We need the genes to be expressed when you're consuming any food. 
Because once you consume any food, the carbohydrate metabolism should be activated or the fatty acid oxidation pathway should be activated for which you need all the enzymes and proteins. And these proteins are produced from the genes. So only then the genes need to be switched on. That switch on and switch off mechanism is regulated by the DNA methylation and that can happen only when you're consuming a healthy diet. So there's a very strong link between the maternal diet and the fetal growth. A lot of studies have clearly shown that the maternal uh, diet is very important and uh, micronutrient deficiencies or macronutrient deficiencies during pregnancy can have a significant impact on the differential DNA methylation patterns in the fetus, the growing fetus. Because these methylation patterns can be carried over when this fetus becomes an adult and that can lead to the development of various cardiometabolic diseases such as obesity, diabetes, and also like various mental health disorders, decline in the cognition level. So various factors can be influenced because of the maternal diet. So let me show you an example of a, a, a study like where like they have shown a very strong epigenetic link between maternal diet and the fetal growth. Like that's why we say like the first 1000 days of a child's life is crucial because what you do and what you eat in that first 1000 days window, it makes a huge difference for the rest of your life. Because like few studies clearly show that the unbalanced maternal diet during pregnancy can have a significant impact on the fetal growth and that can be carried over to the adulthood where these adults can develop cardiovascular diseases. And also the seasonal variations in the, the methyl donor nutrient intake during the periconceptional period that can also influence the maternal plasma biomarkers and that can result in the changes in the DNA methylation patterns in some of the genes. And also obesity during pregnancy or um, diabetes during pregnancy, that is the gestational diabetes, they can all result in the differential methylation patterns and that can all be carried over to the adult stage leading to various cardiometabolic diseases. And as I said before, the micronutrient deficiencies, deficiencies of B12, vitamin D, they can all influence the DNA methylation pattern. So let me briefly touch upon the study that I mentioned earlier which is a vitamin D pregnant mother cohort study. So this vitamin D pregnant mother cohort study was done in the Indonesian pregnant mothers. So we looked at nearly 200 pregnant mothers and these pregnant mothers were followed up right from the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. And also we, we carried out the newborn anthropometric measurements to identify whether the deficiencies of nutrients during pregnancy have has got any impact on the newborn anthropometric measurements. So the first study basically was done in relation to the vitamin D deficiency. And we identified that there were pregnant mothers in the third trimester. There were some of the pregnant mothers in the third trimester, they had significant vitamin D deficiency that is significantly lower levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D deficiency. And these pregnant mothers had high genetic risk. So those pregnant mothers who had high genetic risk and had low levels of vitamin D, they gave birth to babies which had a small head circumference that is less than 35 centimeter. So you know that the small head circumference at birth is has been shown to be correlated with the development of cardiovascular diseases when these infants become adults. So as I said, the first 1000 days plays a very crucial role and looking at the deficiencies of nutrients need to be, uh, need to be given kind of an attention in terms of taking supplements of vitamin D, which can overcome the genetic risk and prevent the newborn from having any abnormalities. And we didn't stop with just vitamin D, but we also looked at the macronutrients. So in this graph, you can see that on the x-axis, you have the tertiles of carbohydrate consumption, low, medium, and high consumption of carbohydrate. On the y-axis, you find the birth length of the babies. And the black bar, pregnant mothers who have high genetic risk, and the white bar, pregnant mothers with low genetic risk. So in this study, basically, like we identified that those pregnant mothers who were consuming more than 400 grams of carbohydrate per day, and those who had a high genetic risk, they gave birth to babies which had a low birth length. And low birth length at the time of the birth has been shown to be correlated with the development of cardiometabolic diseases, which has been shown in various longitudinal studies, large longitudinal uh, prospective studies. And this is an indication that the epigenetic modifications during this window, the first 1000 days, can make a huge difference. 
So looking at these factors together, the first 1000 days, what you do and what you eat in that particular period of window, it makes a huge difference. So consuming foods which are rich in methyl donors is very much important and consuming a healthy diet is very much important for delaying the onset of various cardiometabolic diseases. So we have seen all these factors and one most important factor is your gut microbiome because the food that you're consuming is not only interacting with your DNA or controlling your gene expression or regulating your metabolite levels or controlling your uh, DNA methylation patterns, but it is also entering into the gut. I'm sure you must have heard a lot about the gut health since morning, but like I'm briefly touching upon how this gut microbiome approach could be linked with the precision nutrition. So your gut microbiome plays a very important role because your, your, your gut health is not only being controlled by your diet, but also in relation to the host genetics. So we all carry nearly two to three kilograms of your gut microbiome, not just the bacteria, but also viruses, phages, and yeast. And these microorganisms are regulated by various factors, the host genetic factors, and your dietary consumption, and various other environmental conditions, your physical activity, and multiple factors. So again, it's gut health is basically kind of... Uh, a uh, factor which is a complex outcome, which is being influenced by multiple factors, not just the genes, but also multiple environmental and lifestyle factors. Now, let's have a look at the role of gut microbiome in health and disease. It's kind of a very busy slide, but I'm just going to make it very simple. So on the left-hand side, that is the pink or the red rectangles that you see, you're basically looking at the impact of the unhealthy diet on gut microbiome. On the right-hand side, it's basically showing the impact of the healthy diet on gut microbiome. So if you're consuming foods which are high in sugar or saturated fatty acids or consuming antibiotics frequently, that can all have an impact on your gut microorganisms. So that can disturb or lead to the gut microbiome dysbiosis, and that can suppress the production of the um, short-chain fatty acids. The three important short-chain fatty acids, acetic acid, butyric acid, and propionic acid, and these short-chain fatty acids which are released from your gut, they are being regulated by your diet. So if you consume unhealthy foods that can suppress the production of these short-chain fatty acids because they play a very important role in maintaining the anaerobic conditions of the gut microbiome, the gut lumen, and also maintaining your health status, your mental health status, your cognition levels, or maintaining your immunity, boosting your immune system, and also preventing the development of obesity, cardiovascular disease, and also diabetes. And also like when you consume dairy products or meat products frequently, they contain this trimethylamine, which is a chemical so which when consumed, it gets oxidized to trimethylamine oxide. So increased levels of trimethylamine oxide has been correlated with the development of the cardiovascular disease. And that's how the gut microbiome plays an important role in relation to the cardiovascular diseases as well. Whereas on the other hand, if you're consuming a healthy diet, that is consuming a lot of vegetables and fruits like fiber-rich diet or consuming probiotics that can all improve your short-chain fatty acids levels and improving your antioxidants and basically improving your lipid metabolic pathways and preventing you from developing cardiovascular disease or improving your insulin sensitivity and decreasing your insulin resistance risk and preventing you from developing type 2 diabetes. So all these factors together because your diet plays a very, very important role. So these are basically the probiotics and the prebiotic foods like which have been classified in terms of uh, improving your gut health. And um, so, of course, like some of the foods might not be available in South Asian population. Of course, these foods are being categorized as those foods which are likely to be available in Indian populations or any other South Asian population and which are likely to improve your gut health. So now we're looking at the intestinal balance for gut health because your gut plays a very important role in maintaining your sleep patterns or mental health status or digestive system or the skin disorders or the immune system. So you need to have a balance, a good balance of the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. So you do have the good bacteria and also the bad bacteria, but like generally the, the, the right balance is basically the 85% of the good bacteria and the 15% of the bad bacteria. But when this proportion proportion changes when the bad bacteria proportion increases and that condition is what you call as the 
gut microbiome dysbiosis. So we need to understand like how, what are the dietary indicators? Like for example, if you're consuming a fat rich diet, consuming too much of the saturated fatty acids, so that can basically increase the levels of the bad bacteria and bringing down the levels of the good bacteria and which can basically lead to obesity and also type two diabetes. On the other hand, consuming a healthy diet, which is a fiber rich diet, consuming a lot of fruits and vegetables and also omega-3 fatty acids and all these kind of uh, healthy diet can basically improve your good bacteria in your body and that can bring about a good balance and maintaining your healthy gut. So this gut microbial balance is very much important and which is a dietary indicator for a, a good healthy status. So what is the impact of the dietary protein on intestinal microbiota? So looking at, because when you're trying to do a personalized approach for an individual, we need to understand what happens, what is the source of the protein? For example, whether what is the impact of the plant protein, what is the impact of the animal protein? So there are several studies which have been carried out like where they have shown that the plant protein has been shown to improve the levels of the good bacteria, so thereby increasing the short chain fatty acids. So which means that that's going to have a significant impact on improving your lipid metabolism and preventing you from developing cardiovascular disease. On the other hand, consuming animal protein can increase the levels of the bad bacteria. So increasing the levels of your TMAO, which is the trimethylamine oxide, so which can basically increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases and also increasing the risk of inflammatory bowel diseases. So people who have inflammatory bowel diseases consuming a plant-based diet can be a better way because it's going to improve your gut barrier pathways and also reducing the inflammation of the gut lumen. So the next one is basically the impact of the dietary fats. Of course, you have different kinds of fats. Like one is basically the good fat and the bad fat. The good fat is nothing but the unsaturated fats. And of course, the bad fat is the saturated fatty acid. So as you can expect, the good fats have been shown to improve the levels of your good bacteria. And whereas the saturated fats have shown to increase the levels of the bad bacteria. And the good bacteria has been shown to reduce the inflammation of the white adipose tissues and also has shown to improve your lipid metabolic pathways, whereas the bad bacteria as shown to increase the le levels of the inflammation in the white adipose tissue and also reducing the insulin sensitivity and increasing the insulin resistance leading to type 2 diabetes. So not just the fat and the protein, but also your lifestyle. Exercise plays a very important role in relation to your gut health. Because recently, like I mean, uh, in our department, we carried out a systematic review trying to understand whether the exercise has got any significant impact on healthy aging through the gut microbiome alteration. And these studies basically, like I mean, the summary of what we came up was, with was basically based on the studies. We were able to show that the exercise or the physical activity levels can modify the bile acids and also improve the production of the short-chain fatty acids, leading to healthy aging through this these gut microbiome alterations. So healthy diet and doing good levels of physical activity is required for overcoming the risk of, or, or delaying the onset of such cardiometabolic diseases. So the various diseases that are associated with the gut dysbiosis. So as I said, the gut dysbiosis is nothing but the imbalance in the gut microbiome. So that imbalance comes basically when the proportion of the good bacteria goes down and the proportion of the bad bacteria increases. So this gut microbiome dysbiosis has been shown to be associated with various diseases, not just obesity or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, but also with cancer or mental health problems like Alzheimer's disease or depression or anxiety and also endocrine diseases such as hypothyroidism or other inflammatory diseases like infl uh, inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease and various other inflammatory problem. So one link is basically between the gut microbiome and diabetes. So before someone develops diabetes, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that there are various stages, a various intermediary phenotype. A person becomes obese and then he, he or she develops insulin resistance. And finally, the person develops type 2 diabetes. So between each phenotype, there are 
I mean, it depends on your lifestyle, whether it could take like five years or six years or 10 years. So this gut microbiome plays a very important role in, in progression from obesity to diabetes. So gut microbiome dysbiosis has been shown to play a very significant role over here because 90% of all diabetes cases, they have shown that the gut microbiome dysbiosis has been shown to enhance a rapid progression of insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. So maintaining a healthy lifestyle. So in, not only just in terms of the prevention, but also in terms of the management, maintaining a good gut health is required for maintaining or suppressing the levels of the blood sugar in, um, in individuals who have type 2 diabetes. So there's also a very strong link between the maternal diet and the gut microbiome, which plays a very important role in maintaining the immune system in the newborn. Because the maternal diet is the one that is regulating the gut microbiome of the fetus as well. And that has shown to maintain the early innate immune system development. And also the, the study that I showed previously, which is about the neurodevelopmental outcomes in the infant. So the maternal diet plays a very important role as well. Now, looking at the maternal obesity, gut microbiome, and the long-term disease risk, so studies have shown that the pregnant mothers who are obese, they are likely to have a disrupted gut microbiota, or in other words, they're likely to have gut microbiome dysbiosis. And this gut microbiome is the one that is being transferred to the fetus, and that can lead to the development of obesity or adverse metabolic health outcomes when the fetus becomes an adult. So the long-term impact is very high. And again, going back to the same fact that the first 1,000 days of a child's life plays a very, very important role, not just in terms of the epigenetic modifications, but also in terms of the gut microbiome. So we came up with kind of an integrated approach. Like, I mean, a few years ago, we published a paper in the British Journal of Nutrition, and we, we kind of uh, planned a pathway or an integrated approach of how to implement a personalized diet, taking into account of the diets or nutrients and genes and microbiome. So it's not just the diet or physiology or the genetics or epigenetics, but also taking into account of the microbial composition, that which is basically determining the individual health. And that is what is required for the implementation of the precision nutrition approach. So this kind of an integrated approach is required for, for promoting the optimal health through personalized nutrition or in terms of implementing that precision uh, nutrition strategies. So looking at the impact of diet or omics related outcomes, so how is that translation taking place with regards to different diseases? Like, for example, if you look at the diet, so of course, the high fiber diet or the metagenomics is nothing but uh, basically your, your gut microbiome sequencing and trying to identify the gut microbial composition, good bacteria and bad bacteria and metabolomics, looking at all the, um, the metabolites and of course, the transcriptomics, looking at all the RNA levels. So basically, if it's a healthy diet, these are the factors that you would look at. And if it's an unhealthy diet, such as a, um, a diet which is rich in meat products or animal products, then again, it's going to increase the levels of TMAO and taking into fact account of all the factors, which are the end products of all the omics related pathways. So you take into account of all these factors and which are being integrated into a model and you're developing precision nutrition. So you know that these kind of diets are going to have these kind of outcomes. So where we have significant evidence from the literature, but what is going to happen to those diseases where we don't have that evidence? For example, if you look at the inflammatory bowel disease, of course, you all know about the different kinds of inflammatory bowel disease. One's, one is a Crohn's disease and the other one is the ulcerative colitis. And this inflammatory bowel disease is highly complex because studying inflammatory bowel disease by itself is kind of like a, a huge, massive approach. Because there's not just one factor, because there are multiple factors. It's not just a physical activity or diet. There's microbiome involved, your medication, the sleep patterns, the hygiene condition, the stress, anxiety, environmental condition. So the two important factors that are relevant with regards to the precision nutrition approach is basically your genetic susceptibility and your diet. And the interaction, understanding the interaction between the diet and the genetic susceptibility with regards to the inflammatory bowel disease is very crucial. So we need to understand what are the genes involved in inflammatory bowel disease. So if you look at the genetics of inflammatory bowel diseases, you can classify them into two different categories. One is called as the monogenic and the other one is called as the polygenic. So monogenic means one gene. 
So there's only one gene involved. So there's just a, a defect in one of the genes can lead to the inflammatory bowel disease. So which is much more a straightforward thing. But the diseases that you are seeing at the clinic or like people who are having ulcerative colitis or, or Crohn's disease, they are basically classified as polygenic, whereas where multiple genes are involved in the development of these inflammatory bowel diseases. It's not one gene or two genes, there are hundreds and hundreds of genes and which are interacting with the environmental factors and contributing to the development of the disease. Just briefly, like, I mean, if you look at the genetics of inflammatory bowel disease, the whole network which is connecting all the IBD genes and the pathways which are basically controlling the mucosal immunity is highly complex. Because as you can see, like each pathway is interconnected with each other. One focusing on the gut barrier and one focusing on the cytokine signaling pathway. The other one looking at the immune system regulation. The other one is a microbial sensing. So let me put that into different categories. So basically, diabetes risk genes are involved in various pathways. So one pathway is basically the microbial sensing. The other one is a gut barrier integrity. The other one is the adaptive immunity. And also looking at the inflammatory pathways and cytokine signaling. And this just to highlight the fact that how complex the inflammatory bowel disease is. If you look at each and every pathway, there are hundreds and hundreds of genes which are coding for different proteins which are required for maintaining the adaptive immunity or cytokine signaling pathways or microbial sensing or maintaining the gut barrier pathways. So to make this more in a simplified way, the genetics of the inflammatory bowel disease has been taken under control by the UK IBD Genetics Consortium. The IBD stands for the inflammatory bowel disease. So they started this genetic consortium mainly to identify the genes that can lead some people to develop IBD. Why only some people are developing Crohn's? Why some people are developing ulcerative colitis? And some cases like where it's very difficult to differentiate like who is, whether the person has got Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And likewise, it's difficult to identify genes like that can predict the progression of the disease. So for example, the disease, people who have the disease, how well are they maintaining? And that maintenance, is it based on just medication or in relation to the genetic susceptibility? So there are certain genes which play a very crucial role and the level, the severity and the symptoms involved in the disease varies from one person to another person. And also to identify genes that are responsible for the drug response and intolerance. Because there are some drugs such as the mesocol and asacol which are being given to the inflammatory bowel disease patients. Because some in inflammatory bowel disease patients, they respond quite well to the mesocol, whereas some respond well to the asacol. And that difference comes down to your differences or heterogeneity that exist in your genetic makeup. So in terms of looking at all these genes, there are certain genes for Crohn's disease, there are certain genes for ulcerative colitis, and again, there are certain genes which overlap both the Crohn's as well as the ulcerative colitis. So as you can see, the whole genetics architecture is very complex for the inflammatory bowel disease. So looking at the nutri genetics of inflammatory bowel disease, given that the fact of, given the fact that the genetics of inflammatory bowel disease is so complex and complicated, Using the nutrigenetics findings to implement precision nutrition is at the moment questionable and also debatable. So that is exactly the reason why these kind of multi-omics technologies or precision nutrition approaches are used for various cardiometabolic diseases such as obesity or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, where the, the approach is much more straightforward because inflammatory bowel disease, on the other hand, it's very complex. And of course, a lot of research needs to be carried out to identify what are the genes. Whereas for obesity, we know that these are the genes which are available at the moment. Of course, they do not capture the entire variations of obesity, but still, to some extent, we know that these technologies will definitely work. Like, for example, proteomics, microbiomics, and metagenomics or metabolomics, all these can work together in terms of implementing the precision nutrition approaches, not only for the prevention, but also management of obesity or diabetes. So the, for, the I'm not saying the process is very straightforward and very simple, but it is complex. But at the same time, we know what we're doing with regards to these diseases. Whereas with the inflammatory bowel disease or various other diseases, the inflammation-related problems, the, the multi-omics approaches or the precision nutrition approaches are still under debate. And now looking at this 
the translation from nutrigenetics to precision nutrition. So we have seen the four different networks starting right from the, the diet which is entering into your genes and that study is what you call as a gene diet interaction and the diet which is entering into your uh, the metabolite expression pathway and that area of research is called as a nutri metabolomics and of course it also interacts with your gut lumen the microorganisms in the gut lumen and that area of research is called the metagenomics understanding the gut microbial uh, composition and last but not least which is the epigenetic modifications how the diet can influence the dna methylation patterns so as soon as you consume any food, all these four compartments are functioning in parallel. So when you're trying to implement a precision nutrition approach, you need to look at it as a four-way interaction, which is called as a metagenome, hyperbolome, epigenome, diet interaction. And understanding this interaction is required for the implementation of the precision nutrition. If you're able to identify this interaction, then you're bringing about a revolution in the field of the nutritional science because the key challenge is how are we going to integrate all that information into one cooking vessel and how are we going to develop a personalized diet? So how is that possible? So that's possible with the help of the artificial intelligence and the machine learning approaches that we have and how we can implement that to develop the personalized diets for people. So there are various kinds of approaches. One is a traditional statistical approach and the other one is a machine learning approach. So doing a deep phenotyping that is not only just looking at your uh, nutrigenetics or nutrimetabolomics or gut microbiome or epigenetics, but also looking into your lifestyle, your age, your stress, the first 1000 days and whatever trauma you have been through and all the personal data. So getting all that information together and integrating that information into one model, you can do two analysis. One is basically the traditional statistical analysis and the other one is basically the machine learning approach. So I'm not going to go into the technical details of how you do that, but you have like two kinds of strategies. One is a supervised learning where you're using kind of a standard reference data that is available and you're trying to do a machine learning approach. And second one is an unsupervised learning where you don't have a reference and you're just starting based on the data that you've collected. So there are different kinds of methodologies which are available for developing that machine learning algorithms for defining the personalized diets. So the precision nutrition in the era of artificial intelligence. So as I said before, in this figure, you can see that on the right hand side, there are some approaches which I've touched in this lecture, which is on genetics, epigenetics, microbiome, metabolomics, proteomics, diet and physical activity. But on the other side, there are various other factors which have not touched upon. One is basically your stress pattern, your anxiety, your sleep patterns, your socioeconomic status, social factors, play a very, very important role. Like where exactly are you located? Are you located to a supermarket? Are you located to a fast food restaurant? Does that mean that you're going to the fast food restaurant frequently? So looking at all the supermarkets and restaurants in your neighborhood, and that can all influence your prevalence of obesity in that particular area. So all these factors need to be taken into consideration. And that's exactly what I call as a deep phenotyping. So deep phenotyping of all these measurements and taking into consideration of developing a model, and that is possible with the help of the artificial intelligence powered decision making models or in simple terms, machine learning algorithms. And that is required for the implementation of the personalized nutrition approaches or the precision nutrition approaches. But if you ask me where exactly we are with regards to the precision nutrition, a lot of work is going on in progress. And we are very far from implementation, but of course we have advanced so far with the, with the advancement in the area of gut microbiome and also in genetic technologies. So if you ask me the question, precision nutrition, is it hype or hope? Definitely it's hope because that's exactly what we are hoping for because there are a lot of companies, they are already practicing the precision nutrition approaches. Like, I mean, not exactly precision nutrition, but they're using the genetic data to define dietary recommendations or uh, dietary regimens for people based on the genetic susceptibility. But like what I'm promoting is more of a precision nutrition, which should take into account of nutrigenomics, nutrigenetics, metabolomics, gut microbiome, the, the uh, an individual's uh, food behavior, dietary patterns or dietary habits. So basically we should consider that as a precision nutrition plate. And that is what is going to prevent or delay the onset of all these cardiometabolic diseases. So on this note, I would like to thank um, all my collaborators who have supported with my research and also thank you all so much for listening to my talk and happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vimal Karani, for that in enlightening session on omics to precision uh, nutritional with, uh, of course, a wonderful uh, visual representation. So now we have a few questions. Uh, so let me take the first question on genes. It's, uh, mm -hmm. The question is, if a gene can trigger bubble disease, uh, once it's tested and cured, are there any chances of recurrence? So, so you have to understand that the, the genetic makeup, the, the level of the genetic risk, like people can fall into three categories. Either they can be a low genetic risk individual or a moderate genetic risk or high genetic risk. So that genetic risk is defined as soon as you are born. From the day one of your life, that genetic risk is defined. You cannot change that genetic risk. What you can change is your lifestyle. So if you know that you have a high genetic risk and you're able to bring about a lifestyle modification or intervening uh, your lifestyle with regards to overcoming that genetic risk, then that can overcome the risk of developing the disease. But if you have already developed the disease and you know that you have a high genetic risk, and also in terms of the management or suppressor symptoms of the disease, a lifestyle modification can help. But there's no way you, because these are all chronic diseases. Once you develop the chronic disease, you're going to live with the disease until the last day of your life. What you're doing is basically bringing down the sugar level for type 2 diabetic patients or maintaining a healthy weight like people who are obese or like inflammatory bowel disease. You're basically um, stopping the, the diarrhea or a blood on the stools. So these kind of symptoms are being stopped or prevented through the lifestyle modification. But the disease is already there. It's just waiting for the trigger. The moment you change or go back to an unhealthy lifestyle, that's going to come up again. So you cannot change your genes. What you can change is your lifestyle behavior. Uh, we have a next question. It's from uh, Sophia and Rambe. Mm -hmm. Asks, with all of these advancements in omic technologies, how would you predict the development of epigenetic rejuvenation with reference to biological aging by modulating DNA methylation using certain methyl donor and other substrates? Um, I'm not sure whether I'm getting the question clearly because there are too many questions within too many one. Questions. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so how would you predict the development of epigenetic rejuvenation? rejuvenation. So, yeah. So um, this can be put in this way. So the epigenetic modifications are basically regulated by your dietary consumption. So if you're able to identify that you have a high genetic risk, because this, as I said, epigenetics is a non-genetic area of research and your uh, nutrigenetics is completely a genetic approach. But these areas of research, the reason why I'm talking about precision nutrition is these are all interconnected with each other. Because if you talk about nutrigenetics, I'm talking about the genetic risk. So genetic risk or the genetic variation could be in a region where exactly that DNA methylation can happen. So if there is a defect in the region where that methyl donors are going to bind, then that can significantly impact. Like even if you're consuming a healthy diet, that can again go back to the fact that you have a defect in your nutrigenetic pathway. So predicting the risk of developing epigenetics related diseases, that can again be defined based on the nutrigenetic pathways as well. And because they are all interconnected with each other. So there's no way that you can define a diet, a personalized diet just based on epigenetics or diet which can be personalized based on nutrigenetics. I don't encourage that at all because this has to be more of a holistic pathway. And that is how we have to progress in this area. The same participant has another interesting general question rather. Yeah. Do you think that during the evolutionary process, uh, there is a possibility that Homo sapiens have lost some of their genetic makeup in such a way that contributes to the tendency that the modern people almost lost their metabolic flexibility and resiliency? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say that they have lost some of the genetic makeup, but definitely there has been changes in the genome. And that takes like, I mean, that takes place over a very long period of time. There are changes in the DNA, in the sequence, and that has brought about like, that is making the entire population, that's basically happening through um, the mixing up of the population or genetic admixture. That's exactly what we say. So, um, and I don't think people have lost their metabolic flexibility and resiliency, but that possibly could be mainly because of the urbanization and the environmental influence. So there's nothing that can happen only with the genes. It can happen only under the influence of the environmental 
uh, condition. So as long as you're not going to provide any obesogenic environment, you're going to remain healthy. The moment you interfere with that obesogenic environment, and that is the trigger or the stimulant for the development of various cardiometabolic diseases or even cancer. Let's take the last question on AI. Is there yes. any AI app related to precision nutri nutrition other than ChatGPT? Definitely not, because like I have to say that, as I said in my talk, precision nutrition is very much in an infant stage because a lot of companies are saying that we are providing a precision nutrition app. They are not providing any precision nutrition app. Precision nutrition involves nutrigenetics, metabolomics, gut microbiome, and epigenetics. I don't think there's any app in this world that takes into account of all these four factors, along with all the lifestyle and social factors. So the answer is no. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vimal. And uh, we'll conclude the session here. On behalf yeah, thank of you the organizing much. team, I thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Participants, next we have uh, Dr. Chandan. Dr. Chandan, MBBS MD Dermatologist, a functional medicine practitioner. He is going to address on the topic revealing the connection between gut microbiome and uh, skin disorders. Dr. Chandan uh, is a medical director at uh, Anya Skin Clinic. He is a trainer for Botox and uh, fillers. His special interests are exosomes, bioidentical hormone replacement, IV nutrition anti-aging and regenerative therapies, peptides, medical ozone, metabolic medicine, and chronic disease reversal. Dr. Chandan, I welcome you, and you may kindly proceed with your session. Good evening. Uh, is the screen visible? So the slide is visible. You could just uh, switch to presentation mode. Yeah. We have to go play. Yeah. Oh, yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Rita. So if you heard what Dr. Rita said about me, it's all about I'm a cosmetic dermatologist, basically. So what am I doing here talking about the gut? Whatever little I know about the gut is all learned from Dr. Praveen and the others that are there here. In fact, I've learned a lot more today sitting from the morning here and listening to all these talks. It was wonderful. And I hope you keep doing a lot of lot more uh, workshops and uh, conferences like this. Now, the skin and the gastrointestinal, a lot of similarities are there. One is the surface area of the skin, if you look at it, it's about 25 meters square. And the gut also is similar, about 30 meters square. And the, the other thing is the skin is your outermost barrier. It's the first barrier against the outer environment. And the gut is your innermost, wherein it is constantly acting between the food that you eat. They're both very, very similar in purpose and function. Both are very highly vascularized and innervated. They're both essential for neuroendocrine function. The inner surface of the gut and the outer surface of the gut has one more similarity, wherein they are both have epithelial cells. Now, there's something which we missed when we talked about the skin. Remember, I said 25 meters square, but that is only the surface area of the skin. Now, if you take into consideration the open pores, as well as the hair follicles that are there, 
the surface area of the skin becomes 10 times greater than what actually measured. So why I'm stressing on this is, this is the actual area that is available for the microbiome to colonize or thrive on. So there are a lot of dermatological conditions which manifest as a part of dysbiosis. Now skin, we always used to say we have a rosy complexion or a radiant uh, glow or radiant skin. That means it's healthy. And uh, paler, which, is, which also means that you know, you're malnourished or you're sick and jaundiced is liver. When you look at the skin, the composition of the microbiome of the skin and the gut slightly different. In the gut, when you have healthy states, you have a lot of lactobacillus, bifidobacteria and streptococcus, which are abundant. Whereas if you have a gut which is diseased, then you have clostridium, enterococcus and H. pylori. Skin is slightly different. It depends on the area of the skin. So if it is an oily area like the forehead, the microbiome is slightly different. If it is a moist area, it's different. Whereas when you compare it to a dry area like your forearm, the composition is different. Now the other thing which is very important in your skin is if you have a oily skin or I would say more than oily, uh, moist skin, the colony count is also much, much higher than what you would find on a dry skin surface. So what actually determines the colony count? And the microbiome on the skin is one is your hydration, then the skin pH, and then what you're applying and what you come in contact with. All this also is very, very important. Now, utilization of soaps. Post-COVID, we have all become very, very sanitized, friendly people. So I see a lot of eczema of the hand, which never used to be there previously because of this over and zealous use of hand washing and sanitizers. So you have to remember the microbiome on the skin. Even if you wash it with plain water, like you had food and just wash your hands, it's getting washed off and it will take about four hours for it to get replaced. If you keep washing it every three hours or four hours because you've touched something and you want to be clean and all that, your skin is never going to have a microbiome. This will make you more prone for anything that you come in contact with will be able to enter the skin very easily and it'll, it's going to damage your skin. So once your skin is damaged, then it becomes very, very easy and becomes a spiral where a lot of skin diseases can start happening. So typical women in a daily basis comes in contact with about 100 chemicals through soap, cosmetics, lipsticks, everything. So homeostasis is what we are looking at when we talk about the skin. Now, vitamin D is very important in maintaining this homeostasis of the skin because what vitamin D does is it increases the diversity of the microbiome. So if you are vitamin D deficient, then the diversity of the microbiome is very less. So these are the common diseases that we look at, which have studies and which we know that can be caused by the gut microbiome disruption. So one is atopic dermatitis, an acne, which is routinely, a lot of us would have gone through that as a teenager. Now we have adults who come up with acne. Then psoriasis, a lot of people had discussed psoriasis. Dandruff is another thing, seborrheic dermatitis. Then rosacea and even aging. We can reverse slow down aging by just taking care of your microbiome. Now, what exactly happens? How does the gut microbiome act on something very far away, which is the skin? This gut is the innermost layer and the skin is the outermost layer. So what is the connection between these two things? So what happens is there is an alteration in the gut microbial composition, which dysbiosis has already started. Now, dysbiosis is started and then 
your microbiomes cross the intestinal barrier where they start producing toxins and neurotransmitters. Now, these toxins and neurotransmitters have a response or alteration in your B and T cells and they decrease your IgA secretion. When all this happens, your, then they enter the circulatory system, your blood and the lymph. Then you have dysbiosis, your microbial AMPs get lower. This goes to the skin and this dysbiotic skin microbiomes trigger skin inflammation. So this can lead to psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, rosacea, alopecia areata, and hydrogenitis parietiva. So this is another example where on the left, if you see, if you have a healthy gut and you have a lot of short chain fatty acids and vitamin D, not much of gluten in your diet, you have an anti-inflammatory environment, everything, the tight junctions are normal, your blood vessels are not leaking, there's no leaky gut and there's no inflammation in the skin. But when you have dysbiosis due to diet, then you have a deficiency of vitamin D and short chain fatty acids. And then there's a lot of gluten in the diet. Then your T regulatory cells are suppressed, which can lead to leaky gut, systemic inflammation, inflammation in the skin. That again, when you give probiotics or through whatever modalities that a lot of people have discussed from day, right from the morning, you correct the dysbiosis, and then your T regulatory cells become normal, then you can heal the leaky gut and the skin will become normal again. Now, when we talk of gluten, we only think of gluten, but there is something called as cross reactivity to the food. So, when you say somebody is intolerant to gluten, all these foods are also cross-reacting to gluten. So, just by avoiding gluten, they are not seeing any improvement. That means that they have some cross-reactivity and they have to avoid certain other foods also, which will make them improve better. Now, this is a this was an interesting slide when I was preparing for the talk. Uh, I heard of the gut and the brain axis. And then when I was looking at this slide and uh, I saw gut, brain, skin axis. Now I thought maybe this is a recent thing that has come in. But in fact, this paper was published in 1930 where they were mentioned the gut, brain, skin axis. It's almost 100 years old. The only thing is we, are, we don't access things, we're not aware or maybe it's just getting pushed away to the side. No, this is knowledge which has been around for a long time. Only that never have we looked at it in this way to look at the gut, brain and the skin axis. So what exactly is happening is in emotional states like depression, worry or anxiety, there is an altered gastrointestinal tract function and then that causes the microbial flora to kind of go into dysbiosis, which in turn promotes local and systemic inflammation. So what is the inflammatory changes that you can say uh, in the skin? You can get something like a rash or you can get a redness or you can just have dry skin coming out. But these are all basically because the gut microbiome has been altered. And when they measure the inflammatory cytokines in psoriasis and depression, they're almost similar. The inflammatory cytokines in psoriasis and depression are both the same, which helps us to reinforce this gut brain skin axis. So when you talk about autoimmunity, there's another thing that I want you to understand, which is inflammation as a symptom is a body's response to microcontaminants. Okay. We traditionally have been taught that in autoimmunity, body is attacking itself. But this is not true. The body is not attacking itself. The body is attacking the microcontaminants that have entered the organ or the system. So when you have a long-term nutrient deficiency, and depletion of that particular or accumulation of a bad microcontaminant or a waste in the body. That is when you start aging and when disease starts. If you cannot remove the microcontaminants from your cells, 
the very effective way to isolate them is by storing them in fat so body tries to store all the toxins so toxins your fat cells are loaded with toxins so obesity the more toxins you have the more obese you will become so what is homeostasis i talked about skin homeostasis this is a physical physiological state which keeps us alive so whenever you try your body tries to go off into a different direction it just gets pulled back to be in a normal state that is what the body is trying to do always for example when you maintain homeostasis the body can activate your hormones or even your nervous system metabolites like cortisol adrenaline all that get released so whenever you have a flight or a flight response cortisol can get released but this should only happen for a small period of time it should not be that the flight and the flight response or a stress has happened for you and then the level should come back to normal if the level does not come back to normal then you go into a allostatic load where there is chronic overuse and imbalance in this mediators so if you have too much cortisol or too little cortisol which continues over weeks or months then the allostatic load is too much your body will not be able to maintain itself in homeostasis i'm just giving you one example there are a lot of other things that you can have so for example when you talk about good stress you want to go to a job interview or a school admission or giving a talk so when you feel rewarded after that you done you gone for a interview and then you get the job and you feel rewarded that's good stress now you are unsuccessful you try to attend a job interview you try to change jobs or you lost your job or somebody close to you has passed away that is tolerable stress but if you have a good support system you can overcome this tolerable stress but there's something called toxic stress wherein your health is deteriorated you feel that there is no lack of control in your life and then your sleep is not good so what happens when you get all these things when you have toxic stress your gut microbiome is going to be altered then the skin homeostasis and allostasis can no longer be there and it goes into dysbiosis this dysbiosis leads to various conditions now this is an example of acne where you have psychological stress and you add high fat diet to that then your gut microbiome is getting altered and compromised there is a change in the gut microbiome then you have a loss of the microbial biofilm which causes leaky gut which can lead to insulin resistance and then you go on to excess sebum production and acne will develop but the problem is as a dermatologist or whatever whenever i see i am targeting this area where i am targeting the excess sebum or the lesions that i see on the skin that was what we try to do we try to put them on a laser or a chemical peel or um, you know isotretinoin there are a lot of tablets or doxycycline which is an antibiotic all that can be given but what we should be actually targeting for a long term benefit and better results is the lifestyle modification with the diet reduce your stress and correct the gut microbiota now why is acne so important because this is a study that was done in 13000 people more likely acne patients were more likely to have constipation halitosis and gastric reflux abdominal bloating hypochlorhydria i mean 37 to 40% of the people having all this gastrointestinal symptoms and then we are not even targeting any of this when we as a dermatologist we never do this that is why you know it's very important that you target the gut when we treat acne now this is the study that i was talking about which cause which told us about the gut brain skin hypoxia stokes and filsbury they did this in 1930 in 1930 they have come out and said that hypochlorhydria causes migration of bacteria from the colon to the distal parts of the small intestine so the intestinal microflora is altered 
and this increases the instant permeability, which states the state for local skin inflammation. Now, what they were actually told in 1930 is acidophilus organisms in culture. So, they have advocated a probiotic drink and omega-3 fatty acids. There was a study which was actually done with acidophilus and bulgaricus. They had given it for eight days, given a break for two weeks, and then again for eight days, which gave an 80% improvement in inflammatory acne. That is a tremendous result that they have got. Then lactobacillus fermented drink alone, there was a market reduction in sebum production and total lesion count. So this is another study with acne, which is the same thing that I discussed about with 80% uh, inflammatory acne reduction. Then this is a case report on psoriasis with severe pustular psoriasis, very difficult to treat as a dermatologist, pustular psoriasis. They've given sporogenes for that and within 15, four, four weeks, complete clearance of the lesions. Then the other study is about plaque psoriasis where again, probiotics, They've measured the inflammatory markers and they've shown that the CRP is reduced, the TNF alpha is reduced. Then acne, again, this is a study where they have given lactobacillus and a bifidobacterium. Significant. This was a study where they have given the probiotic along with antibiotic and with the antibiotic alone. Then they uh, noticed that the probiotic group had better results than the antibiotic alone. So this was for anti-aging. For dry skin and wrinkles, only probiotic was given, which increased skin hydration and reduced the wrinkle depth in the skin. So I do routinely Botox and fillers. So I, I thought I should also add probiotics to my patients to get better results. This is the last study. Again, adult acne, this is, which improved by decreasing the Factors which cause acne. So IGF-1 has decreased expression. So that way the acne has been normalized by just giving rhamnosis for 12 weeks. So acne, we know that there is a decrease in the firmicutes and increase in bacteroids. Atopic dermatitis, we have higher levels of fecalibacterium and low levels of acromensia. So the remarks from all this, this is a compilation of studies. The remarks from all this is probiotic consumption can actually prevent atopic dermatitis. Psoriasis, there is a change in the beta diversity. So we know that if you give vitamin D, in whichever cases of psoriasis, this beta diversity is low. The vitamin D can improve the diversity of the microbiome. So rosacea is again associated with SIBO, which is hypochlorhydria. And uh, Dr. Praveen gave a detailed talk on that. So what are the effects of some of these metabolites that we have on the gut and as well as on the skin? So short chain fatty acids have both anti-inflammatory effects on the gut and the skin. Vitamin D, we don't know what the effect is in the skin is. Dopamine is, it modulates the neurotransmitter. Serotonin, again, neurotransmitter modulation. So gluten, if you look at it, if you take gluten, the gut, you get celiac disease. But in the skin, you get, there's a disease called dermatitis hepatiformis, which we get skin rashes. So once you stop gluten, the rash stops. Whatever you do, it doesn't stop otherwise. So, picalibacterium, acarmensia, all this can protect against storiasis. H. pylori, we know that it's for rosacea. Then atopic dermatitis, again, picalibacterium. Then lactobacillus KCI can decrease skin inflammation. Paracaceae can reduce the size of the acne lesions.
So this is again one more uh, slide that I was very interested in because uh, as you grow older, this is with regard to aging. As we grow older, if you look at the top part of the slide, the, when the mucus layer is intact, it's much thicker. But as you grow older, the mucus layer also shrinks. So it's easy, more easy to damage the layer in older people than when you have a healthy younger adult which is going through this. So the shrinkage of the mucus layer allows all the microbial translocation to go in faster. And then that is why aging is also taking place. So how do you treat the skin on the gut? Look at whole body nourishment, not just specific with a varied diet. Look at augmenting the whole microbiome, not just 10 species or 15 species. You have to look at a way of controlling micro contaminants and remove them. Sustain the integrity of the individual microbiome communities. So minimize stress, optimize sleep and reduce your allostatic load. A lot of skin diseases, we always tell stress, stress, stress. So that is very important when it comes to skin conditions. Proper hydration is again one more thing that we have to look at. So what happens in a lot of obese patients that I see, they are only thirsty, but they can't differentiate between thirst and hunger. So they just start eating. So if you ask them to increase the water intake, automatically that food that they consume is also going to come down. And avoid excess hygiene with antimicrobials. So avoid fluorine, chloramine exposure, both topically. And detox. Detox. Skin is a very good organ for detoxing along with your liver and your gut and the kidneys. Make sure your detox pathways are working well. Only then will we be able to sustain the results that we obtain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandan, for the very informative uh, presentation. Uh, we have three questions related to your presentation. Could we go ahead? Yeah. So this is related to gene switch uh, and aging. So can we switch off genes of aging in the future? Yes. Fun. Let's take the next question. Uh, so the epigenetic is... switch can always be switched on and switched off based on the diet and the lifestyle modifications. So a lot of people in the same family, if you look at it, they'll have the same genetic makeup, but only certain people will develop the disease. Mm -hmm. So you need something to come in from the environment and turn on the switch before you start manifesting a disease process. So this switch which has been turned on can always be turned off again. So this is what is very important for you to identify what has caused this and switch it off. The next question is related to microcontaminants. So in case of autoimmune disease, if you mentioned that it's actually the body that's attacking the microcontaminants that have entered the organ or the system. Uh, could you please briefly explain what sort of my microcontaminants? Is it pathogenic agent or a toxic substance? I'm not sure because I just recently started reading on it. I'll have to read more about this. But it, it, it may, it, what they are saying is it's a bacterial milieu which is completely being uh, different. And that is where you need to target. They're saying that autoimmunity is basically nothing to do with your body attacking yourself. It is targeting these microcontaminants and producing, like for example, if you take gluten itself, for example, so we know that gluten is not digestible completely. So the body is producing antibodies to this, trying to uh, suppress the inflammation. So this is what is happening. So body is not attacking 
anything. It's just trying to suppress and keep it segregated. But the more the levels go, and if you do a food intolerance test, you will get a lot of false positives because your system is no longer working properly once you start uh, crossing a certain level. So once you stop the food and elimination diet or something like that, and you restart, the true contaminants you will react to still. But the false contaminants you will not react to. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Swara. She asks, is vitiligo associated with this gut uh, brain skin axis? Vitiligo is also considered autoimmunity. Yes, it, uh, it is uh, associated. See, generally speaking, there's nothing wrong with your skin. That is what I tell all my patients also. Whatever you see on the skin, there's something wrong inside, either the gut or some other part of your body. It is just reflected on your skin. That's all. So vitiligo, you will have a HPA axis suppression. You will have an adrenal suppression. Vitiligo, you, usually the problem is not even in that person. The mother, when she was pregnant with the child, she would have had a lot of stress and her HPA axis would have been suppressed. Uh, so let's take the last question, doctor. This is about the probiotic prescriptions for a few... Uh, dermatological conditions, skin diseases? The idea of using a probiotic which has is only for a short period of time. I generally don't use probiotics in the long run because you have to keep changing. Otherwise, you will keep increasing only those strains. So that is not a good idea to be doing it. You have to look at increasing the diversity either through food or increasing your short chain fatty acid or you have um, stray, substrata like uh, fulvic acid and all that which you can give which nourishes your microbiome. So something like that in the long run is what you have to look at. If you're going to use a probiotic, use it only for six weeks and then change the strain. Don't keep using the same one for a long period of time. Uh, this product, Yakult, has quite been in uh, you know limelight because of uh, the endorsements. What is your take on that? Uh, not in the long run. You need to nourish the whole microbiome, not just specific strains. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Santan, for all the uh, answering all our queries and for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear participant, we now move on to our next presentation. Uh, it's an approach on uh, and management of pediatric uh, conditions in relation to gut health. We are fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. P.V. Samsuddin. Uh, with his extensive uh, background and highlights, significant expertise in educational and achievements in healthcare administration, pediatric medicine, and specialized domains, including palliative medicine and gut health. Dr. Uh, Samsuddin uh, has uh, worked as a deputy medical superintendent consultant pediatrician uh, at, at Azizi Medical College Hospital in Kolam, Kerala. He was holding ex esteemed positions of executive directors, director at uh, Miras Hospital, uh, which is located in Calicut, Kerala. He is an MBBS uh, medical graduate who holds diploma in uh, child health nutrition, uh, postgraduate diploma in adolescent uh, pediatrics, he has done his uh, master's in uh, hospital administration, and uh, he is a certified practitioner in nutritional medicine and uh, gut health. So uh, welcome to the uh, conference, and I kind of request you to proceed with your presentation. Thank you.
Yes. Is it clear? No, your slides are not visible. Okay. You could share the slides. Have to share the screen. No, okay. No. The slides are not visible. Yet. Sir, if you have any issues, we can share the slides, sir. All right, wait, sir. But no. Yes. No. The slides are visible. Yes. You could just start from the beginning. Yes. Oh. Okay, it's the beginning slide. Yes. Okay. Good evening, all. Today I have the privilege to discuss the topic of pediatric allergy, asthma, and eczema: a global burden and prevention. Before delivering this important topic, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to organizers for affording me this valuable opportunity to present. Allergic disease, including asthma and eczema, are increasing globally. Allergic diseases such as running nose, asthma, urticaria, and eczema are increasing. In developed countries, approximately 25% of the population are diagnosed conditions like allergic rhinitis, asthma, or eczema. Causes of allergic conditions associated with asthma. I'm not going the conventional or the classical causes. I am going directly to the new research regarding the importance of vitamin D and gut microbiome. And regarding the treatment and prevention of asthma and allergy, in conventional, immediately control the cause, then prevention by medicine by relieving medication, either inhaler or oral medication, and non-medical preventive measures such as avoidance of allergens, improving indoor air quality, avoiding respiratory irritants, and lifestyle modification. Now, we are coming with the prevention by improving gut microbiome status, adding probiotics, prebiotics, and vitamin D. I'm presenting a case an 11-month-old male infant presented with a history of wheezing, persisting for past three weeks, accompanied by post-tussive vomiting. Prior to this consultation, the child had received treatment from outside hospital, which included antibiotics, bronchodilator syrup, and an embolization with the body cord for five days. While this treatment provided temporary relief, wheezing resumed upon discontinuation of nebulization. The, since the six months onwards, repeatedly the baby is getting infection and treating accordingly. In this scenario, they came to our hospital after 10 days after the completion from that hospital. On examination, the baby afebrile, SPO2 level 95%. Weight 7.5 kg, birth weight 2.5 normal, and length of normal. No signs of lymphadenopathy, pulse 92 per minute, respiratory rate 30 per minute. No use of accessory muscles. Bilateral wheezing was noted on chest auscultation, but there was no crepitation. Additionally, there were no signs of organomegaly in the abdomen. The child born to a primary mother delivered vaginally non-consanguineous ma marriage. There is no family history of wheezing or allergies. On investigation, before investigation in the history, the baby is fed since exclusively formula since the neonatal period as breastfed attempted by the mother but unsuccessful 
due to various reasons. Then we begin at six months age and introduce wheat, ragi, as well as biscuit. And lab investigation, hemoglobin 11 gram percent, total WS count uh, 6,800 cells per cubic millimeter, polymorph 46%, lymphocyte 48%, eosinophils 4%, and monocyte 2%, platelet adequate, ESR normal, chest x has no features for consolidation. And when came to our hospital, we treated with nebulization with a BD cord along with oxygen twice daily for three days. Uh, Levosalbutamol syrup and probiotic containing lactobacillus, rhamnoses, and bifidobacterium species. And a diet advice to discontinue wheat product, including biscuit. And from the third day, we stopped the nebulization and child is active and post passive vomiting is completely cured. And liver salbutamol syrup stop on the day six. The child is continuing with now the child uh, after that the child is continuing with the probiotic with the lactobacillus rhamnosus and bifidobacterium species probiotic they are continue continuing. The last uh, one month the child had, has no recurrence. Our plan is check vitamin D status. We didn't check and we should continue the probiotic for the next two months and see the response. Then regarding the role of vitamin D, both the maternal D status during pregnancy period and non adequate vitamin D level during childhood association with asthma and allergy. In the previous discussions are also clearly mentioned the role of vitamin D in the microbiome. Formation of gut microbiome. The establishment of healthy gut microbiome comes before birth and evolves throughout the childhood to the adult. Formation of gut microbiome from warm childhood from placenta, neonatal factors, then postnatal factors. Then warm is sterile. The warm is traditionally considered sterile with minimal microbial presence. However, the recent results suggest a limited microbial presence in the warm. While placenta is not entirely sterile, its microbial communities are less diverse than those in the gut. Some microorganisms from the mother may cross the placenta to influence the baby's gut microbiome, which plays a crucial role in immune development and overall health. Maternal diet and medication is important factor, especially the antibiotic that will pass to the babe in fetus. Research into the early microbial interaction is ongoing. Mode of delivery is very important in a cohort analysis involving 87,550 sibling pairs born between 93 to 99 study found that children born via cesarean section had an increased risk of asthma. So vaginal birth is favored for the diverse microbial exposure and immune system development. Breast milk role in the development of gut microbiome. Breast milk play a vital role in shaping the nurturing the development of healthy gut microbiome in infants that contain probiotic, prebiotic, like human milk, oligosaccharides, immunoglobulins, immune factors, antimicrobial properties, anti-inflammatory properties, nutrition, gut barrier development, lactoferrin, immune system modulation. As children grow, their microbiome continue to be influenced by life experiences, environmental factors, diet, food habit, medication, especially antibiotics. This all contributing to the microbiome formation, whether it's dysbiosis or eubiosis, impacting immune tolerance and reducing the risk of allergies. So many studies are coming with the use of antibiotic. The studies suggest a potential link between early childhood antibiotic use and an increased risk of allergy disease later life, such as allergic rhinitis and asthma. 
And some research indicate that antibiotic exposure in infant may elevate the likelihood of this condition. And there appears to be direct relationship between any early antibiotic use and allergy symptoms in older children. Common probiotic that help to prevent allergy. Prevent literature revealed that lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are the most popular probiotic studies by researchers. Healthy microbiome and the effect of allergy. Specific strains like lactobacillus rhamnosus and bifidobacterium species and the combination of two species have demonstrated the potential to elevate symptoms, reduce inflammation and modulate immune response. Probiotic promote increase anti-inflammatory cytokinins and balance immune cell-like regulatory T cells. Mechanism of probiotic that is modulate immune system. Probiotic facilitate shift in the immune from T helper two cells of WT WC to T helper one cells of WC that is associate allergic association with allergy cells. T helper cell two to T helper one cells. This modulation will reduce the risk of allergic reaction and autoimmune condition. Then along, and, uh, along that, enhance butyric production. This is a short chain fatty acid that beneficial for gut health, help maintain the gut barrier and has anti-inflammatory properties. Then increase anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin and transforming growth factor beta and decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines in tumor necrosing factor alpha and interleukin-6. This decrease the inflammation, contribute to improved immune regulation. Conclusion, the perinatal use of probiotic, prebiotic, and symbiotic for the primary preventation of allergic disease in children. This is in the human nutrition and metabolism. It is cited in the site. Take our message, vitamin D and get dysbiosis plays a major role in allergy and asthma development. All available probiotics are effective? No. Probiotics are strain-specific with the different strains having different effect on health. Lactobacillus rhamnosus, bifidobacterium species are combination of probiotic effective in the asthma and allergy. Regarding the choice of a probiotic should align with the specific health goal of the condition and the quality of probiotic, efficacy and the viability of the probiotic, scientific evidence regarding probiotic efficacy should be considered before administration. In nutshell, incorporating physical activity with sun exposure, usage of vitamin D, probiotic and prebiotic rich food into the diet, adopting gut friendly lifestyle that support a healthy microbiome. So, thank you. That's all. Thank you, sir, for throwing light on uh, formation of microbiome from womb to childhood, especially highlighting on uh, allergic diseases in uh, childhood in relation with the gut microbiome. We do have uh, one question, uh, but it is about the dosages, okay. uh, dosage of prebiotic, probiotic, and vitamin D uh, as per the age of the child. Vitamin D is 60,000 inter international unit if there is a, a proven uh, vitamin D deficiency. Otherwise, otherwise it is 800 to 1,000 international unit uh, per day. That is 60,000 international international unit weekly into six weeks then monitor depend upon that we can give 800 to 1000 unit per day, daily basis we can continue then regarding the uh, prebiotic, probiotic prescription uh, prebiotic that is uh, lacto Bacillus, it is a 2 billion and Ramno is, a, is a 10 billion. That is marketly available uh, preparation I am using. 
Okay. So there is a definite in some preparation it is less and some it is higher. Difference will be there. Dosage is based on the age of the child. Exactly. There is Thank dosage you, in the probiot a probiotic dosage is not it is a same dosage. There is no difference between a pediatric and adult. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, thank you for the answering the queries. Uh, we next move on to uh, the case presentation by Dr. J. Ganesh, a Bachelor of Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences. He is a graduate from SDM College of uh, Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences and Hospital and has worked as a medical officer and a lecturer at SDM College. Presently, he runs a clinic in Kanyakumari district named Shri Maya Yoga and uh, Nature Cure Center. I welcome Dr. Jay Ganesh to present the case. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Am I audible? It's your audible. Uh, maybe you could just enlarge the screen. Yeah. Move. Mm -hmm. Yes, perfect. Yeah. It's gone back to uh, minimize. Could you just check the Before starting the case, ma'am, the Yes, please proceed, Dr. Ganesh. So, before starting, I am very thankful to the team who organizes the uh, conference. So, today I am here, I'm here to present a case of bronchial asthma. Uh, a 38 years old lady, female patient uh, from Chennai. Named Tilagam, she was suffering from bronchial asthma for the past 18 years. So she has the symptoms of uh, wheezing along with a productive cough um, so, and also a sneezing. Sneezing, whenever she gets up from the bed or after taking a bath or whenever she exposed to the dust particles, she used to get a sneezing. And every day morning after she gets up, she gets a cough and along with a whitish sputum. And she was allergic to dust particle and also uh, pollens and some of the deodorants. Okay. Uh, she was under the allopathic medication. She used to take a uh, salbutamol inhaler two to three times a day. And if the symptom is very severe, she used to visit a hospital and take a, a terephilin injection IV and also nebulization for uh, rarely she used to take. But every day she used to take salbutamol inhaler for two to three times a day. And she also has a complaint of uh, external hemorrhoids. Uh, there was a one small growth of external hemorrhoids and also uh, a complaint of constipation, irregular bowel movements. Um, she has a uh, constipation, very hard stools and uh, is irregular in form and also uh, incomplete. Whenever she passes stools, she feels complete evacuation of the bowels. Uh, also a complaint of blotting and burping since 10 to 15 years. So after uh, getting all the symptoms, after five to six years, almost uh, past um, five to seven years, she has a symptom of physical exercise also. So physical exercise, whenever she climbs steps or walk for a long distance, she used to get a dyspnea and it settled down after a small period of rest. Okay. The medications here. Only the regular medication was only salbutamol inhaler. And whenever she take the salbutamol inhaler, her symptoms will subside and uh, she go with the regular routine. And uh, her personal history is uh, diet is mixed, appetite is good. Sometimes she gets uh, sweet cravings. She crave for the sweet kind of foods and uh, sleep is adequate. Uh, in cold environment, whenever uh, the cold environment or when she travels for a long distance, uh, she gets asthma, like wheezing attacks at the night time. So only those times, uh, she gets a disturbance in the sleep. 
the her bowel movement is already i said is a cyanic constipation and uh, incomplete evacuation sometimes there is a foul smell in the bowels maturation is normal he used to consume three liters of water per day yeah so after consulting everything we asked her to check the ig levels um on uh, 20 July 2022. We checked her IG level. It was around 1029.8 kg per liter. Um, so we started with the treatment. Uh, treatment mainly we focused on uh, according to the symptoms. We uh, focused on diet, supplements, and D1. Um, and also she has uh, symptoms of vitamin D deficiency. Then we checked the vitamin D levels also it was lower than the normal range. So we started the treatment protocol uh, with uh, deworming medicines. So deworming, we uh, prescribed a uh, vitamin called uh, Ayurvedic medicine for deworming medicines and also uh, turmeric with the uh, ghee for uh, two to three days. Then we asked her to go for uh, gastrointestinal purgation. Then we started the diet along with supplements. Uh, diet we concentrated on. Uh, symptoms to uh, concentrated on the foods which reduce the symptoms of gastritis, gastritis symptoms and also bronchial asthma. We, we prescribed a low carb diet. Uh, we cut down all the uh, carbohydrate from the diet. We added a very small quantity of carbohydrate at the afternoon time and uh, includes more of smoothies, uh, steamed vegetables and uh, soups. So, and we also asked her to avoid the foods uh, which increases the histamine levels, like uh, shellfish, or, um, meat, fishes, those things. Then as you avoid uh, so, uh, carbohydrate rich foods, like uh, carbohydrates like uh, maida and all those things. Then uh, we gave the supplements, which includes ID, Kashaya, Bosphilia Max, uh, that is the extract of Bosphilia serrata, and Omega-3, Vitamin D3 supplement, Chlorosal and Biome. So for the first month, uh, we gave the diet after the deworming, we gave the diet and started uh, ID, Kashaya, Bosphilia Max and Omega-3. Uh, after a week of this treatment, she started getting uh, started getting the changes and uh, the symptoms started going to the low frequency, uh, low intensity. And uh, after uh, 10 to 15 days, yeah, almost after 15 days, uh, her gastric symptoms like uh, blotting, burping, and uh, incomplete bowel movements almost settled down around 40 to 50 percentages. And the wheezing was there, but the intensity was very low. Uh, then we started with the probiotic. So vitamin D3 also we started from the day one. Uh, we prescribed Lumia 2K uh, alternate days. And uh, after 15 days, we started with the probiotic. So our, we asked her to take a probiotic, uh, that is a Florasol, uh, alpha natural supplements. Um, it uh, has a lactobacillus and uh, bifidobacterium species. So we gave it for the uh, next 15 days, along with the whatever supplement we gave it on the first week. So after the month, uh, we saw the drastic changes in their symptoms. The gastric symptom was completely settled down and uh, her bowel movement was regulated well. Then the asthma, wheezing symptoms was reduced very low, uh, very low. So the intensity or frequency of taking inhaler reduced to once a day, or she can maintain up to 36 hours. Um, and uh, after the month, we started we started with the probiotic and we added a biomail that is a prebiotic also to improve the gut diversity. So after uh, two to three months of the diet. Uh, plan treatment protocols and uh, along with that we prescribe some of the breathing exercises all those things and um, after a three months on uh, October 25th to 2022 we checked her IG level uh, it was 211.6 kg so after uh, three months we got a uh, drastic changes in the IG level also and her symptoms was completely settled down so now the gastric symptoms, it was completely resolved and it was not reoccurred. And the bronchial asthma symptoms, almost it was done. And uh, she has a touch very, very minimal. And whenever she exposed to the uh, dust particle or whenever she was, she was in the cold environment, she get a very mild symptoms. 
and inhaler take intake was very uh, reduced it was whenever she get a symptoms it was around monthly once or two to three months uh, once or twice she, she is taking this one uh, she is taking the inhaler um and then uh, was completely settled down and uh, we uh, after the three months we gave her a, a follow up chart presently she is taking uh, only omega 3 and uh, sometimes probiotics and uh, her symptom was completely settled down and she's fine thank you everyone Thank you, Dr. Ganesh, uh, for the presentation. Thank you. We, yeah. we now move on to our uh, the, the last session of the day on assessment of intestinal dysbiosis and case discussion. Uh, we'll have Dr. Gaurang Ramesh. He's a trained uh, functional medicine practitioner uh, who's going to uh, deliver the lecture on assessment of intestinal dysbiosis. Before we begin, we have uh, two questions for the participants. Uh, I read out the question. Please uh, type your answers in the uh, Q&A column. You may uh, type your answers in the question and answer box. The first question to the participants is, how do you describe a healthy gut microbiome? I request all the participants can you give a try. Can you type in your answers in the question and answer box? Dr. Gaurung would like your response on uh, two questions. How, do, how would you describe a healthy gut microbiome? And the second question is, what is one potential symptom that you would associate with dysbiosis? Participants have two questions. Kindly give an attempt. Type in your answers in the question and answer uh, box. First question is, how would you describe a healthy gut microbiome? The second question is, what is one potential symptom that you would associate with dysbiosis? Well, until we wait for the response by the participant, let me introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Gaurang Ramesh. He is MBBS and uh, MS in general surgery. He is an integrative gastroenterology and functional medicine practitioner. Doctor is a director of at Anugraha Arka Integrated Medicine Private Limited, that is Arka Healthcare Private Limited. He is well known as in social platform. He is well known as a gut health doctor. He is a certified uh, functional medicine medicine practitioner. He is a consultant for general surgery that is minimal invasive surgery, and uh, his his special interests are laparoscopic surgery, upper and lower GI, therapeutic endoscopy, and uh, holistic medicine that is uh, nothing but functional medicine. We are honored to have you with us, uh, Dr. Gaurang. Uh, may I kindly request you to uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rita, for the wonderful introduction. Am I audible? Yes, very much. Yeah, I uh, thank you, Dr. Praveen, for giving me the opportunity in presenting this in this wonderful uh, seminar. I think this today's um, a workshop was a testament to Dr. Praveen's enthusiasm and energy because uh, since I, this year I've attended the National 
uh, functional GI conference and the national inflammatory bowel disease conference. And I feel uh, today's seminar was more interesting than, um, and I was glued to the screen since morning uh, without uh, taking a break. Uh, 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 and the, the takeaway points and the kind of discussions have, which happened here was much better than the national conference. Uh, so I'd like to start um, uh, 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 and tell you a brief about how we can assess the intestinal dysbiosis. So uh, dysbiosis, as we have understood since morning, that it's not always about the microbe itself. It is more about the effect of the microbe and the susceptibility of the host and the relationship we are having between the host uh, and the microbe. So dysbiosis is not a classical infection. So uh, uh, it, it's the imbalance in the flora, which changes in their composition and metabolic activity and their local distribution. So uh, like we have seen various presentations since morning, so it's not always the patient is presenting with just abdominal symptoms. They can present with uh, dermatitis and skin related issues like Dr. Chandan said. They can uh, present with respiratory symptoms like Dr. Samshuddin uh, shared. So all of them, uh, 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 all the symptoms can have a correlation to the effect of dysbiosis. Doctor? Yeah. We, we have a few response on the questions asked. Uh, would you like to take them? We had asked two uh, yeah, questions. I will, to the... uh, yeah, I will uh, share as I go. Uh, I will talk about it as I go on. They are all in the question and answer column. Sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, we have different types of uh, dysbiosis. Uh, one is we are seeing a loss of beneficial organisms, and then we are seeing excessive growth of potentially harmful organisms, and we are also seeing a loss of overall microbial diversity. But uh, most of the cases, like you have seen in since morning, is not just exclusively one type. In always, when you see patients clinically, you have a mix of two or three of these types together presenting to you. So we need to understand the definition of pathogen and dysbiosis. So pathogen is when a specific causative agent uh, you can isolate based uh, and you can say that the disease is attributed to this specific organism. But in IBS, in dysbiosis, it is not, you cannot attribute the entire disease to a specific organism. It is the disturbance to the gut microbiome disturbance to the homeostasis of the flora and that has changed the functional composition and the metabolic activity of the flora and there is shift in the local distribution of the flora and that is causing the disease and that is uh, uh, attributed to the disease. So uh, when we are talking about dysbiosis, we have to look at the different classes of organisms and also the location of the problem. I think Dr. Praveen uh, beautifully explained with diagrams in the morning of different locations and classes of infection also. So how would you, uh, like Dr. Rita asked the question, uh, when you say, how will you describe a healthy gut microbiome? I think all the answers which we have got is correct. So we need to have an equilibrium of um, the distribution of the bacteria. We need to have the diversity of the flora and we need to have uh, a balance between the intestinal mucosa and the flora. So that is how we say it is a healthy microbiome. So when we are looking at dysbiosis, we should never jump into the diagnostics uh, directly. Uh, I think most of you here are naturopathy doctors and uh, you should uh, follow the naturopathic pr principles of what is leading to dysbiosis before you jump into testing the dysbiosis. 
So we have to look at the diet which has contributed, stress factors, the infections they've had previously. Also, like Dr. Praveen said, it is most of the patients are post-infectious dysbiosis where the infection has not been treated properly. And we should look at other causes of intestinal inflammation, which has led them to this place. We should also see how their other comorbid illnesses are also contributing to their uh, problem. And also because various medicines which the patient is taking for other diseases also can disrupt the microbiome. Now you need to look at what medicines and what diseases they have. And you need to look at uh, the digestive function. So whenever you want to correct the dysbiosis, you should always go top to bottom. So uh, if you directly try to meddle, you know, give patient probiotics, give prebiotics, uh, it won't be sustained effect. Uh, it always has digestion and stomach acid has to be optimized. And then only you create an ideal environment for the bacteria to thrive. So you need to see if there's any impaired, um, uh, based on symptoms, you can assess whether there is any impairment of digestion. And you also have to look at if they're exposed to toxins in the past and if uh, toxins are contributing to the dysbiosis. And of course, nutritional deficiencies uh, can happen because of dysbiosis and dysbiosis can also happen because of nutritional deficiencies. So I think this has been talked about since morning uh, of how dysbiosis can contribute to permeability, which then leads to in systemic disease. So uh, when we look at uh, the symptom which you associate with dysbiosis, uh, it, it's uh, usually it can vary from a very mild bloating to you know uh, inflammatory bowel disease kind of symptoms where they are present acutely. So all of your answers are again correct, and uh, again since morning you have. Uh, got a whole revision of how you can correlate uh, the symptoms with digestive dysfunction, symptoms of SIBO, symptoms of um, methane-dominant SIBO, symptoms of fungal overgrowth, and symptoms of parasite overgrowth. So that's very important to be clear about the symptoms of different aspects of the dysbiosis before you jump into the diagnostics. So this is the gist of the assessments which you can do. Stool testing is uh, the first one, which has always been there since a long time. So for parasites, uh, we have always relied on stool testing till uh, uh, about a few years back. So the OVA and parasite detection uh, through microscopy has uh, been done till now. But the detection rate can uh, vary a lot. So it can depend on how the specimen is collected and handled. It can depend on the pathologist's experience in detecting the sample. It can depend on how well the sample has been stained. And also uh, how much the laboratory is getting the volume. So the more volume they see, the more trained they are in detecting. So because of all these aspects, the sensitivity and specificity is not always consistent or in um, OVA and parasite detection uh, method. So uh, since about uh, 20 years, we've been having the enzyme immunoassay method. When we are suspecting a specific parasite, to, uh, we can test the uh, enzyme immunoassay method in both uh, serum and in stools. And now we have the real-time PCR uh, test, which we can do. I think Dr. Dar has in detail uh, told about the benefits of not just specific uh, PCR testing, but whole DNA sequence and whole genome sequence of the uh, stool sample. So when we combine uh, the laboratory evaluation with uh, microscopy and immuno, uh, enzyme immunoassay, we have been getting better results. But now with the PCR testing, uh, it's even more reliable than the traditional test. The thing about parasite is it's, it's an underestimated uh, problem. So uh, traditionally, we come to a diagnosis of parasite only when we have strong symptoms 
uh, when um, uh, the patient is uh, having chronic uh, dysbiosis, uh, uh, chronic gut uh, issues, and also when the patient is having uh, eosinophils raised or some signs where we test for parasite. But now it's uh, there are many studies which show that um, uh, parasites can be four times or five times more frequent in IBS patients. And when these patients which who have been treating with vague abdominal symptoms are treated for parasites, in 80% of them, their IBS disappears. And uh, parasites are also known to cause systemic diseases, like how Dr. Chandan was sharing of uh, where, how parasites can also produce skin um, uh, symptoms without actually causing any gut symptoms. So keeping these two factors in mind, we should uh, never ignore parasites. We should aggressively treat parasites because the anti-parasite medications don't have uh, the side effects like antibiotics. And also, uh, if you look at some anti-parasite medicines like ivermectin, they also have shown to uh, have a positive immunomodulation effect. And many of the COVID patients also greatly benefited from those immunomodulating uh, properties of ivermectin. So uh, my um, so take-home message is that the increase in intestinal permeability in patients with parasite infections uh, has to be considered when you're treating parasite and don't just look at the gut symptoms only. So next, coming to bacteria and yeast detection. So even in bacteria and yeast, we have the beneficial uh, organisms, commensal organisms, potentially pathogenic and the proven pathogenic strains. So the most common uh, test which we have been having since more than 50 years is the stool culture. So stool culture will give us the gist of the large intestine and the rectal um, health. And in, in, there's no way we can get to know about the small intestinal health with a stool culture. And uh, a stool culture aerobic organisms can have a higher possibility of growing but you're taking the sample from an aerob anaerobic um, environment. So uh, always what happens is in a culture, the more dominant strain will start growing. And even if a dysbiotic strain, which is potentially causing problem in the gut, is not dominant in a culture uh, tray, then you will not get an idea of uh, that strain in a culture test. So next we have the 16S uh, RNA PCR uh, method, which can uh, tell us about all the bacteria which are present. So this test will help us know the diversity and the abundance of the bacterial species. And now today we also have the metabolomics um, analysis from the PCR test. So we can also understand the potential of the bacteria to produce the short chain fatty acids, the potential of the bacteria to produce the metabolites. So uh, when you are getting this data from a PCR test, it's not a direct evaluation. It is a virtual evaluation that you are, uh, um, you are it's a probable uh, evaluation. So, um, the next um, aspect is uh, what Dr. Dar has discussed of looking at total microbiome uh, DNA sequencing. So in a 16S uh, RNA sequencing, we get to know, uh, we, we'll be able to identify the species and the relative abundance of the species. But today's uh, test, uh, which um, uh, Dr. Dar discussed, is uh, when we do a DNA sequencing, We'll not only know the species of it, the abundance of it is the quantitative and qualitative, but also we'll know the genes of the microbiome. We'll also know the variant of the microbiome uh, species and also know the functional information like the short chain fatty acid, nutrition absorption and the antibiotic uh, potential recovery. So this uh, uh, is uh, the where we stand today 
and it's easily available for us because of Buxpix uh, in India now. Now, metagenomics is um, the composition of the gut flora, like doing a consensus of the species of the bacteria. But metabolomics is looking at the metabolic activity of the microbiota. So if you want to look at the metabolic activity of the small intestinal bacterial uh, function or the small intestinal fungal function, then uh, we can do the uh, urine metabolite test. So the urine metabolite test uh, can be reliable, can be a better uh, marker of small intestinal health because uh, the large intestine is filled with the anaerobic environment. And even the dysbiosis happening in the small intestine, the flora will change as it passes through the colon. And when you get uh, the stool sample, it is more of a reflection of the colon health. So many times there's a chance to miss uh, low-grade uh, small intestinal overgrowth of bacteria or yeast because of this uh, phenomenon. So based on... Um, uh, these metabolomic studies, we can also have personalized nutrition, which was wonderfully explained by uh, Dr. Vimal uh, Karani. Next, we have uh, yeast dysbiosis. Yeast, again, is uh, was something which we never understood because, like I said, you can't measure it through the stool. So you can uh, either look at the metabolites produced by yeast in urine, or uh, you need to do uh, uh, you need to get into the small intestine and do a suction of the liquid in the small intestine and then grow it in culture to really measure yeast. But today we have uh, many tests. We have uh, IgG tests to look at the various yeast overgrowth happening in the body. We have mycotoxin tests in the urine. And we have indirect tests like the urine metabolite test. But what we need to understand about yeast is uh, that it's not always uh, bad because uh, candida is part of the normal flora. But in the normal flora, it has to be at a low level. And uh, like Dr. Praveen said, the lower gut pH and uh, ideal stomach acid can inhibit candida overgrowth. Okay, and when the candida overgrowth happens, it uh, lowers the immunity by splitting the uh, secretory IgA molecules. So candida is a uh, commensal uh, strain, so it 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 is an opportunistic infection. So when there is a low grade of inf inflammation happening in the body, it uh, gives it ideal environment for candida overgrowth. And once candida overgrowth happens, it creates an environment for the low-grade inflammation to continue and it uh, causes a systemic inflammation. So this is a study looking at uh, candida colonization in IBD. And uh, both uh, candida colonization and IBD was associated with elevated levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines IL-17. So in, in these patients, they've also tested the candida after uh, resolving the symptoms of IBD and it has found to be much lesser. So the impact of yeast or candida on the host is again uh, dependent on the host also. Uh, so it, it, it depends on the mucosa of the intestines, it depends on the immune system, and it depends on the other intestinal microflora, microflora which can uh, inhibit its uh, overgrowth. So you can have superficial candidiasis, you can have locally restrictive candidiasis, which is uh, small intestinal fungal overgrowth only, and then you have uh, systemic uh, candidiasis where you see uh, skin lesions and systemic infection. So uh, finally, we can also look at short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids, there are multiple ways to see. Uh, one is we, you can assess short-chain fatty acids in the stool sample. That uh, quantitative analysis of short-chain fatty acids is not easily available in India. 
you can do a metabolomic uh, evaluation of probable short chain fatty acids through the data you get in the uh, DNA genome sequencing, which is the Bucks Peaks test, a uh, test like the Bucks Peaks. Or you can also get an uh, idea of the short chain fatty acids through the urine metabolite test or the organic acid test. So these are the short chain fatty acids and Dr. Praveen's uh, lecture, you were familiar with the benefits of short chain fatty acids and how to improve short chain fatty acids. Now, finally, we come to the urine organic acid test. Uh, the so urine organic acid test is uh, not a test which is accepted uh, in by FDA or by uh, clinical um, treatment. Uh, you can't base your clinical treatment entirely based on the urine organic acid test because it is a relative test. And on daily basis, you can have change in the metabolites and it's a multifactorial um, marker which can be influenced by so many of the host um, environmental features. So, uh, but you can always get the direction at which you have to look at. So if you have these bacterial uh, dysbiosis markers positive in the urine metabolite test, you can look at SIBO. And if you have arabinose or uh, tartaric acid or citramelic acid positive, you can look at uh, CIFO as a treatment. The most uh, uh, have, in my practice at least, I've found um, uh, more, all patients which have found elevated d arabinitol uh, where they respond, they respond very well to uh, C4 treatment. Next, coming to H. pylori. H. pylori, again, uh, if you see 50% of the world population is uh, affected or has the presence of H. pylori, you can actually consider H. pylori also has a commensal bacteria. But what creates an environment for its overgrowth and what creates an environment for its uh, for it to uh, invade the mucosa and cause systemic problems is what we have to see before we jump into the uh, aggressive treatment. So when you look at the testing, the gold standard is still the um, histology, which is the most reliable. But again, uh, the easiest to do would be the urease breath test. Uh, the stool antigen test is. Uh, the next reliable test, but the serology, which is very easily available to all of us is not a very reliable test because even if they have been exposed to H. pylori and they have completely recovered from H. pylori and their symptoms might be attributed to something else and H. pylori turns out to be uh, positive, the serology turns out to positive, we may get uh, misled uh, to treating, uh, concentrating on H. pylori rather than looking other causes of uh, dysbiosis. And PCR, uh, which uh, you can also look at uh, the H. pylori antigen in the stool PCR test, but that is not a very reliable test because we still don't have the data of um, uh, its uh, specificity and sensitivity in comparison to the histology or the urease breath test. Now, like Dr. Praveen explained, uh, it's not just the gastrointestinal manifestations of H. pylori. Because of its uh, consequence of uh, its uh, action on the stomach mucosa, you can have uh, malnutrition, malabsorption, and also you can have the metabolic consequences and the immune consequences of H. pylori infection. Now, uh, I, all of you are familiar with the uh, treatment of uh, H. pylori. So uh, the final test I have not mentioned here is the uh, breath test. So breath test also, I have not been able to uh, do it actively here in India because um, it's not easily available in on the diagnostic centers. But uh, for patients in US, I would give them a portable uh, breath analyzer which can detect methane and hydrogen breath test. And based on what is high, uh, we can choose between going into the treatment of um, hydrogen dominant SIBO or methane dominant SIBO. And also what the breath test gives advantage is that you can also um, 
modify your uh, diet, uh, interventional diet based on the portable breath test. Because if, if you do a proper elimination diet with a low FODMAP diet, it becomes very restrictive. The patient hardly has few options to eat and they get fed up and they keep complaining, I, I am not having enough options to eat. But when they have a breath analyzer uh, with them, uh, they can keep testing their breath uh, with all the foods they eat. And your uh, the elimination which you do will uh, gradually reduce and uh, you can eliminate only, uh, it can become more personalized to the patient's symptoms and not just a general elimination diet. I think very soon we'll have a portable, uh, easy to uh, commercially available uh, uh, breath analyzer in India soon. So the approach I do uh, to um, uh, treat the dysbiosis is um, uh, the three uh, triple therapy like Dr. Praveen says. You first have to remove the pathogen, then you have to plant the good bacteria, and then you have to feed the good bacteria. So uh, based on the evaluation and the symptoms, I will first... Um, look at whether I need to use an antibiotic or should I just uh, use herbs. So uh, when the patient has high, uh, 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 patients presents to me with a GI symptom, I would, I always prefer using uh, 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 antibiotic because uh, herbs takes a little longer to work. And when, when they come end up in a hospital setting, they want to see quick results. So that is one reason I end up using a little bit of antibiotics. And then quickly I switch to herbs uh, to maintain the remission of uh, the overgrowth. And coming to the diet, uh, I, I decide between elimination diet, low FODMAP diet, and a candida friendly diet, depending on the symptom evaluation and the uh, results which we get. So uh, always we have to remember that we have to differentiate between a pathogenic organism and treating dysbiosis. So many times when we are not aggressive in treating the pathogenic organism, they end up having a post-infectious IBS. Most of the cases I see in clinical practice, I feel they are post-infectious IBS because most of them give a history of having food poisoning, uh, of getting admitted to the hospital or going to a doctor with severe symptoms. And ever since then, they end up having IBS because at that particular time, their uh, gut was not fully treated. One, it, the pathogenic strain would not have completely gone uh, with the antibiotic. The second and the most common reason is we are not giving them uh, enough dietary and lifestyle changes to do to uh, develop the diversity of the uh, microbiome again. We are not giving them probiotics. We are not giving them the prebiotics to develop the, the microbial diversity and the ecosystem again. So because of the lack of good bacteria, they end up uh, having a low-grade infection and then end up having IBS. So uh, also one thing we need to remember is uh, the yeast or the fungus or the bacteria which are commensal bacteria are not always uh, pathogenic. The pathogenicity of the commensal bacteria depends on the immunosuppression of the host, our immune function, which is dysregulated, and the diversity of the other bacteria, which is there in the gut. So we should not be very aggressive and completely you know, getting rid of those uh, strains. We should uh, ideally help them to develop an ideal environment in their gut. So uh, finally, I would like to conclude um, with um, uh, saying, uh, I will skip some of the slides because of the lack of time and I'll take in more questions. So this is the approach I use. I use the Functional Medicine uh, Institute approach to um, come to a conclusion. So like I said, the first and foremost, like Dr. Praveen always uh, says that the symptoms have to be uh, very 
uh, assessed in detail, in great detail, and their history has to be taken in great detail. So with, <laughs> so we need to gather their history, look at their symptoms, look at the anthropometrics, and look at the uh, lab reports. And then we also look at the clinical indicator with the clinical examination. And based on this, we have to uh, develop to recognize the pattern. So when you meet Dr. Praveen, you might think, oh, how is he like a magician? He's able to come to conclusions and make protocols. So this happens because of uh, learning to analyze patterns of symptoms and understanding the pathogenicity and the mechanism of dysbiosis and the disease. So when you understand this, you develop a pattern and you understand the five functions of the gut based on that. So you see if there's any a problem with digestion and absorption uh, based on the symptoms. You see if there's any systemic inflammation or systemic sy symptoms, and then you'll know whether there is uh, in increased intestinal permeability. And then you look at the gut microbiota, both based on symptoms and if possible, blood, uh, the evaluation. And then you look at if the patient is inflamed, again, with biomarkers and blood tests, and then also look at the nervous system. So the nervous system, of course, all, most of you are naturopaths, so you are well-trained in assessing the nervous system, looking at the vagal function, giving them uh, solutions to exercise their vagus nerve with pranayama, meditation, mindfulness, and getting rid of their um, emotional uh, conflict also. So, and then uh, you cannot neglect the foundation of the naturopathy in uh, uh, dysbiosis. You have to optimize their sleep, make sure they have little movement, make sure they have nutritional density, reduce their stress and work on their emotional, spiritual and mental aspects. And coming to the five steps to uh, treat the dysbiosis, you remove uh, the uh, pathogen. If you uh, are using allopathy, you can minimize that to as minimal as possible and then shift to herbs uh, to remove the infection and then help the patient create an ideal environment for the bacteria to re-inoculate by giving them adequate enzymes. And then you give uh, nutrients to repair the immune, um, uh, to repair the intestinal lining with uh, licorice, with aloe vera, with collagen, and uh, with uh, L-glutamine and zinc arnosine. So these things will uh, repair the intestinal uh, mucosa and the stomach lining uh, to uh, speed up their healing process. And once you do these three aspects, then you create an environment for the bacteria to re-inoculate. And then your probiotics will start giving you effect. So if they are already in a dysbiotic state, they come to you with bloating and you give them a broad spectrum probiotic, they will end up with more bloating and uh, they will not come back to you. So you need to create the environment for them to, uh, for the bacteria to re-inoculate there. And once you decide the what probiotic you use based on the uh, problems they have, uh, then you uh, start feeding the probiotic with fiber, with the prebiotics. And then finally, you have to remember the foundation of naturopathy of uh, rebalancing their vagus system and rebalancing their um, HPA axis. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk. So uh, finally, the dysbiosis is the imbalance of population of the flora. And the evaluation of dysbiosis, you can uh, you have to look at dysbiosis like an Amazon forest, or you can look at dysbiosis like the uh, economy uh, of the world. So you do a PCR test like the Bugs Peaks test to see the consensus, or to see all the organisms which are living there. If you really want to uh, differentiate between the pathogenic strains, you do an aerobic or an anaerobic culture. Then you do a metabolomic study of looking at the urine organic acid test or looking at the metabolites in the stool uh, and see what functions the bacteria are able to do and where the bacteria is functionally deficient in. And never miss the uh, evaluation of parasites and uh, looking at candida overgrowth. 
and Canada overgrowth, I feel uh, I agree with Dr. Praveen that you should uh, go more aggressively with symptoms than waiting for the test because the more accurate tests are not yet available in India, like looking at the mycotoxins in the urine or looking at IgA and IgM uh, serology of uh, uh, yeast in the blood. Those tests are not easily available in India. So we have to right now rely on symptoms to identify fungal overgrowth. So uh, finally, I would like to end like the most important um, lesson which we learned from Dr. Praveen is pattern recognition. So we need to understand the interconnectedness between the organisms, between the um, uh, uh, symptoms and between the mechanisms of how the organisms are uh, influencing a body. So when we understand this pattern, then we can uh, easily have a clinical practice. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'm, to reach me, you can uh, reach me on LinkedIn. This is the QR code for my LinkedIn profile. Uh, thank you, Dr. Praveen and uh, Alpha Natural Team for conducting this wonderful workshop. I can take in questions if there are any now. Yes, doctor, we have a few questions. Uh, let's begin with the first question. What is the effect of pH on gastric uh, contents on gut bacteria? Yeah, so uh, pH has to be balanced. See, the, now the gut uh, uh, is designed in a way that in stomach, it, it has to be a low pH between two to four. And then all the other enzymes which are secreted after stomach, like the bile and the pancreatic enzyme and the intestinal enzymes and the secretions are all alkaline. So as you keep coming down, uh, it becomes alkaline. And when you come to the colon, it becomes a neutral pH environment. So um, uh, if you uh, the decision of uh, deciding the food uh, in naturopathy, you have... Uh, the alkaline diet and the acidic diet. So that decision has to be uh, based on uh, what they are, uh, uh, what symptoms they have and what is your intention to treat. I have seen many patients who have taken alkaline water for a long time and they end up with a lot of dysbiosis uh, uh, and they end up with uh, severe H. pylori infection, which uh, requires antibiotics to treat because uh, just doing one uh, thing for a long time may actually disturb your body. So we need to decide based on their uh, symptoms and their uh, clinical condition. Uh, one doctor has requested to present the slide on natural treatment protocols for fungal and yeast dysbiosis in gut. So uh, like since morning, you have seen that for yeast, you have to eliminate all forms of um, sugar because sugar, uh, fungal overgrowth feeds on sugar. And then we also have to avoid fermented food. So <clears throat> many times the natural uh, uh, fermented food like uh, kefir and uh, sokrat and all those foods, uh, we don't know what exactly is growing there. So sometimes even though they don't have pathogenic strains, it creates an environment for the, it, it creates a trigger for the local uh, yeast to overgrow. So it's ideal to avoid fermented food also when you're treating um, uh, the yeast overgrowth. And then uh, the healthy yeast, which is Saccharomyces boulardii, is a great uh, uh, supplement to start off with because it not just suppresses the pathogenic yeast, but also it acts like a binder to uh, mycotoxins which are released during fungal overgrowth and it helps it uh, get rid of it. And then you need to supplement with the lactobacillus and bifidobacter strains. 
And the main problem why it is difficult to treat the yeast overgrowth is the biofilm which forms on it. So to treat the biofilm, uh, if they are very severe, I start with only acetyl cysteine and then progress to digestive enzymes and then progress to uh, betaine HCL or you know apple cider vinegar. But if uh, in general, a uh, combination of uh, enzymes, digestive enzymes, uh, with the Saccharomyces boulardii will take care of uh, uh, the biofilm also. So I have um, uh, used a combination uh, of uh, garlic, thyme, oregano, uh, rosemary with berberine uh, in my practice. And it's always, uh, they need it for, uh, I don't go very aggressive in the beginning. I go with one tablet and progress to two tablets a day and then decide if they need three tablets and extend it for about two to three months uh, until they are off the symptoms. And once we stop, we have to reevaluate if they're getting back to overgrowth and then decide whether we can really stop. For more, um, Obvious symptoms of yeast overgrowth, fungal overgrowth patients, I use um, the uh, pharmaceutical options. Nistatin is talked about by functional medicine doctors, but then nistatin has been good in uh, lab tests, in animal uh, tests. But, in, uh, but when I see clinical uh, evidence, I feel uh, fluconazole or uh, itraconazole works better than Nistatin. Amphotericin B also, uh, they, uh, the US studies show that it, it's as good as fluconazole and sometimes better than fluconazole, but it's not easily available in our Indian pharmacies. So um, I prefer fluconazole or itraconazole. So uh, the uh, gist is uh, low carb diet. Uh, of course, grain-free diet will be the best with uh, herbal antifungal agents with probiotics and, of course, um, not uh, triggering the yeast overgrowth with um, fermented food. So keeping fermented food also less. And a very important uh, thing about yeast overgrowth, which we miss, is um, uh, if they have continued exposure to mold, if they have uh, environmental exposure, are they living in a moldy house? Are they living in a uh, room with a 15 year or 20 year old AC uh, going on in the night? Or are they eating stale food? Uh, what kind of food are they eating? These are the things which you really have to be sure and ask the patient because unless you uh, treat what is causing the dysbiosis, uh, they will keep getting back the problem and coming back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Gaurang Ramesh. Uh, I'm honestly touched by your humility and uh, the way you have done your presentation, touching upon each and every topic that has been presented since morning. Uh, in fact, you have made my work easier of concluding uh, today's session. Thank you very much uh, for a very insightful presentation on uh, assessment of uh, intestinal dysbiosis. Uh, participants, uh, as you leave, you will receive a notification on feedback form uh, kindly make sure you uh, give your feedback so that we can survey better the next time. Okay, uh, kindly make sure you submit, uh, answer the feedback form and submit as you exit. As we have come to a, a conclusion now and the ending ceremony, uh, on behalf of the uh, organizing team, that is the gastro gut experts and uh, Alpha Natural, I would like to extend uh, heartfelt uh, gratitude to all the uh, panelists, uh, the professionals who have uh, signed up for the uh, conference and all the participants. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Praveen and his team, I once again uh, extend a hearty gratitude, especially I uh, would like to mention uh, Professor Vimal Karani, Dr. Sabina Hazan, Dr. Gaurang Ramesh, Dr. Chandan, uh, Dr. Dev Jyotidhar and uh, uh, the doctors who have done the case presentation, Dr. Samsuddin and Alpha Natural Research and our Development Team. Uh, participants, please uh, do remember that uh, uh, gastrogutexperts.com uh, is the website where you will get more information about the organizers and please stay tuned 
as they are shortly coming up with uh, many such CMEs and also uh, soon launching a fellowship program. And uh, the gastro gut experts team along with Dr. Praveen is uh, launching a franchisee of gut health. So all the uh, physicians and doctors here attending the uh, conference could uh, benefit from the same. If you're interested, kindly contact Dr. Praveen via WhatsApp, or you can also contact the team uh, on their website. So we have come to the end of uh, the second International Gut Conference on Prebiotic, Probiotic, Gut Microbiome, and uh, Clinical Application. I thank all the participants for your patience uh, uh, for attending since morning and for your replies for all our queries. I, Dr. Rita Vaz, a naturopathy physician, thank uh, all of you once again on behalf of the organizing team. Hope to see you all at the next conference. Thank you.